Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of Night Train to Memphis by Elizabeth Peters, narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt. This book is copyrighted 1994 by Elizabeth Peters. This recording is copyrighted 1994 by Recorded Books. While on an all-expenses-paid cruise down the Nile, Vicky takes on a new case involving a plot to rob the Egyptian Museum. With Sir John Smythe, reformed jewel thief and Vicky's lover, the prime suspect, she prepares for shipboard romance and a dash of intrigue. And now, Night Train to Memphis. Chapter 1 The mountain meadow was carpeted with fresh green and starred with small, shy flowers. He came toward me, walking so lightly the grass scarcely seemed to bend under his feet. His hair shone silver gilt in the sunlight, and he was smiling, and his blue eyes held a look I'd seen in them only once before. Trembling, I waited for him to come to me. He stopped a few feet away, still smiling, and held out his hands. They were wet and red and dripping. I looked from his bleeding hands to his face and saw blood erupt from it in spurting streams, from the corners of his mouth, from under the hair on his temples. Bright scarlet patches blossomed on the breast of his shirt. There was blood everywhere, covering him like a red rain. I stretched out my arms, but I couldn't reach him, and I couldn't move and the scream I tried to utter wouldn't come out of my throat, and he fell, face down at my feet, and the back of his head wasn't golden fair, but sticky scarlet, and the blood spread out, staining the green grass, and drowning the shy flowers, and still I couldn't reach him. Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God! Somebody was whining, it wasn't I. I was blubbering and swearing. Or was I praying? Swearing. Damn him! Damn him! I reached out blindly in the dark. There was something monstrous and hairy on my bed. I threw my arms around it and clutched it to my bosom. Caesar stopped whining and began licking my face with frantic slurps. Caesar is a Doberman. His tongue is as rough as a file and about a foot and a half long. He has very bad breath. All right, okay, I gasped, fending him off and reaching for the bedside lamp. The light helped, and so did the sight of my familiar, messy bedroom. But I was still shaking. God, that had been the worst one yet. Caesar's furry face stared worriedly at me. He wasn't allowed on the bed. I must have cried out in my sleep, and the gallant dog had leaped up to my rescue. Clara was allowed on the bed. Caesar hasn't got over the injustice of this yet, but he can't do anything about it because he's terrified of Clara, who weighs approximately seven pounds to his seventy. I think he thinks she is a god. He slobbers with delight when she condescends to curl up next to him and grovels when she raises a paw. She had retreated from her usual position, on my stomach, to the foot of the bed, and was sitting up, eyeing me with that look of tolerant contempt only Siamese cats have fully mastered. In the dark, seal-brown of her face, her eyes looked very blue. A shudder twisted through me as I remembered how blood had filled those other blue eyes. It was the third time that week I had dreamed about John. The first one hadn't been bad, just an ordinary anxiety-frustration dream in which I pursued a familiar form along endless streets, only to find, when I caught up with it, that it wore someone else's face. The second... Well, never mind the details of that one. The metamorphosis of the body I clasped into a scaled, limbless creature that slid slimily through my arms and vanished into darkness had left a nasty memory, but it hadn't awakened me. I knew the cause of the dreams. 
My subconscious doesn't fool around. It's about as subtle as a brickbat. I had told myself there was nothing to worry about, even if I hadn't heard from him for over a month. And I had believed it, sort of, until a week ago. Hugging my warm, hairy, smelly dog as a child would clutch a teddy bear for comfort, I remembered the conversation that had forced me, or my subconscious, to admit there was something to worry about. But I don't know anything about Egyptology, I yelled. Normally, I don't yell when I say things like that. I mean, it's hardly the sort of statement that arouses passionate emotions. But this was the fourth time I had said it, and I didn't seem to be getting the point across. The two men behind the desk exchanged glances. One of them was my old friend Carl Fader of the Munich Police Department. The other man was about the same age, mid-fifties at a guess. Like Carl, he was losing his hair and starting to spread around the middle. He'd been introduced to me as Herr Burkhardt. No title, no affiliation. If he was a colleague of Carl's, he had to be a cop of some variety. But I had only known one other man with eyes as cold as his, and Rudy had definitely not been a police officer. I knew what they were thinking. It was Burkhardt who said it. I fail to understand, Dr. Bliss. You are an official of our National Museum, a well-known authority on art history. The Herr Director, Dr. Schmidt, has often said that you are his most valued subordinate. Yeah, I said gloomily. I'll bet he has. Schmidt has a mouth almost as big as his rotund tummy. He is as cute as one of the seven dwarfs and not much taller, and if he wasn't so brilliant, he'd have been locked up long ago as a menace to society. Not that he's a crook. On the contrary, Schmidt thinks of himself as a brilliant amateur sleuth, the scourge of the underworld and of me as his sidekick. As Watson was to Sherlock, as Archie was to Nero Wolfe, so Vicky Bliss is to Herr Dr. Anton Z. Schmidt. At least that's how Schmidt looks at it. My own view of our respective roles is somewhat different. I said slowly and patiently, Human beings have been producing works of art of one kind or another for over 35 thousand years. Even if you include only the major visual arts and restrict yourself to Western art, you have to start with Stone Age man, proceed through the Egyptians and the Minoans and the Etruscans and the Greeks to early Christian art and Byzantine and medieval and Renaissance and, oh, hell, what I'm trying to say is that nobody can be an expert on all those fields. My specialty is medieval European art. I don't know. What about the Trojan gold? Fader inquired. That does not come under the heading of medieval European art, does it? I'd been afraid somebody was going to bring that up. Schmidt refers to the affair of the Trojan gold as our most recent case. He doesn't often refer to it, however because it hadn't been one of our most resounding successes. People had been looking for the gold, a hoard of priceless ancient jewelry which had vanished from besieged Berlin at the end of World War II for almost 50 years. Educated opinion believed the Russians had carried it off to Moscow. Schmidt and I and a few other people had spent several weeks the previous winter following up a clue that suggested it had been smuggled out of Berlin before the Russians entered the city, and hidden somewhere in Bavaria. At one point, I thought I had found the hiding place. Turned out I was wrong. Schmidt was still complaining about how I had misled him, which I hadn't, not deliberately. I'd been, well, wrong. Sometimes I am wrong. Not this time, though, damn it. Fader was smirking at me as if he had said something clever. He was correct. The Trojan gold could not be described as medieval art. I tried again. That had nothing to do with my expertise or lack thereof. It was pure chance. But you recognized from a bad photograph that the jewels pictured were genuine. 
some degree of expertise. Anybody could have done that. My voice rose. The gold of Troy is famous. Everybody knows about it. Almost everybody. Let me put it this way, Mina Heron. I could not pose as an expert on Egyptian art for more than five minutes without getting caught out. If I understand you correctly, you are suggesting I accept the position of guest lecturer on a Nile cruise. In exchange for a free tour, I will be expected to talk at least once a day on some damned temple or pyramid and be prepared to answer questions from the people taking the cruise who wouldn't be taking the cruise if they weren't already interested in and informed about the subject. Five minutes, hell. I wouldn't last 60 seconds. Why me, for God's sake? There are hundreds of people who know more about the subject than I do. But my dear Fräulein Doctor, Burkhardt exclaimed, look at it this way. Never again will you have the opportunity for such a holiday. This is a luxury cruise. The boat is new, designed for millionaire tourists. Suites instead of rooms, gourmet food, the best of everything. Passengers will be admitted to places that are barred to the ordinary tourist. The lecturers are all distinguished scholars. He waved a brightly colored brochure at me. I shied back. That's just the point here, Burkhart. Carl, will you please tell your friend that I am not an empty-headed blonde bimbo, even if I do look like one. Lately, I'd been trying very hard not to look like one, swathing my too well-endowed torso in loose jackets and my long legs in full skirts that flapped around my calves. I had let my hair grow long so I could wind it into a schoolmarmish bun. Nothing seemed to work. If you are tall and blonde and blue-eyed and shaped like a female, some people assume you don't have a brain cell working. Carl tried to hide his smile. I warned you this approach would not work, Burkhart. The lady is very astute. I imagine she already suspects why we are making this request. I nodded gloomily. It didn't require a high degree of intelligence. The affair of the Trojan gold was only the most recent of several encounters I have enjoyed with the criminal element. If enjoyed is the right word. I do not enjoy being shot at, assaulted, kidnapped, and chased across the countryside. I didn't want to do that anymore. Something's going to happen on that cruise, I said. What is it? Murder? Hijacking? or just a simple case of grand theft which could easily lead to murder or hijacking. If you will allow me to explain, Burkhardt began, that's what I've been asking you to do. Burkhardt leaned back and folded his arms. The information reached us via a channel which has proved particularly fruitful in the past. How our agent acquired the information we do not know but he has never before failed to be accurate. He gave us three facts. First, that there is a plot to rob the Cairo Museum. Second, the individuals involved will be on the Nile cruise, which starts on November 1st. Third, one or more of them is personally known to you. Now, obviously, we cannot hold the cruise or detain everyone who has signed up for it. We must have an agent on that boat. You are the obvious choice. Not only because you... Wait, I said. My voice sounded quite normal. That surprised me, even though I had half expected it. One of his statements had had the same impact as a hard kick on the shin. Let's go back over that interesting assemblage of so-called facts, shall we? First, why are you guys involved? Why don't you pass the information on to the Egyptian government and let them handle it? Naturally, we have notified the authorities in that country. They have requested our cooperation. Are you familiar with the current political situation in Egypt? I shrugged. Not in detail. Keep it short, will you? I will endeavor to do so. Burkhart steepled his fingertips and tried to look like a professor. He didn't. The modern nation of Egypt did not attain independence until 1922. 
For over a century it was exploited, as some might say, by Western powers. And many of the most valuable antiquities were uh, removed to museums and private collections in Europe and America. Anti-Western sentiment is of long standing, and it is now being fostered by certain groups who wish to replace the present government of Egypt with one more sympathetic to their religious views. They have attacked tourists and members of the government. If the historic treasures of Egypt were stolen by a group of foreigners... I see your point, I said reluctantly. Okay, next question. Seems to me your information is very fragmentary. Why don't you ask this hotshot agent of yours where he got it and tell him to dig around for more? Another exchange of meaningful glances. Oh, please, I said. Don't tell me. Don't tell me this is another of those plots. He's dead, right? Found in an alley with his throat cut, horribly tortured, and... I don't believe this. Believe it, Carl said soberly. We hadn't wanted to tell you. I can see why. It might have put a slight damper on my girlish enthusiasm for playing Nancy Drew. You would be in no danger, Carl insisted. And if I believe that, you've got a bridge you'd like to sell me cheap. Bitter, Carl said, looking puzzled. Never mind. It is true. We will have other agents on that cruise. They will guard you day and night. The moment you have identified the individual or individuals in question, they will be placed under arrest. No, they won't. Bitter, said Burkhardt, trying to look puzzled. He knew perfectly well what I meant. I spelled it out. You can't arrest people because Victoria Bliss thinks they look like somebody who might once maybe have committed a crime. You'll have to wait till they do something illegal. And while you're waiting, I'll be sitting there like a groundhog on a superhighway at rush hour. If they are known to me, I'm also known to them. You will be in no danger, Burkhardt repeated. Damn right, I stood up. Because I won't be on that cruise. Auf Wiedersehen, meine Herren. Think about it, Carl said smoothly. You needn't decide now. I was thinking about it. My acquaintanceship with the members of the art underworld is more extensive than I would like, but there was one individual with whom I was particularly well acquainted. His had been the first name that occurred to me. If it was his name. He had at least four aliases, including his favorite, Sir John Smythe. I didn't know, I'd never known, his last name. And even though he'd told me his first name was John, I had no reason to suppose he was telling the truth. He hardly ever did tell the truth. He was a thief and a swindler and a liar, and he had dragged me into a number of embarrassing, not to say dangerous, situations. But if he hadn't come to my rescue at the risk of grievous bodily harm to himself, something John preferred not to do, I wouldn't be in Carl's office wondering whether he and Herr Burkhardt knew or only suspected that the individual they were after might be my occasional and elusive lover. It took me a long time to get back to sleep after that grisly dream. I wasn't in the best possible condition to cope with Munich's rush hour traffic next morning. Short on sleep, tense with a mixture of anger, anxiety, and indecision. It was raining, of course. It always rains in Munich when somebody offers me a trip to someplace bright and warm and sunny. I've lived in Munich for a number of years, ever since I wangled a job out of the funny little fat man who had been a prime suspect in my first case, as he would call it. He wasn't the murderer, as it turned out. He was a famous scholar, director of the National Museum, and he'd been impressed by my academic credentials, as well as by the fact that I could have embarrassed the hell out of him by telling the world about some of his shenanigans during that adventure. We had become good friends, and I had come to think of Munich as my adopted hometown. It's a beautiful city, in one of the most beautiful parts of the world, when the sun is shining. 
In the rain, with fallen leaves making the streets slick and dangerous, it's as dreary as any other large city. When I pulled off into the staff parking lot behind the museum, Carl, the janitor, popped out of his cubicle to inquire after the health, not of my humble self, but of Caesar, for whom he has an illicit passion. I assured him all was well and hurried through the storage areas of the basement, praying Schmidt hadn't arrived yet. I had to go to the museum office to collect my mail and messages. If I didn't, Gerda, Schmidt's hideously efficient and inquisitive secretary, would bring them to me and hang around, talking and asking questions and ignoring my hints that she should go away. And then I would probably hit her with something large and heavy, because Gerda gets on my nerves even when they're not already stretched to the breaking point. I entered the office at a brisk trot, glancing at my watch. Goodness, it's later than I thought. Good morning, Gerda. I've got to hurry. I'm awfully late. For what? Gerda inquired. You have no appointment this morning? Unless you have made one without informing me, which is contrary to... I snatched the pile of letters from her desk. She snatched it back. I have not finished sorting them, Vicky. What is wrong with you this morning? Ah, but you look terrible. Did you not sleep? You were perhaps working late? She hoped I hadn't been working late. She hoped I'd been doing something more interesting. Gerda has one of those round, healthy pink faces and mouse-brown hair and wide, innocent, pale blue eyes. She is short. I am all the things Gerda is not. And the poor, dumb woman admires me and tries to imitate me. She also harbors the delusion, derived in part from Schmidt, who shares it, that men whiz in and out of my life like city buses, only more often. Little does she know. It was questionable as to whether John qualified for the role of my lover. Three visits in nine months isn't my idea of a torrid affair. But for the past two years, he'd been the only possible candidate. Yes, I was working late, I lied. She didn't believe me. Ach, oh, so... I thought perhaps Herr Feder. Who? I gaped at her. She had sorted the messages, damn her. She waved two slips of paper at me. He has telephoned twice this morning. He wishes that you call him as soon as possible. Thanks. This time, when I grabbed my mail, she let me keep it. He will have lunch, perhaps? She called after me as I headed quickly for the door. Perhaps. If I could just get out of Gerda's office before Schmidt emerged from his... I was in no condition to cope with Schmidt that morning. He's even nosier than Gerda. I might have known it was going to be one of those days. Schmidt wasn't in his office. He had just arrived. When I flung the door open, there he was, briefcase in one hand, the remains of a jelly donut in the other. Schmidt eats all the time. Jelly donuts are his latest enthusiasm, one he acquired from me. He was wearing one of those trench coats covered with straps, flaps, and pockets, the style James Bond and other famous spies prefer, and an Indiana Jones fedora pulled low over his bristling eyebrows. The ensemble, which indicated that Schmidt was in one of his swashbuckling moods, was ominous enough, but that wasn't what brought me to a stop. Schmidt was singing. That's how he would have described it. Schmidt can't carry a tune in a bucket, but he loves music. And he had recently expanded his repertoire to include country music. American country music. What he was doing to this tune would have sent the citizens of Nashville, Tennessee, running for a rope. It was my fault. I admit that. I had heard them all my life. Not the modern rock adaptations, but the old railroad and work songs, the blues and ballads. During the Great Depression, my granddad had wandered the country like so many other footloose, jobless young men. He bragged of having known Boxcar Willie and John Lomax, and he could still make a guitar cry. I had once made the mistake of playing a Jimmy Rogers tape for Schmidt. That was all it took. In addition to being tone-deaf, Schmidt never gets the words quite right. I sing to my Dixie darling beneath the silver moon, 
with my banjo on my knee. Imagine that in a thick Bavarian accent. He broke off when he saw me. Ah, Vicky, you are here. I'm late, I said automatically. Very late. I have to... But my poor Vicky. He stood on tiptoe, peering up into my face. Your eyes are shadowed and sunken. You have the look of a woman who... Shut up, Schmidt, I said, trying to get around him. He popped the rest of the doughnut into his mouth and caught hold of my hand. Strawberry jelly glued our fingers together. A stream of water from the hem of his coat was soaking my shoes. Come and have coffee and tell Papa Schmidt all about it. Is Karl Feder annoying you again? He should be ashamed, the old rascal. Or, he grinned and winked, or is it another individual who is responsible for the disturbance of your slumber? Glancing over my shoulder, I saw that Gerda was on her feet, leaning precariously across the desk as she tried to overhear. Schmidt had seen her too. Shaking his head, he said disapprovingly, There is no decent regard for privacy in this place. Come into my office, Vicky, where we can be alone, and you will tell Papa Schmidt? No, I said. No what? It was not Sir John. No everything. Nobody disturbed my slumber. No, I will not come into your office. No, Carl Fader is not... I stopped, clutching at the last ragged strands of sanity. Better to let Schmidt think Carl's reasons for calling were personal instead of professional. Or was it? The world was dissolving into chaos around me. See you later, Schmidt, I babbled, freeing my hand. I have to... I have to... go to the bathroom. It was the only place I could think of where he wouldn't follow me. I locked myself into a cubicle and collapsed onto the seat. My hand was red and sticky. In certain lights, strawberry jelly looks a lot like fresh blood. John was certainly a reasonable subject for anxiety dreams. He had more deadly enemies than anyone I'd ever met. Sometimes I was one of them. When I first ran into him, I was trying to track down a forger of historic jewels. I had no business doing any such thing. It was a combination of curiosity and the desire for a free vacation that took me to Rome, and some people might have said that it served me right when I got in over my head. John got me out. He'd been an enthusiastic participant in the swindle until the others decided to eliminate me. But, as he candidly admitted, chivalry had nothing to do with his change of heart. He disapproved of murder on practical grounds. As he put it, the penalties are so much more severe. I never meant to get involved with him. He isn't really my type, only an inch or so taller than I, Slightly built, his features, with one or two exceptions, pleasant but unremarkable. I don't know why I ended up in that little hotel in Trastevere. Gratitude, womanly sympathy for a wounded hero, curiosity, or those exceptional characteristics. It turned out to be a memorable experience, and it may have been the worst mistake I have ever made in my life. Another brief encounter, in Paris, was both embarrassing and expensive. I woke up one morning to find the police hammering at the door and John gone. Naturally, he hadn't paid the hotel bill. So why did I respond to that enigmatic message from Stockholm a few months later? I told myself it was because I wanted to get back at him for Paris, meeting his challenge and beating him at his own game. That's what I told myself. It was a relatively harmless little scheme to begin with. He needed me to gain access to an innocent old gentleman whose backyard happened to be full of buried treasure. But it turned ugly when a second group of crooks zeroed in on the same treasure. That was my first encounter with the hardcore professionals of the art underworld, and I sincerely hoped it would be my last. John was a professional, but compared to Max and Hans and Rudy, 
and their boss, Leif. He looked like little Lord Fauntleroy. They disliked John even more than I did, and from my point of view, he was definitely the lesser of two evils. So once again, we were forced to collaborate in order to escape. My negative opinion of him didn't change, though, until it was one of the more lurid incidents in a life that hasn't been precisely colorless. There we were, trying to row a leaking boat across a very deep, very cold lake during a violent thunderstorm, with an aquatic assassin holding on to the bow and slashing at me with a knife. I had just about resigned myself to dying young when John went over the side of the boat. He was unarmed and outweighed, but he managed to keep Leif occupied until I got to shore. They found Leif's body later. John never turned up, dead or alive. Everybody except me assumed he had drowned. After eight months without a word, I began to wonder myself. The matter of the Trojan gold gave me an excuse to contact John, through the anonymous channels that were the only ones I knew. To be honest, I was surprised when he responded. He had once told me I brought him nothing but bad luck. His luck didn't improve. He got me out of trouble a couple of times, and the second rescue resulted in a considerable amount of damage to John himself. This was decidedly against his principles. He had once explained them to me. It is impossible to convince some people of the error of their ways without hitting them as often and as hard as possible. I simply object to people hitting me. The Trojan Gold Affair had ended with another event John undoubtedly resented as much as he hated being hit by people. I had taken ruthless advantage of a man who was battered, bruised, and bloody to force him to admit he loved me. He had used the word before, but always in context, Shakespeare or John Donne or some other literary giant. The phrases I had wrung out of him that day were boringly banal and direct. They had no literary merit, whatever. It had been ten months since that momentous event. I'd seen John only three times, but almost every week I'd received some message, a postcard or a silly present or a few words on my answering machine, just enough to let me know he was all right. The last postcard had arrived at the end of August, six weeks ago. There'd been nothing since. I got up and went to the wash basin to rinse the jelly off my hand. I had to leave the museum and call Carl from a kiosk or a cafe. I didn't want Gerda listening in. The individual referred to in the message from Burkhardt's agent had to be John. He was the only crook I knew that well, and I was one of the few people in the world who knew him that well. One of the few who had seen him au naturel, who would probably recognize him no matter what disguise he assumed. He couldn't hide the shape of his hands, or his long lashes, or... Six weeks without a word. How could he do this to me, the bastard? Love had nothing to do with it. I was inclined to take that declaration of his with a grain of salt, and I had never returned the compliment. But if he meant to end the relationship... The least he owed me was a courteous dismissal. It had, of course, occurred to me that John might have planted the message himself. He'd done it before. If that was the case, I wouldn't be in danger. John was no killer. What? Never? Well, hardly ever. I had known all along I was going on that damned cruise. As Burkhardt had said, it was an opportunity not to be missed. I've never been very good at poker. I quit playing with Carl Fader a couple of years ago. We had agreed to meet at a cafe. He was waiting when I arrived, and before I so much as opened my mouth, I saw he was smirking. He'd known I'd fall for it. I said, Supposing I did agree. I'm not agreeing, but supposing I did. Why couldn't I go as a tourist? I don't want to make a fool of myself, pretending to knowledge I don't possess. 
because there is no way you could have saved the money for such a trip, Carl said. His voice was as smooth as the whipped cream on his coffee. Bavarians put whipped cream on everything except sauerkraut. That's one of the reasons I love Bavaria. Oh, yes, we could invent an aunt who died and left you her fortune, or some such piece of fiction. But who would believe it? Why would you spend your windfall on such a trip? As you said, this is not your main area of interest. No, let me finish. He raised his finger and shook it in grandfatherly admonition. The story will be that you agreed to replace a friend who was taken ill at the last moment. You are cheating a little, that is understood. But who would not, given such an opportunity? You will be lecturing on... Um, let me see. Ah, on medieval Egyptian art. That would be perfect, Nick. Nicked, I said. I don't know anything about... Oh, hell, what's the use? There's just one thing, Carl. Schmidt. What about him? Everyone knows he has a fondness for you. He would give you leave of absence for such a chance as this? No, I mean, yes, he would. But that's just the trouble. He'll want to come, too. So, he will not know your real purpose. Oh, God. I clutched at my head with both hands. My hair promptly fell down over my face. I'd been experimenting with braids that week, and I hadn't quite got the knack of winding them around my head. No matter how many bobby pins I stuck in, the structure had a tendency to collapse under pressure. Carl began collecting bobby pins from the table while I tried to explain. Schmidt has the most lurid imagination of anyone I know. Even if I were an innocent tourist, he'd assume I had an ulterior motive, something romantic, as he calls it. He'll poke his nose into everything and screw everything up and get himself in trouble, and I'll have to get him out of it. If Schmidt goes, I don't. That's flat. Carl Fader looked thoughtful. He wasn't as familiar with Schmidt's peculiarities as I was, but he had heard a thing or two. Ah, I see. Well, my dear Vicky, do not worry. We will think of some way of preventing him. I didn't like the sound of that. You're not to hurt him, Carl. No hit and run or broken legs. Would we do such a thing? You might not. But if I read Herr Burkhardt and his crowd right, they wouldn't hesitate. I'm not kidding, Carl. If you touch a hair of Schmidt's mustache, I'll blow the whole deal wide open. I believe you, Carl said. You're damn well better. All right. If you can get Schmidt out of the way, I'll do it. What happens next? We will handle all the arrangements. Your passport is in order, I assume? Good. Visa, tickets, and other necessary documents will be delivered to you within a few days. My secretary will make the appointments for you, but she cannot take the inoculations. Hepatitis, typhoid, typhus. Ugh, I said. I hate shots. Is all that necessary? I thought this was a luxury cruise. We cannot risk your falling ill, Carl said seriously. He took a thick manila envelope from his breast pocket and handed it to me. I must ask you to sign a voucher acknowledging receipt of the money. We will supply a medical kit, camera, binoculars, and the like. But I assume a young lady will want to purchase her own clothing and other personal effects. It was a very thick envelope. Carl's smile was very bland. I sighed. We have already determined what you are, madam, I quoted. All that is left is to determine your price. Bitte, said Carl. Never mind. We will take care of everything, Carl repeated. You need do nothing. <laughs> Excuse me, what was it you said? He knew perfectly well what I had said. He prefers to believe a lady doesn't use words like that. I pushed my chair back and stood up. Anything else? Carl reached into his pocket again. The object he withdrew was a slick, brightly colored brochure. 
It had been folded once, lengthwise, to fit in his pocket. He unfolded it and handed it to me. On the cover, under a tastefully designed title, was a photograph of the Sphinx, with the pyramids of Giza behind it. It was a gorgeous photo. The pyramids were a soft, pale gold. The sky above them was a bright, clear blue. The smile on the face of the Sphinx has been described in a number of ways, mysterious, enigmatic, contemplative. At that moment, it seemed to me that it bore a distinct resemblance to the smug smirk on Carl Fader's face. Two weeks later, I sat on a rock at Giza, contemplating the real thing. I was trying to avoid the eyes of the Sphinx. It was still smirking. The actuality wasn't as attractive as the photograph. The photographer must have been a genius or a magician to eliminate other objects from his composition. There were lots of them, all more or less unattractive. Camels, they are not at their best handsome animals. Tourists, ditto. Guides and peddlers in dirty flapping robes. Cheap souvenir shops, scaffolding and barbed wire and makeshift ramshackle bits of fencing and construction. However, only a pedant would quibble about such minor flaws. The pyramids were wonderful. The Sphinx would have been magnificent, marred and scarred though it was, if it hadn't been smirking. Was I enjoying the view? No, I wasn't. My arms were swollen and sore from too many shots too close together, but that wasn't what bothered me. The sun was beating down on my head and shoulders, but I didn't mind that. My stomach felt slightly queasy, but it wasn't from anything I'd eaten. Some distance away, a small group of people had gathered round an individual who appeared to be lecturing to them. They were distinguished from the other groups that covered the plateau like hordes of locusts by the bags they had slung over their shoulders. Many of the tour groups presented their clients with such bags so that the bright, distinctive colors could help identify lost or wandering members of the group but there were no colors quite as distinctive as these. Broad stripes of gold, a turquoise blue and bright red-orange, the shades so often found in Egyptian jewelry. One of the same bags, trimmed in gold braid and bearing my name, lay on the sand at my feet. My eyes went back to the paper on my lap. It was the passenger list. My name wasn't on it. I would appear and be introduced after the boat had sailed. This was in keeping with my cover story, that I had replaced a friend at the last moment. It was also a safety precaution to keep my presence from being known in advance. Some safety precaution, I thought sourly. Well, it couldn't hurt. Some of the passengers had boarded the boat the day before. I'd gone to a hotel instead and spent the afternoon guess where. A few hours in the Cairo Museum, for someone in my profession, is like a nibble of fudge to a chocoholic. The place is stuffed, bulging, overflowing with wonders. I was familiar with many of them from photographs and films, but there is no substitute for seeing the real thing. And the minor artifacts, the ones that weren't so often featured, were just as beautiful. I stood for ten minutes studying the inlay on a small box. Shadowing my enjoyment, however, was my real reason for being there. The more I saw, the more I wondered why people like John hadn't already stripped the museum. I don't mean to criticize. The whole damned country is a museum, and no one knew better than I how much it cost in money and manpower just to maintain the antiquities, much less support additional excavation. Egypt is a poor country, with a soaring birth rate, there aren't enough schools, clinics, or jobs, or even food. Half of it has to be imported. The Egyptians were in a particularly ironic situation, since the hordes of tourists on which the economy depended were slowly and inexorably destroying the treasures they came to see. According to one article I'd read, visitors to the tomb of Tutankhamun put out as much as 25 pints of perspiration per day, raising the humidity in the small room to a point that damaged the paint and the underlying plaster. The very stones of the Sphinx had been eaten away by pollution and misguided attempts at repair. 
The museum was a disaster in progress, dirty, crowded, and dangerously understaffed. Some of the cases looked as if they could be opened with one of my hairpins. There was no air conditioning or humidity control. The windows were open, admitting dust and the exhaust fumes from Cairo's teeming traffic. When I left, reeling under a combination of horror and artistic overload, I had to pick my way through a group of chattering women scrubbing the floor on their hands and knees, and I found myself peering intently at their faces, looking for familiar features, the shape of a neatly curved ear, the outline of a high cheekbone. That was the sort of disguise that would appeal to John's bizarre sense of humor. What could he be after this time? His usual modus operandi involved substitution rather than outright theft. This must be something big, so big in size or importance that its absence couldn't be concealed. God knows there were plenty of possibilities, starting with the golden coffins of Tutankhamun. I'd managed to convince myself there was no immediate danger. The tour group was leaving Cairo next day. It would return in three weeks for a longer stay. That must be when he intended to do the job, using the other passengers as camouflage. That morning, I'd sent my luggage to the boat and taken a taxi to Giza. I would join the others when they got on the bus that was to take them back to the boat. I had already spotted John on the passenger list. It had to be he. No one would have a name as ridiculous as Peregrine Foggington Smythe. He'd even have the gall to use a variation of his favorite nom de guerre, typical of his arrogance and his sometimes dangerous sense of humor. He wasn't a passenger. The list included the names of the staff. Foggington Smythe was one of the guest lecturers, a distinguished Egyptologist from Boston, author of several books with titles like Cast and Gender in Ancient Egypt, whatever the hell that might mean. I wondered how John had convinced Galactic Tours, Inc., that he was the man in question. For all I knew, he might be an Egyptologist. He had claimed his specialty was classics, but once or twice he had displayed a fairly esoteric familiarity with matters Egyptological. But I was sure, well, almost sure, he couldn't be the real Foggington Smythe. Not that an Egyptologist couldn't be a criminal. Scholars are no more noble than the next man. But not even John would have time to lecture, write several ponderous tomes, and carry on a career as a master thief. Would he? I looked up from the list to see someone plodding toward me. One of the bright bags was slung over her shoulder. She must have spotted mine. She was the type that would notice things like that, a woman of a certain age, of medium height and stocky frame, with unblinking gray eyes under heavy brows. She had to be English. Her fair skin was already pink, though it glistened with sunshield, and she was wearing a long-sleeved tan blouse and a shapeless khaki skirt that reached almost to her ankles. She looked familiar, and of course I knew why. I'd seen her type in a number of British films, the housekeeper, the headmistress, the stocky spinster who is either the detective or a leading suspect. She stamped up to me, frowning. Suddenly I felt very young. Her expression brought back painful memories of my great Aunt Ermintrude, who had disapproved of everything about me and had never bothered to conceal her opinion. One of us, are you, dear? she inquired indicating the bag. You must be a newcomer, so I thought I ought to make certain you know where the bus is and that it will be leaving shortly. You'd best come along with me. You don't want to miss it. You shouldn't be alone in a place like this. These natives will take advantage of an attractive young woman. My name is Trigarf. Call me Jen. How'd you do? I said brilliantly, Hi. And where is your hat? Jen looked at me severely. Most unwise of you to come out without one. You have a nice color, but the sun is deadly here. You risk heat prostration or sunstroke. I forgot, I said meekly. I do have one, a hat. I forgot it. Well, don't do it again. What did you say your name was? Vicky. Vicky Bliss. 
There was no reason for me to be coy about it. She'd find out in a few hours. You're not on the passenger list? Her tone made it sound like an accusation. No, I joined the cruise at the last minute. A friend of mine had to cancel owing to illness, and I see. Her face relaxed. The expression wasn't anything like a smile, but it was probably as close as she could come. Glad to see another young person on board. Most of the passengers are practically senile. My son and his wife will be pleased to have someone their own age to talk to. Not that they... She looked up over my shoulder, and the change in her face made me stare. So she could smile. Ah, but here they are, looking for me, I expect. My dears, allow me to introduce... I didn't hear the rest of it. When I turned, my ears went dead. The way they do after a sudden change in altitude. She couldn't have been more than eighteen, twenty at the outside. Her skin had that exquisite English fairness, and her hair was a mass of cloudy brown curls framing her heart-shaped face. I saw that much, and the fact that the top of her head barely reached his chin and that he had gone dead white under his tan, and that his eyes were as flat and opaque as blue circles painted on paper. The girl smiled and spoke. My ears popped midway through the speech, and I caught the last words. Call me Mary. This... She tilted her head and looked up at him, her eyes shining. This is John. He had himself under control, except for his color. He always had trouble with that. His voice was cool and steady. How do you do? We'd better hurry. The others have gone on. Mother? She waved away the arm he offered. No, darling, I'm perfectly capable of walking a few more yards unassisted. You look a little... Are you feeling well? His brows drew together. And she said hurriedly, Oh, dear, I'm fussing, aren't I? I promise I won't do it again. Come along, Vicky. You and I will lean on one another. She didn't need assistance. She was a lot steadier on her feet than I was. I stumbled along beside her, grateful for the uneven terrain, and the heat, and the need for haste, since they offered an excuse for the fact that I couldn't seem to take a deep breath. From behind me, I heard a murmur of voices and a soft, silvery laugh. The bus was one of those modern monsters, air-conditioned and enormous. As soon as we'd settled ourselves, an attendant came round with a tray. Mineral water, he inquired softly. Orange juice, mimosa. It occurred to my numbed brain that mimosas had alcohol of some kind in them. Champagne? Who cared? I grabbed one and tossed it down. Jen had taken the seat next to mine. Several rows ahead, I saw the familiar outlines of a neatly shaped skull covered with fair hair. Mary's head wasn't visible over the back of the seat. She was so tiny. Have I mentioned I'm almost six feet tall? Maybe it was the alcohol that cleared my head, but I doubt it. The damn thing was mostly orange juice. I turned to Jen. Guinevere? He had told me that was his mother's name. I'd assumed it was a joke. Guinevere, I said experimentally. My voice seemed to be working. She didn't question my knowledge. I suppose she thought she'd told me. She couldn't possibly remember everything she said. She'd been talking nonstop. Her chin lifted proudly. We're an old Cornish family. Tree, pollen, pen. You know the rhyme? Names beginning with those syllables distinguish the Cornish men. There is a tradition that Arthur himself was our remote ancestor. My father's name was Gawain. His father's name was Arthur. On my mother's side... Mother's side, I repeated, to show I was paying attention. I waved at the steward. Guzzling my second mimosa, I lost the next few sentences. Only a distant connection with Egypt, really. So when I decided to marry, I chose a cousin in order to carry on the family name. 
poor Agravain. I didn't see a great deal of him. He was always running off to some war or other. Agravain? That was what I called him. He'd been christened Albert, and I believed his friends referred to him as... as Al. So common. It was he who insisted on calling our son John. I wanted to name him Percival or Galahad. I choked on my drink. Jen gave me a hearty slap on the back. Her brow clouded. Oh dear, I hope I didn't offend the dear boy. Men are so sensitive about weakness, you know. And I promised myself I would stop fussing over him, especially now that he has a wife to look after him. But he was so ill last winter. A skiing accident and then pneumonia. He seems quite fit now, but I worry. Skiing accident, I repeated, like a parrot. I guess it could have been described that way. John wasn't the world's greatest skier, and he'd fallen flat on his already damaged face while he was trying to reach the spot where a very unpleasant individual was about to do unpleasant things to me before finishing me off permanently. However, the worst of his injuries had resulted from the hand-to-hand -hand fight that followed his arrival, and from the avalanche that had followed the fight. I hadn't known about his subsequent illness, but I wasn't surprised to hear of it. If he'd stayed in bed for a few days instead of sneaking off the first time I left him alone. Fortunately, Jen didn't notice my abstraction. She was perfectly happy to carry the conversation. I sat slugging down champagne and orange juice while Jen went merrily on, telling me how she had feared her dear boy would never settle down. He's so attractive to women. About the whirlwind courtship. He didn't bring her to meet me until a few weeks ago. And about their insistence that she join them on their honeymoon. Honeymoon, said the parrot. Yes, they were married last week. Such a lovely ceremony in the family home, with only their close friends present. Of course, I refused when they first suggested I come along, but Mary was so insistent, and John assured me that she would be deeply wounded if I did not agree. Naturally, I mean to stay out of their way as much as possible. I don't remember what else she said. The others had checked in the day before, so I didn't have to wait unmercifully long before a steward was assigned to show me to my room. I was vaguely conscious of its elegance. A long curved window with a small railed balcony beyond. A private bath. My suitcases had been arranged at the foot of the bed. I got rid of the steward and collapsed into the nearest chair. Sometimes, especially in the middle of the night, when you wake up and stumble sleepily through a darkened room and stub your toe or bang your elbow, it takes several seconds for the pain to reach your sluggish brain. I had managed to keep it at bay for much longer than that. Chapter 2 A badly bruised ego can hurt just as much as a broken heart. When one is young and stupid and romantic and vulnerable, one is inclined to confuse the two. I was none of the above, except possibly stupid. But God knows I'd made that mistake on a number of occasions. Not this time, though. Shock, anger, humiliation, shame to mention only a few of the emotions that boiled inside me, had been responsible for my reaction. I must have managed to conceal it from Jen. She hadn't seemed to see anything unusual. I only hoped I hadn't betrayed myself to John. I pulled myself to my feet. The cocktail hour would begin shortly, and I was supposed to attend. It would be my first public appearance, my first chance to connect faces and forms with the names on the passenger list. A waste of time, since I had already found the individual I'd been asked to identify. But I'd have to face him sooner or later, and I was damned if I'd let him know how badly he'd shaken me. The accommodations lived up to the advertisement. In addition to the twin beds, there was a couch long enough for even me to stretch out on, and two comfortable chairs. The bathroom hadn't only a shower, but a tub. Not quite long enough for me to stretch out in, but few of them are. 
and the dressing table was lined with fancy bottles bearing the labels of a famous French cosmetician. Methodically and mechanically, I unpacked, showered, and settled myself at the dressing table, ready for action. Usually I don't bother with much makeup, but I planned to use every speck of artificial assistance I could get that night. I wanted to look gorgeous, cool, calm, and indifferent. With luck, I might manage the last three, anyhow. My hands were still unsteady. I tried to calm myself by recalling all the dirty, low-down tricks John had pulled. But my mind kept wandering off the track, remembering. Remembering times like the Christmas Eve we had spent in the abandoned church, huddling close to the feeble fire, while a blizzard raged without drinking tea made in a dirt-encrusted flower pot with a crumpled tea bag from the hoard I carried in my backpack. John had laughed himself sick over the contents of that backpack, but he had been hungry enough to eat the crumbling gingerbread and the squashed chocolate bar. He'd played Bach on a tissue-covered comb, and when I couldn't keep my eyes open any longer, he'd sat up all night holding me in his arms to keep me warm and patiently feeding the tiny fire. I didn't need blusher. My cheeks were bright red. I went to work dulling the flush of anger with foundation and covering up a few lines that hadn't been there last time I looked. There had never been a commitment, or even a promise. But it is, to say the least, disconcerting to kiss someone goodbye after he has made tender, passionate, skillful love to you, and have him show up with a brand new wife the next time you meet. He hadn't set me up for that shock, though. His pallor might have been due to rage, consternation, or fear, but it had been genuine. He hadn't expected to see me. I selected a dress and slid into it. It was black and slinky, with long sleeves and a neckline that plunged lower than Aunt Ermintrude would have approved. I filled in some of the space with a heavy faux gold necklace and pendant, stuck a couple of gold-headed picks into the hair coiled at the nape of my neck, and stood back to study the effect. My cheeks were still flushed. I would have to claim it was sunburn. Jen had warned me about wearing a hat, hadn't she? A delicate chime of bells sounded, and I started nervously before I realized that it was the summons I'd been waiting for. It was five minutes before five, time for the opening reception and cocktail hour. Some of the guests had come on board the day before, but others, like myself, had joined the cruise later. For the first time, they would all be together inspecting me as I would be inspecting them. I don't often suffer from stage fright, but my fingers froze on the doorknob, and I had to force myself to turn it. I plunged out into the corridor and found myself in the arms of a strange man who had emerged from the room next to mine. My timing was perfect, but the strange man was not. He was a good six inches shorter than I, and I had an excellent view of his balding cranium, across which a few strands of hair had been arranged with pathetic optimism. Clutching me to his stomach, he staggered back into the grasp of another man, who was as tall and thin as he was short and pudgy. After a brief interval, which seemed to last a lot longer than it actually did, we got ourselves sorted out and began a chorus of apologies. My fault, I said. I should have looked before I leaped. I do beg your pardon, said my first encounter simultaneously. He began to laugh merrily. Allow me to introduce ourselves. I am sweet, and this is bright. The tall, thin man bowed. He had a nice, thick head of hair. It slipped a little when he inclined his head. Bliss, I said. Victoria Bliss. Sweet chuckled. It was meant to be. What, I said. Bright, sweet, and bliss. Oh, I said. Sweet beamed. 
Bright beamed. The corridor was too narrow to allow us to walk arm in arm, so we proceeded single file, with Bright leading the way and Sweet following me. They managed it very neatly. In fact, the whole business had been carried out with consummate skill. If I hadn't been on the alert, I would never have spotted them. Burkhardt had refused to tell me how I could identify his agents. It is a matter of security, you understand, he had said solemnly. It is a matter of my neck, I had pointed out. Fear not, said Burkhardt. They will make themselves known to you. Well, they had, and very deftly at that. I wouldn't have expected subordinates of Herr Burkhardt's to have such crazy senses of humor. The cleverest part of the performance had been when Sweet pressed me close and the hard object in his breast pocket had jabbed painfully into my ribs. A bruise was a small price to pay for that kind of reassurance. The central lobby into which the corridor led was magnificent. I hadn't been in a fit state to take in the details earlier. Now I admired the lush greenery in the center, the miniature waterfall that tumbled through it, the soft chairs and sofas, and little marble-topped tables scattered around. Bright and sweet swooped in on me, one on either side, and led me toward the stairs. The lounge, or saloon, occupied the entire front section of the boat. Curving windows gave a magnificent view of the city, its high-rise hotels and minarets and bridges blossoming with lights, and glass doors opened onto the deck. Waiters were circulating with trays of glasses. The beverage of choice that evening appeared to be champagne. Since I don't care for champagne, and since I wanted to get rid of sweet for a few minutes— He'd been talking incessantly about God knows what. I accepted his offer to get me something else from the bar. Bright and I settled down at a table. He smiled bashfully at me and tugged at his grizzled mustache, which was as luxuriant as his hair. Either it was real, or the fixative was more effective than the stuff he used on his head. I inspected the other guests with unconcealed interest. They were doing the same. There were only thirty of us, and we would be in close company for several weeks. I'd been warned that this crowd would probably dress more formally than was usual on such cruises. People who are embarrassingly rich like to show off. My mail-order cocktail dress looked pretty insignificant next to the designer gowns many of the other women were sporting, and the dazzle of diamonds dimmed my faux gold locket— Many of the men wore tuxes or dinner jackets. Jen and her new daughter-in-law were sitting at a table on the other side of the room with two other people. A married couple, I cleverly deduced. The woman's pink hair matched her dress and his bald head. When she caught my eye, Jen waved and gave me a tight-lipped smile. John wasn't with them, but as I returned Jen's wave... He came sauntering toward their table, as infuriatingly casual as always. He looked very much the bridegroom, with a flower in his buttonhole and a matching crimson cummerbund. Catching me in mid-wave, he raised an eyebrow, nodded distantly, and sat down with his back to me. Sweet returned with a glass of Chablis, and a man stepped up onto the podium in the center of the floor. At the sight of him... I forgot Bright, Sweet, and John. The tux set off his lean body and broad shoulders, but he ought to have been wearing flowing robes and a snowy Bedouin headdress that would frame his walnut-brown skin, hawk-like nose, and sharply cut features. His black eyes were fringed with lashes so thick they looked artificial. A chorus of involuntary sighs came from every woman in the room. Some of them looked old enough to have seen the original Rudolph Valentino film. I wasn't old enough, but I had read the book. I have read every soppy, sentimental novel ever written. To look at her, you wouldn't think my sharp-tongued, practical grandma had an ounce of romance in her soul. But she owned all the old novels. In her day, the chic had been pretty hot stuff. 
Ahmed, mon bel Arab, she murmured yearningly. I murmured yearningly. I beg your pardon, said Sweet. Shh, I said. His name wasn't Ahmed. It was Faisal. His accent suggested he'd been educated in England. The underlying traces of his native tongue gave his velvety baritone a fascinating touch of the exotic. I am your leader and your devoted servant, ladies and gentlemen. I will be with you on the boat and on shore, wherever you go. You will come to me with all your troubles, questions, and complaints, and I will pass them on to your crew, which I now have the honor to introduce. He presented the captain, the purser, the doctor, the chef, and a few others. I lost track of what he was saying as I studied the blonde at the next table. Her eyes were fixed in a glassy stare, and she seemed to be having trouble breathing. It might have been her corset. She had to be wearing something formidable under the white draped silk jersey. It molded, not moving flesh, but a substance as rigid as concrete. I caught a name and returned my attention to Faisal. Dr. Peregrine Foggington Smythe, our expert on pharaonic Egypt he announced. So there were parents cruel enough to saddle a kid with a name like Peregrine. If I had seen him from a distance, I might have taken him for John, briefly. He was a stretched-out, washed-out version of the great John Smythe, taller and skinnier, with ash-blonde hair and pale blue eyes. He informed us with magnificent condescension that he would be lecturing on Saqqara, the site we would visit the following day, as soon as Faisal finished his introductions. He stepped back, and Faisal, whose face had frozen into a look of barely contained dislike, turned on the charm again as he presented Dr. Alice Gordon, who would be delivering the lectures on Hellenistic Egypt. Dr. Gordon rose and raised her hand, but remained modestly in her place at a table near the back of the room. She was a plump little woman with a mop of unkempt graying brown hair and thick glasses. The boat was certainly overloaded with experts, or at least with PhDs. When my name was announced, I followed Dr. Gordon's example, rising and subsiding without comment, but with a modest smile. I was the last of the staff to be introduced. A babble of conversation broke out, as several of the crewmen started setting up a slide projector and screen, and Sweet exclaimed, So it's Dr. Bliss. We are honored. I've always been fascinated by Islamic art. Tell me. I got quickly to my feet. If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'm going to sneak out for a smoke before the lecture starts. Don't move. I'll be right back. Several other sinners followed me. Smoking wasn't allowed in the lounge during lectures, and it was only permitted in a small walled-off area at other times. I was rather proud of myself for having realized that this habit, which is approximately as socially acceptable as spitting in public, might come in handy if I needed to extricate myself from a sticky situation. Avoiding the other lepers who were clustered defensively at the rail, I walked on till I found myself alone but not for long. Permit me, said a too familiar voice. A lighter materialized in front of me. The hand holding it was equally familiar, though it wasn't as well tended as usual. The knuckles were scraped and rough. He must have run into a pyramid or something. Or slammed his fist into something. Maybe I'd shaken that cultivated cool of his as he'd shaken mine. I'd have loved to think so. Taking a firm grip on my temper, I inhaled, coughed, and turned. Where's Schmidt? he asked. I had assumed he'd want to have a private word with me, and I had carefully composed sarcastic but very cool replies to the questions I thought he'd ask. Waste of time. I should have known he wouldn't start out with anything as obvious as, What are you doing here? Caught off guard, I told the truth. 
Uh, in Amsterdam. Some rich Dutchman is considering offering the museum his antique jewelry collection. Oh, jolly good, John said, not so enigmatically. His eyes moved from my face to the V of my dress. Reflexively, my hand closed over the locket. John's lip curled. It was one of his better sneers. Don't bother switching it on. I already did. How did you know? It's a tasteless trinket, my dear. Not your style. I bit my lip to keep from swearing. He was fighting dirty, hitting below the belt where it hurt the most. Had he seen the thin gold chain under the heavier chain that held the locket? Almost certainly. It had been a shot in the dark. He couldn't possibly know I was wearing the little enameled rose he had given me, because I had tucked it securely down under, out of sight. That trinket was not tasteless. It was an exquisite example of antique Persian goldsmith's work. I wasn't wearing it for sentimental reasons. I was wearing it because I didn't want to leave it lying around where someone might see it. John's eyes shifted. You're on the wrong track, Vicky, he said softly. I don't know what imbecile impulse persuaded you to join this cruise, but I strongly suggest you accept my assurance that it is nothing more and nothing less than it appears to be. A romantic honeymoon? I inquired evenly. With the girl who swept me off my feet, said John. He had seen her coming and pitched his voice so she would hear the last sentence. Laughing, she slid her arm through his and leaned against him. Isn't he a dear? Sorry to disturb you, darling, but the lecture's about to start. John gave me a smile that went nowhere near his eyes. That's just an excuse. She doesn't approve of my habits. Mary shook her head. I don't approve of your smoking, no. It's so dangerous. Not nearly so dangerous as certain other habits, said Mary's husband. I declined Mary's invitation to join them, claiming I wanted another cigarette. The only drawback was that I had to let John light it for me and pretend not to notice his amusement when I tried to inhale without turning purple. After they'd gone, I unclenched my left hand. My nails had left dents in the skin of my palm. I missed the first few minutes of Foggington Smythe's lecture, which turned out to be a smart move. He was the most boring speaker I have ever heard. My interest in the development of the pyramid form is decidedly limited, but he could have made a lecture on pornography with slides dull. When the lights went on, several people snorted and started and blinked. Not my new friend, Jen. Bright-eyed and full of vim, she headed straight for me. She was wearing a salmon-colored silk frock that would have looked absurd on any female less superbly indifferent to the opinions of womankind. The uneven hem waved around her ankles. I had no idea when we met that you were a distinguished scholar, she cried. You don't look like one, my dear. You are far too young and attractive. Thank you, I said, since that is just about the only way one can respond to a dubious compliment of that sort. I assumed it was meant as a compliment. The others were drifting toward the doors, except for a few presumed archaeology buffs who had gathered around the lecturer. Won't you join me for dinner? Jen asked. There is no assigned seating, you know. I do think that's an excellent idea. It gives us a chance to make new friends and change about if we like. I'd love to have you tell me all about yourself. I rather doubted that. Nor did I feel I was quite up to munching my way through six courses in the company of the lovebirds. I'd like to, but... I indicated Bright and Sweet, who had punctiliously risen to acknowledge her arrival. Yes, I know, Mr. Bright and Mr. Sweet. That will be splendid. Four of us will complete the table. She gave me a conspiratorial wink. I don't want my dear children to feel they're obliged to entertain me all the time. 
Relieved of that anxiety, I was pleased to agree. Not that I had much choice. Jen had taken my arm in a grip as firm as that of a prison guard. I had realized early on that she was one of those women who will get her own way by one means or another, and I wondered whose idea it had been to make the honeymoon a menage a trois. Surely not John's, unless he was ruthless and unprincipled enough to use his own mother and his bride as a means of diverting suspicion. We wended our way down the stairs to the lowest deck and the dining room. The decor reminded me that this wasn't just any old cruise. There were fresh flowers on every table and a row of wine glasses at every place. A waiter led us to a table for four and presented us with menus stiff with gilt print. The napkins had been folded into intricate shapes. I was reaching for mine when the waiter whipped it out of my grasp and spread it neatly across my knees. I tried to look as if I had expected it. Sweet and bright took forever deciding on an appetizer. I had already ordered, so I had leisure to inspect the room. The murals covering the walls were copies of famous tomb reliefs, not scenes of death and judgment, but bright, cheerful depictions of birds and animals and scenes of daily life. The one on the wall next to our table showed two pretty Egyptian maidens with long black hair and diaphanous robes playing musical instruments. The third pretty maiden wasn't wearing anything except a few beads. Sweet goggled appreciatively at her. Jen was speaking to me. I turned to her with an apologetic smile. Sorry I was admiring the murals. They are excellent copies, aren't they? Morbid, Jen said decidedly. Pictures from tombs are not suitable for a dining room. Her lips had tightened and her brows had drawn together. It was a forbidding expression, and I remembered a comment John had made about his mother. She looks like Judith Anderson playing a demented housekeeper. The wild surmise that entered my mind was equally demented. Ridiculous, I told myself. Chicanery isn't hereditary. Sweet had finished ordering. But, Mrs. Tregarth, the paintings show the Egyptians' enjoyment of the pleasures of life. What could be more appropriate for such an occasion as this? Jen turned the look on him. He swallowed and said, People are much more interesting, though, aren't they? Tell us about yourself, Dr. Bliss. I will if you will, I said, coyly. What business are you in, Mr. Sweet? He manufactured nuts and bolts, very special nuts and bolts, for a specific kind of machine. Don't ask me what kind. I was no more interested than Mr. Sweet appeared to be. After rattling off a description of the process, he explained that he and Mr. Bright were partners in business as well as in their enthusiasm for archaeology. When we heard of this cruise, we knew it was an opportunity not to be missed, he said enthusiastically. To see so many sites that are normally closed to tourists. And of course, the Pièce de Résistance, the tomb of Queen Tetisheri. We are the first visitors to behold the restoration of the paintings. The work has taken years. And a great deal of money that might have been spent on more worthy causes, said Jen, with a loud sniff. Mr. Blankiron has contributed munificently to a number of worthy causes, Sweet protested. That is a matter of opinion, Jen said, an opinion her expression made clear that she did not share. Is he here? Which one is he? I swiveled around. Don't stare, Jen said. My head snapped back into position. It was pure reflex, shades of Aunt Ermintrude. Sweet gave me a wink and a knowing smile. We're all staring, he said amiably. It's only natural, Mrs. Tregarth, that we should take an interest in our fellow travelers. For long weeks we will be together in a little world all our own, separated from our friends and families, thrown together in an artificial intimacy. Which of these strangers is to be cultivated? Which to be avoided? Will some of these passing encounters result in lasting friendships? 
or even in uh, more intense relationships. You have quite a gift for words, Mr. Sweet, I said. Are you sure you aren't a famous writer in disguise? Sweet laughed. Alas, no. We do have a well-known writer with us. She's traveling under her own name, but she's made no secret of her pseudonym. No doubt she means to make copy of us all. Mr. Blankiron is the tall, dark-haired gentleman at the table under the painting of the fellow spearing fish. Jen had given me up as a bad job and was devouring smoked salmon, so I proceeded to stare to my heart's content. The activities of most excessively wealthy individuals bore me to tears, but Blank Iron was an exception. Unlike some of his billionaire peers, he shunned publicity. He didn't attend fundraisers or hoity-toity social functions, or hobnob with politicians and rock stars. He didn't give interviews, or even get divorced. I knew his name because he'd been a generous and unobtrusive supporter of many cultural enterprises. The rebuilding of the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, after a bomb blast. The conservation of the water-rotted monuments of Venice, to name only a few. His chief interest, however, was ancient Egypt. I had read of the restoration of Tetisheri's tomb, and I admit that the prospect of visiting it was one of the few plus entries in an otherwise negative agenda. To see the famous paintings restored to their original freshness, with the film of grease and grime removed and the damaged sections repaired, would be a unique experience. I'd expected Blank Iron to be older. There was gray in his hair, but it was only a sprinkling of silver against dark brown, and the lines in his face, fanning out from the corners of his deep-set eyes and framing a long-lipped, flexible mouth, were those of good nature and maturity. He, too, was inspecting his fellow passengers. Catching my eye, he nodded and smiled. The person on his right is his secretary, Sweet informed me in a conspiratorial whisper. The person wasn't a blonde female, but a bald male. I couldn't see his face since he had his back to me. Who's the other guy at the table? I had a pretty good idea. He resembled all the lean, lined heroes of Western films, and his dinner jacket didn't fit quite right. Sweet rolled his eyes. Bright and I have dubbed him the bodyguard. How clever of you, I said. By the time we'd finished, five courses, not six, Sweet had identified some of the other passengers for me and supplied capsule biographies for many of them. The blonde in the tight corset was a Mrs. Umfanur from Memphis, Tennessee, not Egypt, who had taken the cruise to console herself for the death of her third husband. The misanthropic reader alone at a nearby table was a German surgeon who specialized in urology. What he was doing on the cruise, Sweet couldn't imagine. He was not a friendly person, and he appeared to be only mildly interested in Egyptology. I sincerely hoped he wasn't interested in medieval Islamic art. Jen had eaten her way through all five courses and was looking a trifle bloated by the time we prepared to return to the lounge for coffee and after-dinner drinks. Sweet announced he and Bright would have to deny themselves that pleasure, since the group was to leave for a shore tour at seven the next morning. "'You young ladies can do without sleep,' he said with a gallant bow. "'But if Bright and I don't get our eight hours, we're good for nothing.' Bright nodded and smiled. He hadn't said a word. Jen took me by the arm. I winced. John had mentioned that his mother was a dedicated gardener. I had no idea that form of exercise could develop such formidable muscles. I don't like being manhandled, even by women. So I said, I'm a little tired myself. I think I'll skip the coffee. But it's included, Jen exclaimed. Bright and sweet had faded away. I was on my own. I let her tow me toward the stairs. Not until she'd settled us at a table and waved imperiously at a passing waiter did I remember I had an excuse to escape. 
I'm going out on deck to have a cigarette, I announced, rising. Again, that imperative hand closed over my arm. No need for that, my dear. We'll move to the smoking section. You should have told me, waiter. But you don't... I do indulge occasionally. My son smokes, Jen said, as if that were justification for any evil habit. Any evil habit? The sinners had gathered in a railed-off area near the open doors. Among them, I was surprised to see Mr. Blankiron. His secretary wasn't with him, but he was surrounded by Mrs. Umfenor and her fur coat. It was the biggest damn coat I've ever seen. Some sort of long, silky white fur I couldn't identify in the dim light. She tossed it over her shoulders, and it appeared to be eating blank iron. Jen dragged me to a table as far from the pair as she could get. Disgusting, she muttered. Her husband not dead a month, and she's already looking for number four. I took out a cigarette. I suppose I had to smoke the damn thing. Jen accepted one when I offered it. She also had brandy included. She was decidedly glassy-eyed by the time the newlyweds turned up. They must have been strolling the deck. Mary's hair was bewitchingly wind-blown. Still at it? John inquired of his mother as the waiter delivered another glass of brandy. Jen giggled. Darling is such a tease. What will you and Mary have? It's all included, John finished. He held a chair for Mary, but remained standing, an inimical eye on his maternal parent. The doctor warned you about your spastic colon. Delicate stomach, Jen corrected. You'd better take some of that ghastly medicine, her son said resignedly. I watched you at dinner. You were shoveling it in like a stevedore. Darling, Mary said, aren't you being a little rude? He's just teasing, Jen explained, rummaging in her bag, and taking good care of his old mum. I will take a dose right this minute. I brought the bottle. I thought I had. Oh, never mind. It can wait. I feel quite well. I'll get it, John said. Give me your key. She handed it over, and he left. He hadn't acknowledged my presence except by a brusque nod. He's so thoughtful. Jen murmured. What does your son do for a living, Mrs. Tregarth? I asked. Mary gave me an odd look. The question had been somewhat abrupt, but Jen was in no condition to notice nuances, and John was obviously her favorite topic of conversation. Why, my dear, I'm surprised you haven't heard of him, since his line of work is so closely related to yours. I inhaled involuntarily and burst into a fit of coughing. Jen slapped me on the back and went on. He began in a modest way, a little shop in Truro, but his business has expanded at such a rapid rate that he has just opened an establishment in London. I am informed that he is regarded as one of the most reputable authorities in all of England. Don't tell me, I wheezed. Let me guess. Antiques? And works of art, of course. Gasping for breath, I covered my face with my hands. There's plenty of this revolting stuff to go around, said John. Would you care for a nip? I fumbled for a napkin and looked up. He stood over me, one eyebrow elevated, both lips curling. Darling, Mary said reproachfully. It's all right. I just inhaled the wrong way. I wiped my eyes. John handed his mother a bottle filled with a virulent pink liquid. There you go, old girl. Would you care to try one of my cigarettes, Dr. Uh, Bliss, isn't it? Yours appear to be a trifle too strong. By the end of the evening, I had managed to meet most of the other passengers. Jen had been guilty of unkind exaggeration when she described them as senile, but elderly wouldn't have been inaccurate. The majority of them had to be at least seventy. One of the exceptions was Susie Umfenor, 
the bleached blonde from Memphis. Tennessee. I hadn't expected to like her, but I did. Perhaps because she cheerfully admitted that she'd joined the cruise only because it was hideously expensive and very exclusive. All my friends in Memphis were green with envy, she had declared with naive satisfaction. Then you aren't interested in Egyptology? She emitted a fat chuckle and grinned, displaying an expanse of expensively capped teeth. I'm interested in men, honey. Young men. All my husbands were old and boring. I figure now I'm entitled to a little fun. There aren't as many cute guys on this trip as I'd hoped, but some of the Egyptian boys are kind of sweet, don't you think? I agreed that they were, and left Susie closing in on Faisal. By the time I got back to my room, I was tired enough to die, but I knew I was too uptight to sleep, so I went out onto the balcony. The lights of the city glowed like jewels against the dark, diamond white, ruby, and emerald and sapphire. The night breeze was cool, and if it was polluted, there was no if about it, in fact, I didn't notice. The worst was over, I told myself. I hadn't lost my temper or my dignity, and there was no danger of my doing so now. Not when I had him dead to rights, under my thumb and in my power. I had replaced the tiny tape reel in my gold locket, but the old tape was still on the table. It was supposed to be in the little safe under the dressing table. Every suite had such a safe. Not an ordinary lockbox, but a specially designed safe with a specially designed key that couldn't be reproduced by an ordinary locksmith. I'd heard of luxury hotels that provided such a service, but never a cruise ship. However, this was a special ship in every way, and people who were rich enough to take the cruise probably expected such amenities. We'd been warned that if we lost the key, the safe would have to be drilled open, at our expense, since there was only one. In my case, that wasn't true. At least one other person had a key to mine. I was supposed to leave messages in it, and he, she, it, would communicate with me in the same way. Nobody would be entering my room that night. The door was equipped with enough hardware to stop a tank. People were nervous about traveling in Egypt, and this was only one of many additional security precautions our management had provided. My mysterious ally wouldn't open the safe until after I had left the room the following morning. I could leave the tape any time before then. There was nothing on that tape that could be of use to Burkhardt and his pals. John hadn't admitted anything, except that he and I had known one another before. But that conversation might be enough to identify him to other people who knew him only by one of his innumerable aliases. My acquaintance with Sir John Smythe, etc., ad infinitum, was a matter of record in the police departments of at least three countries, and I didn't doubt that Interpol was one of the organizations involved in this investigation. I sat with my elbows on my knees and my chin propped on my hands and tried to think clearly. That mysterious message of Burkhardt's had been rather vague. Maybe his informant had been mistaken. Even hotshot secret agents are mistaken sometimes. Suppose that for once John was on the level. He had a job, a nice, honest job, and a nice little wife. Maybe he had turned over a new leaf. Maybe he was trying to go straight. He must realize that he'd have to find a new profession before arthritis and or the cops caught up with him, and surely he wouldn't involve his mother and his bride in one of his forays into crime. A voice from the not-so-distant past jeered. And if you believe that... You are as innocent as a new-laid egg. So maybe I was. I'd rather be innocent, translation stupid, than vindictive. He had told me once that he loved me. Only once. And I'd badgered him into saying it, at a time when he was too battered and bruised to fight back. I owed him for those bruises, and for a couple of other times when he'd risked his precious hide to get me out of a nasty situation. Perhaps he had meant it at the time. Perhaps 
He only said it to shut me up. If I betrayed him now, I would stand accused, if only by my own conscience, of revenging myself on a man who had wounded my pride and my vanity. My initial protest to Burkhardt was still valid. Even if I identified John as the thief and swindler half the police of Europe were looking for, they couldn't arrest him on my word alone. From what I had heard about the Egyptian security forces, they weren't always too scrupulous about legal formalities. But John was a British subject, protected by the noble code that proclaims a man innocent until proven guilty. I believed in that code, even if it did seem at times to give crooks an unfair advantage. There was no hurry. The tour wouldn't return to Cairo for three weeks. If John did mean to have a shot at the museum, I'd have to turn him in. There was no question about that. But I could afford to wait a little longer. I decided to go to bed. A book I'd brought along on the medieval mosques of Cairo had my eyelids at half-mast before I'd read two pages. At that rate, I'd never become an expert on Islamic art in time to lecture on the subject. Cheer up, Vicky, I told myself. You may not have to. Once they put the handcuffs on your ex-lover, you can pull out. With a clear conscience. The horrors of rising at dawn, an activity I try to avoid, were mitigated by the handsome, dark-skinned youth who tapped at my door less than a minute after the chimes had wakened me. I was in no condition to appreciate him, but I certainly appreciated the tray he carried. After two cups of coffee and a cold shower, I was ready to face the day. I made it to the dining room ten minutes before the tour was to leave. Breakfast was buffet-style. There was still plenty of food on the table, but only a few people lingered in the room. One of them was the German urologist, still hunched over his book. My professional colleagues were gathered in one corner. I deduced that they were waiting for me. As I contemplated the lavish spread, trying to decide what to eat, Faisal rose and joined me. An embarras de riche, is it not? he said giving me a dazzling smile. I don't recommend the eggs benedict. They are a trifle overdone. I'm late, I know, I said. All I want is a roll and... No, no, take your time. Sit down and relax. I will select something for you. I joined my colleagues and we shook hands all around. Foggington Smythe graciously informed me that I could call him Perry and return to his breakfast. Alice Gordon gave me a friendly grin. It's difficult to get used to this schedule, she said. One is tempted to linger in the saloon, but dawn comes all too soon. How nice you look. Very professional. I had tried to control myself with Burkhardt's money, but I hadn't been able to resist the safari outfit. The pants were modestly loose. We'd been warned not to offend Egyptian sensibilities by wearing scanty or skin-tight garments and the jacket had more pockets than a shoe bag. It made me feel like Amelia P. Emerson, but when I saw Alice's calf-length cotton skirt and casual shirt, I realized I'd made a fool of myself. Professional archaeologists didn't dress like that. Not these days, anyhow. I resisted the pith helmet, I said with a sheepish smile. Alice let out a booming laugh. You shouldn't have. Why not enjoy yourself? Faisal returned with a loaded plate. I buttered a croissant and began eating. Perry, I wondered if I would ever be able to call him that, pushed his plate away. Having concluded the primary business of the morning, he was ready to give me his attention. I look forward to your lectures, Dr. Bliss, he said solemnly. I confess I have not read any of your publications. It isn't actually my field, I said. I had known this would happen, and it would have been a waste of time trying to fool these people. I, uh, I cheated a little bit. Perry frowned. In what way? Don't be such a stick, Perry, Alice said easily. I don't know what strings you pulled to be selected for this cruise, but I wasn't exactly forthright either. 
My specialty is New Kingdom literature. There are at least a dozen people who know more about Ptolemaic temples than I do. But I'd have cheerfully murdered all of them to get a chance of living like a millionaire for once in my life. This is a far cry from the Hyde Park Holiday Inn. Faisal laughed. He really was gorgeous. Even white teeth, glinting dark eyes. And he had a sense of humor. A pity one can't claim bribes as legitimate business expenses, isn't it? I always do, I said. Perry looked blank. Really, he began. Time we were off, Faisal said. Forward. He bustled us out. The antisocial reader remained. Alice fell in step with me. I'm sure you were warned about lecturing on sight. You can answer questions, but only licensed Egyptian guides are allowed to lecture. There's very little danger of my breaking that rule, I assured her. She laughed and gave me a friendly pat on the arm. Some of these people don't know the difference between the 19th dynasty and the 19th century. If they back you into a corner, just refer them to me or Perry or Faisal. The passengers had assembled in the lobby. I joined the fringes of the group, which I was sorry to see included the Tregarths. Avoiding them, I found myself standing next to Susie Umfenur. She hailed me like an old friend, and I studied her in consternation. She had ignored the guidelines about dress and was attired in a jumpsuit that clung lovingly to her posterior and bared her arms, shoulders, and cleavage. Don't you have a jacket? I asked. It's on the chair. She gestured carelessly. But I don't see why. You'll get a horrible sunburn, if nothing worse. Faisal said if I didn't wear it, somebody would drag me off behind a pyramid and rape me, Susie said, hopefully. He's such a bully. Faisal overheard, as she had meant him to. Frowning masterfully, he handed Susie her jacket and hat and ushered us down the gangplank. Let's sit together, Susie said, and have some girl talk. I adore men, but sometimes it's a terrible bore having them cluster around. I seldom have that problem. Oh, now, honey, you're just being modest. You know, if you'd spruce yourself up a little bit, you'd be real attractive. We took our places on the bus. By the time we reached the site, my ears were ringing. Susie had made helpful suggestions about my hair. Those little pics you have stuck in your bun are right cute, but you ought to let your hair hang loose instead of pulling it back. My makeup? You ought to wear eyeliner, honey, and a darker color lipstick. And every article of clothing I had on. She had also analyzed with devastating accuracy every man on the boat. Faisal was the sexiest, but that Tregarth man had a certain something. A pity he was newly married. I was determined to dump Susie at the earliest possible moment, but first I made her put on her jacket. A billowing big shirt of gauze so fine it did very little to fend off possible rapists, and her hat a broad-brimmed straw that tied under her chin with a huge bow a la, I suppose she thought, Scarlett O'Hara. Then I fled. We'd been told to stick with the group, but I figured that didn't apply to me, and by that time I didn't give a damn if it did. I don't like listening to lectures. I'd rather wander in happy ignorance. Taking my guidebook from my bag, I headed toward a corner of the enclosure where massive walls of pale limestone towered high above my head. Solitude was impossible to attain. There were a dozen different tour groups present, clustered around their guides like flies on spilled sugar. I fended off a few importunate vendors of souvenirs and services and found a relatively quiet spot and a rock on which to sit. It was still early. Shadows lay cool and gray across the pale sand. The sky was brilliant blue. Rising up against it, soft gold in the sunlight, was the Step Pyramid, the earliest example of monumental stone architecture, over 4,000.
thousand years old. Worn and weathered, simple to the point of crudeness, it had more than sheer age to stir the imagination. There was something right about it, the slope and the proportions, and above all, the setting. One of my beloved medieval cathedrals would have dwindled in that immensity of sky and sand. This was a dream trip, all right, a trip I had hoped to take one day. But I'd have traded the luxurious sweets and the fancy food for an ordinary tourist excursion. How could I concentrate on pyramids and tomb paintings when my stomach was churning and my nerves were twanging like granddad's guitar strings? My eyes kept wandering from the carved lotus columns of the southern colonnade to the people gathered around Faisal. I forced my eyes back to the guidebook and read a long paragraph about the said festival. But if you want to know what it was, you'll have to look it up, because I've forgotten everything except the name. Many of the fallen columns and walls had been restored, with original materials, and there was now enough to indicate how impressive the structure must have been in its prime. The slender, fluted columns and gracefully curved cornices had a classical elegance. I was staring dreamily at them when I saw Jen heading in my direction. I bent my head over the book, hoping she wouldn't join me. I didn't want company, especially hers. For a couple of minutes, I had actually been enjoying myself. She passed fairly close to me, but she didn't stop. Fumbling in her bag, she disappeared from sight behind a low wall. What could she want back there? It was unlike her to wander off alone. She hadn't looked her usual energetic self. Her steps had been slow and dragging. I got to my feet and followed. The space was dark and shadowed. Jen was sitting on the ground, her open bag beside her. Jen? I said uncertainly. Are you? She turned a blank gray face toward me and toppled over onto her side. Chapter 3 I yelled. At its loudest, my voice is the equal of any Wagnerian sopranos, in volume, if in no other quality. My call for help was answered sooner than I had dared hope. Apparently, I hadn't been the only one to observe Jen's sickly look. First on the scene was her devoted son, with Mary close on his heels. Jen had resisted my attempt to lift her, curling herself into a ball with knees raised and arms clasped over her midsection. But when she saw John, she made a gallant effort to smile. Just my silly old dummy, she gasped. Don't worry, darling. I'll be fine in a minute. Her face was now green instead of gray and sticky with perspiration. Mary knelt by her with a little cry of sympathy. Mother Trigar! Get out of my way, John said brusquely. I didn't know whether he meant me or his bride. Mary assumed it was me. As she bent tenderly over Jen, the latter was violently and messily sick. Mary stumbled to her feet and backed off, her face twisted with disgust. John hoisted his mother into his arms and put her down again a few feet away. Contemplating the spots on my brand new outfit, I said, Oh, shit, took a handful of tissues from my pocket and began wiping Jen's face. I do admire a woman with an extensive vocabulary, John said under his breath. Don't just squat there, fetch the doctor. I'll go, Mary said quickly. I'm sorry, darling, I'll, I'll go. When they returned, they were accompanied by several of the other passengers, moved by kindly concern or morbid curiosity. It's not always easy to tell the difference, I admit. I felt fairly sure it was the latter emotion that had moved Susie to join us, but I was willing to give Blankiron the benefit of the doubt. What's wrong? he asked. Jen demonstrated. I had hoped she would throw up on John, but he managed to avoid it, supporting her head and shoulders so she wouldn't choke. 
She kept on heaving, poor thing, although she had obviously got rid of everything in her stomach. I hadn't paid much attention to Dr. Carter when he was introduced the night before, except to hope devoutly I wouldn't require his services. He was a particularly unnoticeable man, middle-aged, middle-sized in both height and girth, with a bland pink face. Just a case of the Pharaoh's curse, he said, with that infuriating blend of condescension and jollity some doctors mistake for a soothing bedside manner. Relax, Mrs. Tregarth. We'll get you back to the boat and... No. John didn't look up. I want her in hospital. The boat has moved on. We're as close or closer to Cairo. Now, son, there's nothing to worry about. This is a common affliction, and the infirmary is... Moving steadily south, among other disadvantages, John said, in his most offensive drawl. My mother is not a young woman, doctor and she has had difficulties of this sort before. Carter started to fuss, and Blankiron murmured, Mr. Tregarth is right, Ben. It would be foolish to take chances. Perhaps the bus can take her to Cairo and then return for us? His voice was soft and hesitant, but when you're rich, you don't have to yell to get your point across. Just what I was about to suggest, Carter exclaimed. Jen was too weak to resist. She looked awful, her closed eyes sunken. Wouldn't an ambulance be better? I said anxiously. Blank iron directed a smile in my general direction. The back seats on the bus fold down into a cot, Vicky. She'll be far more comfortable there, and safely in Cairo by the time we could get an ambulance out here. John scooped his mother up and walked off followed by Mary and Carter. Wow, said Susie, staring. He's stronger than he looks, isn't he? The old lady must weigh a hundred and sixty, and he's practically running. Since I knew exactly what she was thinking, I decided to ignore this. Since Blank Iron did not know, he responded. One can understand his concern, though I'm sure it's unnecessary. Many travelers get some kind of digestive upset. It's nice to see a young man so devoted to his mother, isn't it? He's not so young, I said. Have you known him before? I recollected myself. Blank Iron's question had been casually disinterested, but the gleam of avid curiosity in Susie's eyes warned me that she was the kind who thrives on scandal. No, I said. I don't believe we've met formally, Blank Iron said. First names are easier and friendlier. Mine is Larry. He looked younger and more relaxed in a sweat-stained shirt open at the throat and a pair of wrinkled khaki pants. I noted with sympathetic amusement that he was wearing a pith helmet. The darn things were practical shielding the head and neck from the deadly rays of the sun, and heavy enough to resist the tug of the constant north wind. I believe this is your first visit to Egypt, he went on, looking down at me and offering me his hand. I let him pull me to my feet. He was still looking down at me. Not many people can do that. A part of my mind I try to ignore assessed the breadth of his shoulders and his flat stomach, and decided he wasn't at all bad for a man of fifty-odd. And he was a multi-millionaire. Or a billionaire? What's a few million, more or less? I thought tolerantly. Does everyone on the boat know I'm a fraud? I asked. Now, Vicky, don't call yourself names. You have quite a reputation. I read your article on the Riemenschneider reliquary with great interest. I'm flattered. But I don't know a damn thing about Egyptology, I admitted, with one of my most winning smiles. Would you like me to show you around? I'm only an amateur, but I know Saqqara fairly well. It was one of the most fascinating mornings I've ever spent. Saqqara is a very complicated site. There are several smaller ruined pyramids in addition to the step pyramid, which is surrounded by a maze of subsidiary buildings, temples, and courtyards, 
corridors and chapels. There are underground structures whose function is still unclear, and a lot of private tombs built for high officials. The larger of these mastabas, as they're called, are mazes in themselves. One has 34 separate rooms in the superstructure and a tomb shaft below. I had given the guidebook a hasty perusal the night before and ended up with my head stuffed full of miscellaneous unrelated facts. Larry made sense of it all. You've missed your calling, I said, as we left the temple complex. You ought to be a guide. He looked absurdly pleased at the silly compliment. We were getting on like a house of fire, I thought complacently. No wonder the poor man fled from women like Susie. He must be sick of being relentlessly pursued. All he wanted was to be treated as an intellectual equal, to be admired for his brains instead of his money. I could sympathize with that, though in my case it wasn't money that distracted admirers from my intellectual achievements. It's easier to simplify a complex subject when one is an amateur, he said modestly. Shall we have a look at one of the mastabas before lunch? As an art historian, you're probably familiar with the reliefs. I remember some old kingdom reliefs. They were wonderful, very delicate and detailed. But at this moment, I couldn't tell you which tomb they were from. It was one of a baby hippopotamus. You're probably thinking of Meruruka. Larry took my arm. But some of the other tombs are equally remarkable. We'll see which is least crowded. They were all crowded, at least to the eyes of someone like me, whose definition of too many people is three. But Larry said, Never seen so few people here at this time of year. Tourism is down. People are afraid of terrorists. Nice for us, but unfortunate for the Egyptian economy. I got to see my baby hippopotamus, who was ambling along through the river reeds, apparently unaware of the huge crocodile right on his heels, if hippos have heels. He had no cause for alarm. His devoted mum had grabbed the predator and was in the process of biting it in two. The photographs I'd seen hadn't done the carving justice. To an eye accustomed to Western sculpture, the reliefs had a simplicity that verged on naivete. But the more I studied them, the more I realized that the impression was deceptive. The technique was sure and skilled and highly sophisticated. Only an ignoramus or an observer who was unable to put aside his unconscious prejudices would have undervalued them. Larry absolutely agreed with me and told me how clever I was to have reached that conclusion. We were having a lovely time when I heard shuffling footsteps and a familiar voice. That's Faisal, surely, I said. Larry looked at his watch. He's right on schedule. It's later than I thought. The time has gone very quickly. He gave me a meaningful look. I probably simpered. The first to enter the room was the tall, raw-boned man who had been at Larry's table the night before. He'd been following us at a discreet distance all morning, and he continued to be tactful staring off into space until Larry murmured, I don't believe you two have met. Dr. Victoria Bliss, Ed Whitbread. Morning, ma'am. Ed whipped off his hat, a broad-brimmed white Stetson, and bowed. Despite the stifling heat, he was wearing a jacket. I thought I knew why. He was a good three inches taller than Larry, which made him almost six-five. I sincerely hoped that Larry had convinced him I was a friend. I wouldn't have wanted him to think of me as an enemy. Led by Faisal, the others crowded into the room. Larry faded discreetly away as Susie headed toward me, shoving bodies out of her way with good-natured impetuosity. I wondered where you'd got to, she said. How'd you do that? Do what? You know... She gave me a grin and an elbow in the ribs. It was a surprisingly sharp elbow to belong to a woman so well padded elsewhere. It sure didn't work when I tried it. You'll have to tell me how you... Quiet, please. Faisal clapped his hands like a teacher calling a class to order. We have only fifteen minutes. There is another group waiting. 
the reliefs in this chamber. He was a good lecturer, crisp and witty, and, so far as I could tell, absolutely accurate. I had a hard time concentrating, since Susie kept whispering and nudging me. After a while, Faisal broke off and fixed a stern eye on her. Susie, you are a bad girl. You do not pay attention. Come here and stand by me. Giggling happily, Susie obeyed. Faisal caught my eye and lowered one eyelid in a discreet wink. The sun was high and hot when we left the tomb and set out across the uneven surface of the plateau. Sunlight bleached the sand and rock to a pale buff. Though the distance wasn't great, several of my companions were puffing and complaining by the time we reached our destination. The bus was waiting. I collapsed into a seat with a sigh of relief and accepted a glass of water, tinkling with ice, from a smiling waiter. Not for us, the crowded rest house where ordinary tourists ate and drank, risking not only discomfort but the pharaoh's curse. The seats had attached trays, like those on planes, and we were served chilled wine and food on fine porcelain. Even as I thought how easy it was to accustom oneself to such luxuries, my scholar's conscience reminded me that the exhaust was pouring out pollution that gnawed away the very stones of the pyramids. As soon as everyone was settled, Faisal addressed us. Some of you know that one of our friends was taken ill this morning. You would be glad to hear that Mrs. Tregarth is now comfortably resting in a Cairo hospital. I didn't hear the rest. One word had forced its way through the layers of stupidity that enrobed my brain. Cairo! The Cairo Museum was in Cairo. Take it slow, Vicky, slow and easy. You obviously aren't up to complex reasoning. Right. No question about it. The museum was in Cairo. And now John was, too. Not only was he in Cairo, where the museum was, but his departure had been sudden, unexpected, off schedule. I had told myself I had three more weeks. I should have known, damn it. Damn it, I should have known. That John never stuck to schedules, and that the unexpected was his stock in trade. The mere sight of me would have warned him that someone had got wind of his scheme. He wouldn't abandon it. Not John. Not until he had to. He'd change his plans, catch me off guard, find an excuse to get to the scene of the crime ahead of schedule— a nice, valid excuse, like poisoning his own mother? It seemed a trifle extreme, even for John. All the same. I blundered up out of my seat, squeezing past the tray with its load of china and glasses. Bright and sweet were a few rows ahead of me. I could see Bright's thick, brown, expensive hair over the top of the seat, they beamed a welcome, but I didn't wait for an exchange of greetings. It's a shame about Mrs. Tregarth, isn't it? Very sad, Sweet said cheerfully. But Faisal says she's on the road to recovery. It should be a lesson to us all, you know. The poor dear lady was constantly overeating. That is especially dangerous when one is unaccustomed to strange food and water. Bright nodded vigorously. He probably wouldn't have spoken even if he'd been able to. But in this case, he wasn't. He just shoved an entire stuffed egg into his mouth. Right, I said. I wonder how long they'll stay in Cairo. Where the... I managed to stop myself. Larry, in the seat across the aisle, was watching me with a bewildered smile. Let us hope she will be able to join us again soon, Sweet said. A pity to lose part of such a delightful trip. I tried again, especially when it's also a honeymoon. I suppose her son will stay in Cairo with her? I suppose so. Sweet gave me a puzzled look. I got a grip on myself and turned to go. Well, see you later. We will meet in a pyramid, Sweet called after me. I inserted myself into my seat and picked up a sandwich, 
Nothing plebeian like cheese or chicken, but a masterpiece of shrimp and chopped egg yolk and some mysterious sauce. Sweet and Bright didn't appear to be concerned. In fact, they had both looked at me as if I were losing my feeble mind. Of course, I told myself they were professionals. Like the others, they had heard of Jen's illness. They might not know John was the man they were after, but they'd be on the alert for anything unusual. They probably even knew the Cairo Museum was in Cairo. I can't say I enjoyed the remainder of the tour of Saqqara, even though Faisal was at his most eloquent, and Alice stuck with me most of the afternoon. She was good company, knowledgeable and yet unassuming, with an unexpectedly wicked sense of humor. Watching Susie, who had attached herself to Faisal, she said with a grin, Looks as if she's going to settle for youth and beauty instead of cash. Larry will be relieved. He looked like a cornered rabbit last night. He's a very nice guy, I said. Larry, I mean. Do you know him well? Nobody knows him well. Striding briskly, her hands in her pockets, Alice looked as fresh as a woman half her age. I'd met him once or twice. He's truly dedicated to archaeology and very well informed. But I was surprised to find him on this trip. He's a very private person. Of course, the highlight of the cruise is the reopening of Tete Sherry's tomb, and that has been his major interest for over three years. He's probably hoping to persuade the other filthy rich types on board to support similar projects. She stopped, waiting for the others to catch up, and I said, trying not to pant. He's not with the group this afternoon, trying to avoid predatory females? She caught my meaning. Not you. You made quite a hit. In fact, he sidled up to me and asked me if I thought you'd like to accompany him this afternoon. He's gone off to see the 18th Dynasty nobles' tombs, which aren't open to the public. And you told him I wouldn't? Hell's bells, Alice. How am I going to catch myself a millionaire if you interfere? Alice laughed. Don't blame me. He talked himself out of it before I could reply. Honest to God, I felt like a high school student counselor trying to convince some bashful kid it was okay to ask the cheerleader to a dance. But, she added, with a shrewd glance at me, don't get your hopes up. He likes you because you treated him like a human being but I don't think he's interested in matrimony. Neither am I, sensible woman. Why didn't you go with him? This tourist stuff must be boring for you. My dear, I'm on duty. Anyhow, I never tire of the tourist stuff. I haven't been inside the Teti Pyramid for years. Is that the next stop? I'm getting confused, I admitted. No wonder. We're cramming an awful lot into one day. The brain overloads. You don't have to go inside if you don't want to. I think I won't. Go ahead. I'll sit here and admire the view. All but the most energetic were beginning to flag, after a long morning and a large lunch. Some had stayed on the bus. Others wandered off in search of souvenirs, of which there was no dearth. Only a dozen people expressed an interest in the interior of the pyramid. Among them were bright and sweet, and the large square woman who had been pointed out to me as a famous novelist. No one could have accused her of treading on Egyptian sensibilities. She was draped from shoulders to shins in flowing robes, with a scarf wound wimple style around her large square face. Her features were vaguely familiar, but I couldn't remember where I'd seen them, and I thought I would have remembered that face. Not many famous lady novelists have perceptible mustaches. What's her name? I whispered to Alice. Louisa Ferncliff, but she writes under the name of Valerie Van Dyne. Ever heard of her? I had. I had even, for my sins, read a couple of her novels. She was one of Schmidt's favorite authors. Schmidt only reads two types of fiction— hard-boiled mysteries featuring lean, tough detectives, and torrid historical romances featuring helpless, voluptuous heroines. Violence and sex, in other words. 
I studied the massive form ahead of me with disbelief. The woman must have an incredibly vivid imagination. The sexual gymnastics she described in such interesting detail would have been physically impossible for someone built like that. So that was why she looked familiar. The photographs on the backs of her books had omitted the mustache and the lines scoring her forehead. A couple of chins had been airbrushed out, too. Her heroines are all tall and slim and blonde, I muttered. Alice chuckled. It'll be interesting to see how she gets a tall, slim blonde into a novel about ancient Egypt. She's gathering material for one, I understand. Louisa tilted her head back and inspected the crumbling site of the structure. Where are the pyramid texts? she demanded. Faisal had almost certainly heard dumber questions. He said patiently, Inside the pyramid, Miss Van Dyne. Are you coming? Instead of answering, she turned her back on him and addressed Alice. Are you? I had intended to, yes. In that case, I will accompany you. I want to have some of the texts translated. To hear echo in the air of the tomb chamber, the magical words of protection. Throwing her arms up, she intoned, O oh, gods of the underworld, greet this pharaoh in peace. O oh, heavenly guides, bring down the wrath of Anubis on all who would violate this tomb. That was too much for Faisal. I'm afraid there is no such text, Miss Van Dyne. She looked him up and down and back up again. How would you know? Dr. Gordon is an expert. Not on the pyramid texts, Alice said. Her face was flushed, though not as darkly as Faisal's. She went on very quietly. Faisal's doctoral dissertation involved a comparison of pyramid and coffin texts. He is a graduate of Oxford and the University of Chicago. I believe I won't accompany you after all. The air is rather close inside. After the group had gone in, I said, well done, Alice. Firm, but ladylike. Too ladylike. Alice took off her hat and fanned her hot face. She didn't get it. There are always a few like that in every group. I don't know why I'd bother. Bigotry and rudeness are unconquerable. With his qualifications, why is he working as a guide? Alice shrugged. Jobs are hard to find. I shouldn't have to tell you that. You're right. The memory of how I had wangled my own job made me squirm uncomfortably. Blackmail would be too harsh a word, but... His father is a low-level bureaucrat, Alice went on. Hardly more than a glorified clerk. He has sacrificed all his life so that his son, the only son, could have a professional career. The pressures on Faisal have been enormous, as you can imagine. Yeah. People are pretty much the same everywhere, I guess. In some ways. Alice grinned at me. And very different in other ways. Let's have a look at a few of the other mastabas, shall we? If you like reliefs, some are quite lovely. Or would you rather visit the Serapeum? It's a little distance, but I'm not really all that keen on deep, dark places. I spoke without thinking and after I had done so, I was sorry I had let down my guard, even with someone as friendly as Alice. She didn't pursue the matter, just nodded. By the time Alice had finished showing me around, I'd begun to think more kindly of dark, sunless places. I wasn't the only one who was weary, sweat-stained, and red-faced when we assembled at the bus. The group that had been inside the pyramid looked as bad as I felt. Apparently, they'd enjoyed themselves, though. Sweet rhapsodized about Faisal's lecture, and Bright kept nodding and grinning. I was happy to observe that Louisa's veils were in tatters. Somebody must have stepped on her hem. As I reclined in air-conditioned comfort, sipping my iced drink, I tried to concentrate on the exotic scenery gliding past. The step pyramid, golden in the afternoon light, green fields of alfalfa and vegetables, Barefoot children smiling and waving as we spoiled foreigners passed. 
but my mind was a jumble of disconnected impressions. The step pyramid is 204 feet high. He likes you because you treated him like a human being. Oh, gods of the underworld, greet this pharaoh in peace. The poor woman was constantly overeating. Jen hadn't been faking. Some unpleasant evidences of that still clung to my clothes. Would John really go to that length to carry out his plans? I felt reasonably certain the Cairo Museum was still intact. If he'd laid plans for an event to take place three weeks hence, they couldn't be changed so quickly. Anyhow, I kept telling myself, I had now done my duty as a good little spy. Sweet and bright knew John was the one they were after. I'd been as direct as I dared. They couldn't have misunderstood the message. It was out of my hands now. I hadn't volunteered to defend the museum with six shooters in hand. The first person I saw when I walked up the gangplank was John. He was leaning on the rail, cigarette in hand. Fair hair, becomingly ruffled by the breeze, shirt as fresh and clean as new-fallen snow. He surveyed the dusty, sunburned, limping crowd with kindly condescension. Much better, he called, in response to a question from someone. Faisal, I think. It certainly wasn't from me. I was speechless. No cause for concern, the doctor said. He turned eyes as blue and expressionless as cornflowers on me and added, I felt certain you'd want to know at the earliest possible moment. Whereupon he vanished, leaving me a prey, as Louisa Ferncliff might have written, to a torrent of passionate, conflicting emotions. Chief among them was fury. I plucked Susie out of the group, waiting at the desk for their room keys. You'd better see the doctor about that sunburn, I said abruptly. She looked surprised. Is that bad? It doesn't hurt. Your back is bright red. That was a slight exaggeration, but she was bright pink all over the parts that showed. My forceful personality, or something, prevailed. Susie allowed herself to be towed away. Carter earned his passage. He was on call 24 hours a day, ashore and on land. But the only time when one could count on finding him in the infirmary was after the tours returned, when he would be available to attend to any minor injuries incurred. I hadn't liked the sound of that. However, after seeing the rough terrain and feeling the heat of the sun, I could understand why people might be in need of attention for a variety of minor ailments, ranging from sunstroke to twisted ankles. The infirmary was an impressive setup, spotlessly clean and very well equipped including a locked cabinet that presumably contained drugs. While Carter was inspecting Susie, I asked about Jen. Not a damn thing wrong with her, except overindulgence and a touch of the usual virus, was the irritable reply. Apparently the doctor's amour pop had been seriously ruffled. I could guess by whom. She managed to persuade that officious son of hers to go on with the cruise, which he finally consented to do after inspecting the hospital and interrogating the entire staff. So you all came back together? Yes. If you ask me, Mrs. Tregarth was relieved to be rid of him and looking forward to a few days' peace and quiet. All right, Susie, you're in fine shape, if you'll permit me to say so. Use this ointment tonight and cover up for a few days. So that was that. Unless one of the hospital staff was a stooge of John's, he hadn't had a chance to speak to anyone, I hoped. I hadn't left a message in my safe, but I found one there when I opened it. It was short and succinct. Please report soonest. I screwed up the paper and tossed it into the wastebasket. If Burkhardt wanted to be so damned mysterious and security conscious, he could damn well wait till I was good and ready. Anyhow, I had reported, to sweet and bright. I hadn't realized how tired I was until I got in the shower and let the nice hot water flow over my aching body. It was tension rather than exercise that had stiffened those muscles. I'd been on edge all day. Considerate of John to reassure me at the earliest possible moment. Damn his insolence. 
Dress that evening would probably be informal, I decided, slipping into a cotton skirt and sleeveless shirt. Everyone else would be tired, too. The schedule was really fierce, and tomorrow would be another full day with tours to Maidum and the Fayum. I found myself looking forward to Tuesday, when we were supposed to cruise all day. I hadn't had time to enjoy my little balcony or explore the amenities of the boat, which included a hairdresser, shop, gym, and pool. However, when I arrived at the saloon in time for happy hour, I found the others discussing the change in schedule which had been posted on the bulletin board. Maidum and two other scheduled stops had been postponed till the return trip. We were to sail immediately for Amarna. Most of the group didn't seem to care, but a few were complaining bitterly. The elderly couple from San Francisco, because they were habitual complainers, and Louisa, because she wanted to use Maidum as the setting for her new novel. This will disrupt my writing schedule fatally, she declaimed. I had promised my impatient publisher to have at least 50,000 words written by the time we reach Luxor. But now, how can I begin? My imagination cannot take fire until I have seen those magnificent ruins. I suspected Louisa was thinking of two other ruins. Maidum had never been a city, just a huge cemetery. How could she set an entire novel in a graveyard? Love Among the Mummies? That one had already been done. Seeing my colleagues gathered at a table nearby, I started toward them, figuring they would know the reason for the change in plan. But then I saw Larry beckoning me. He was sitting by himself in the smoking section. Whitbread and the secretary, whatever his name might be, were at another table. We exchanged raves on the activities of the day, and then I asked, Do you know why the change in schedule? It has to do with the water level was the prompt response. This is one of the largest boats on the river. It can't get through the locks at Asyut, which were designed for smaller vessels, if the Nile is low. There won't be a problem going upstream, but I gather there's some concern about the return voyage. We had been left strictly alone until then. Tact? Consideration for Larry's obvious desire for privacy? Or the presence of that tall, formidable figure at a nearby table? Ed was facing us. Though he did it unobtrusively, he never took his eyes off his boss. He hadn't been so visible the night before. Had something happened to increase his concern about Larry's safety? I was considering this and not liking the possibilities that occurred to me when a man approached our table. Tall, fair-haired. My heart did not skip a beat. My heart wouldn't have skipped a beat even if I hadn't recognized Foggington Smythe. May I join you? Without waiting for an answer, he pulled out a chair and planted himself in it. I felt I deserved a respite after spending the entire day answering idiotic questions from people who didn't bother doing basic research. There was a resemblance to John, all right, that air of condescending superiority. John wouldn't have made a stupid remark like that one, though. He had too strong a sense of the ridiculous. They aren't scholars, I said, just tourists having fun. Why should they do any work when they have an expert like you to set them straight on every possible subject? Larry raised a hand to conceal his smile, but Foggington Smythe only nodded gravely. I suppose that's true. Then he turned to Larry, who, I suspected, was the real attraction. Is it true that our schedule has been changed because the authorities learned that terrorists were planning an attack at Maidum tomorrow? Larry's jaw dropped. Where did you hear that? That's the rumor that is going around. To the best of my knowledge, there's no basis for it, Larry said firmly. He glanced at the door of the saloon. At any rate, we're underway now. Why don't you take Vicky out on deck and show her some of the sights? I didn't blame him for wanting to escape from Perry, or even for using me as a decoy. Sounds good to me, I said agreeably. Sure you won't join us? Duty calls, I'm afraid, Larry murmured. This may necessitate an alteration in my plans for the reception and formal opening of the Tetasheri tomb. I'll have to find out what's going on. 
His staff fell in behind him as he made for the door, and Perry led me out. The sun was sinking in a smoky haze. I couldn't see any of the sights Perry pointed out. I don't think he could either. But he indicated their location and went on to tell me all about them. I let the words wash over me. An occasional, really, or how fascinating, was all he wanted anyhow. The view was lovely. Sunset colors stained the rippling water and lights began to twinkle along the shore. Damn, Perry said suddenly. Here comes the bride. He chuckled at his own wit and went on. Pretty little thing, but without a brain in her head. I suppose she wants to ask some fool question. Ah, Mrs. Tregar, if you are in quest of information, perhaps you would be good enough to wait until this evening. I am lecturing on Egyptian literature, but will take questions afterward. It was as rude a put-down as I had ever heard, but Mary met it head on. Smiling, she drawled, How frightfully kind of you. It was Vicky I wanted to talk with, actually. Oh? Oh. Well, then, uh, excuse me. Mary gave me a conspiratorial smile. The breeze whipped her full skirt around her calves and molded her silk blouse to her body. He's the world's most pompous ass, isn't he? I hope I didn't misinterpret your expression of glazed boredom, Vicky. You rushed to my rescue? I inquired. With a graceful gesture, she invited me to walk with her, and we strolled on in silence for a while. Then she stopped, leaning against the rail, and turned to face me. I really did want to speak with you, to thank you for being so kind to Mother Tregarth. I just happened to be there. You did what I ought to have done. Mary's pretty mouth twisted. I'm so squeamish. I can't stand seeing someone I love in pain. I hope you don't think badly of me. I'd like us to be friends. It was not a relationship that held much appeal for me. A ghastly picture formed in my mind, the bride and the groom and the bride's new friend in a cozy trio. I couldn't bring myself to slap her down, though. She had to tilt her head back to look into my eyes, and hers were big and wide and innocent. The pupils were an unusual shade of golden brown. They glowed like amber in the sunset light. I admire women like you so much, she went on. You're so intelligent and so capable, so in control of your life. Not like me. Well, I said, that's very... Inaccurate was the word that came to mind. I substituted a feeble kind. You wouldn't be intruding, Mary went on eagerly. I wouldn't want you to think that. If we'd wanted to be alone together, you wouldn't have joined a cruise like this one. Or invited your mother-in-law to come along, I said, before I could stop myself. Instead of being offended at my candor, Mary laughed. I needn't tell you it was the other way around. Poor darling, she's so devoted to John. She kept sighing and dropping hints about how lonely she'd be. So her doting son had yielded and let her come along? That theory certainly cast a new light on John's character. When he'd spoken of his mother, which wasn't often, it had been with detached, amused exasperation. John is a very private person in many ways, Mary went on, and very reserved. He doesn't make a public show of his feelings. When we're alone... She broke off with an embarrassed laugh. I don't know why I'm saying these things. You have a way of inducing confidences, Vicky. I feel so comfortable with you. That's nice. I didn't trust myself to say more. I hope you don't mind my unburdening myself. I minded. The last thing I wanted was to be the recipient of her confidences about her relationship with John. Had he suggested she approach me? Surely not. It was to his advantage to keep us apart. More likely, she'd pick me as a confidant because I was unattached and closer to her age than the other women on the boat. I had wondered, oh yes, I admit I had, why he'd settled on a half-baked girl barely out of finishing school, 
but it was becoming clearer now. Adoration, that's what he wanted. Unquestioning, dog-like devotion. And money? It was one of his favorite things. And I had already noticed, as what woman wouldn't, that Mary's clothes had not been bought at Marks and Spencer. Not a bit, I said, lying in my teeth. Uh, I've been admiring your earrings. They're excellent reproductions. She accepted this as a tactful, if ungraceful, method of changing the subject. Oh, they aren't copies. Second century B.C., according to John. He gave them to me. Before I could stop her, she'd unfastened one and handed it to me. I was almost afraid to touch it. The miniature head was only three-quarters of an inch high, but every feature had been molded with delicate accuracy. It was a classically Greek face, with the long, unbroken line from the forehead to the end of the nose, but on its brow it wore an ornament that was not Greek, the horns and full moon of the Egyptian goddess Isis. A modern jeweler had added new wires. One wouldn't want to keep bending the ancient gold. It was almost pure, close to 24 carat. Silently, I returned it to her. I'd never seen anything I coveted more. It's nice, isn't it? Casually, she replaced the earring. Gorgeous. He asked if I'd rather have diamonds, Mary said innocently. But I prefer these. He has such wonderful taste. Uh-huh, I said. The enameled golden rose, invisible under my blouse, seemed to burn into my hide. There he is. Mary looked past me. I guess it's time to dress for dinner. I'm so glad we had this talk, Vicky. She didn't ask me to join them. I watched her hurry toward him. He stood, waiting, arms folded, like the emperor preparing to receive a humble subject. And then I turned to go the other way. There was no warning, not even a rush of running feet. He hit me hard and low, hurling me forward. I bounced off the rail with a force that knocked the breath out of me and crashed to the deck, derriere first, the back of my head a close second. Bright specks darted through the blackness like pretty little shooting stars. After a while, I opened my eyes and immediately closed them again when I saw a familiar face hovering over me. Then I opened them again. Not that familiar. It was Foggington Smythe. Good old Perry, I croaked. Good, said good old Perry. You know me. You'd better lie still, though. That was quite a crack on the head. She's not got concussion. John was sitting on the deck next to me. He was rubbing his wrist and scowling like a gargoyle on a cathedral. I think I broke my arm, he went on bitterly. Of course, I said. You were the one who knocked me down. I should have known. I think I broke my arm, John repeated. It was like old times. Me bruised and prostrate, John whining. God damn it, what did you do that for? I demanded. I sat up and then grabbed the back of my head. Ow! Terry put a manly arm around my shoulders and squeezed. Ow! I said again. I'll carry you to the infirmary, Perry announced. No, you won't. I don't have a concussion. I indicated John, who was still nursing his arm. Carry him. I'll take his feet. We can drop him, heavily, several times along the way. The corner of John's mouth twitched, but he said nothing. I saw Mary pressed up against the rail, her hands over her mouth, her eyes wide and horrified. I saw the spattered dirt and fragments of pottery and the broken remains of the jasmine that had been in the pot. It had hit the deck on the exact spot where I would have been standing if someone hadn't knocked me out of the way. Oh, I said. Vicky, don't be angry with him. Mary knelt beside me and put her arm around me from the other side. A pretty tableau we must have made. It was my fault. I saw the flower pot tottering on the edge and cried out. John acted instinctively, as any gentleman would. 
I glowered at John. His eyelids fell, but not in time to hide the fury that had darkened his eyes to sapphire. I wasn't moved to apologize. At that point, I wouldn't have given him credit for good intentions if the testimonial had come from the Pope. Oh, right, I snarled. Thanks a lot. My head hurts worse than it would have done if that little bitty pot had landed on it, and I've got a bruise on my bum the size of a soup tureen. It might have hurt you badly, Vicky, Mary insisted. I staggered to my feet, assisted by Perry. Worse than this? Oh, well, I guess I'll live. Excuse me, I've got to shower and change and find out who tried to brain me. You aren't implying that it was deliberate, I hope, Perry exclaimed. An unfortunate accident, said John. Or a warning. Warning, Perry repeated, staring. To enjoy life to the full while one can, John said sententiously. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. This is a world fraught with peril. One never knows when the axe will fall. Life is at best. Darling, please. Mary abandoned me and hurried to take his arm. Vicky will think you're making fun of her. Oh, she'd never be mistaken about that, John said. Never, I agreed, and let Perry lead me away. Chapter 4 Terrorists, low water, or whatever, the change in schedule couldn't have been more welcome. It would give me a chance to collect my wits and nurse my bruises. I had exaggerated a trifle. The one on my butt was only the size of a salad plate. As I lowered myself very gently into a hot tub filled with bubbles, I tried to look on the bright side. The flower pot wasn't a lethal weapon. Even if it had landed square on the top of my head, it wouldn't have done lasting damage. As John had unnecessarily and condescendingly emphasized, it had been meant as a warning. Not that there were certain individuals on the ship who wanted me off the ship. I'd already known that. Or even that they were willing to use violence to achieve that end. It was a little more subtle. A reminder that I wasn't safe anywhere on the boat that they had access even to my room. That was where I'd been standing when the pot fell, under my own balcony. Too damn many people had access to my room. I let my toes float up to the surface of the water and studied them pensively, remembering the agitated faces of the staff members who had been interrogated. Perry had insisted I report the incident immediately, and Hamid the purser had hauled the obvious suspects into his office. Hamid was in charge of the domestic arrangements on the boat, the civilian equivalent of the captain. A slim, handsome man of indeterminate age, he radiated an air of calm competence. I had already wondered if he might be Burkhart's mysterious agent. He had keys to all the rooms, and a perfect excuse to enter them. He could always claim he was checking up on his staff. If he was in disguise, the disguise was excellent. In his crisp, tailored uniform, his hair graying attractively at the temples, he was the perfect model of an efficient hotel manager. And, I reminded myself, he wasn't the only one who had a key to my room. Until that moment, I hadn't realized how many stewards there were. One replenished the liquor cabinet. He was a copt, since handling alcoholic beverages might have offended Muslim sensibilities. Another picked up and delivered laundry. A third cleaned and changed the beds. Hamid lined them up in a cringing row and questioned them in vehement Arabic. They protested their innocence volubly and passionately. The most obvious suspect was a kid named Ali, who was responsible for the overall cleaning, including the care of the flowers. He looked no more than eighteen, a graceful, smiling boy with the thick, dark lashes many Egyptians have. He denied everything. Yes, he had watered the flowers and clipped the dead blooms. Everything had been in perfect order when he left the room. He'd made certain to replace the pot securely in the stand. He wrung his hands. Then he started to cry. 
That was when I put an end to the proceedings. They were a waste of time, and I can't stand masculine tears. Ali cried even harder when I said I didn't blame him. Hamid and Perry went with me to my room. As I had begun to suspect, there was nothing wrong with the flowers on my balcony. Every pot was still in place and firmly anchored. The most logical explanation, proposed by a visibly relieved Hamid, was that one of the passengers in an adjoining room had been fooling around with the flowers. He would investigate, of course. I said fine and got rid of him and Perry. He wouldn't investigate very hard, not with this lot of passengers, and I knew perfectly well that the pot had fallen from my balcony, even if it hadn't originated there. I blew bubbles off my hand and decided I had better start looking for some more crooks. The sight of John had thrown me off balance and distracted me, but he obviously wasn't the only malefactor on board. I had suspected that before. The flowerpot incident proved it. I had a perfect opportunity to investigate. Since this was like one of those old-fashioned English country house murder mysteries, all the suspects gathered together, isolated from the outside world, I would interview all of them, including the ones I hadn't had a chance to talk with. I would mingle and be charming and very, very clever and very, very careful. Aside from the other distractions, such as wondering who was going to hit me next and with what, my luxury cruise developed another hitch. Mary wanted John and me to make up. She began her campaign that night, leaving her chair and running to greet me when I entered the dining room. We saved a place for you, Vicky. You'll join us, won't you? Short of knocking her down and walking over her, there was no way I could get away from the little hands that clung to my arm and towed me with remorseless goodwill toward a table. John was on his feet, waiting. No one had dressed for dinner that night, but even his casual clothes looked as if they'd come from Savile Row. A white polo shirt with a discreet insignia on the breast pocket, the creases in his slack so sharp they could cut you. He looked me over, from my cheap sandals to the imitation Hermès scarf, tying my hair back, and then focused pointedly on my throat, where the locket hung from its heavy chain. How kind of you to honor us, Dr. Bliss. You don't appear to be limping. I hope that means the bruise you mentioned was not too extensive. He gave my chair a shove as I lowered myself into it. I'd expected something of the sort, so I was able to catch myself before the edge of the table rammed me in the stomach. And your poor wrist, I said. Not a thing wrong with it, I see. It went on that way through five courses. John was as smoothly offensive as only he could be. His voice, the exaggerated drawl I particularly hated. His conversation studded with stinging barbs. I thought Mary missed most of the double entendres, but when John commented on my locket, so large and so very gold, she flushed and said quickly, Now, oh, darling, not everyone shares your tastes. Antique jewelry is one of his specialties she explained to me. Oh, is it? I said. She was still wearing the Greek earrings. They glowed with a soft patina under the lights, and the tiny, exquisite faces had the same expression of aloof disdain that marked John's features. Isis, he said, following my gaze, or reading my mind, which wasn't hard to do under the circumstances. Though she was an Egyptian goddess, her cult was quite popular in Greece during the Hellenistic period, 300 to 30 B.C. Thank you so very much for telling me. I propped my chin on my hand and smiled sweetly at him. They're lovely. Where on earth do you pick up such things? Here and there, John said, smiling not so sweetly back. I found that pair at an antiquarian jeweler's in New York. You may know of the shop. It's on Madison in the 70s. Straight to the liver, that one. I did know of the shop. My golden rose had come from the same place. I made one feeble attempt at criminal investigation during the meal, questioning them in guileless girlish curiosity about the other passengers. It wasn't very successful. John knew perfectly well what I was up to. Smiling and suave, he gushed useless information. 
Mary was more helpful. She had already struck up acquaintances with most of the passengers. The Johnsons are from San Francisco, she said, nodding toward the elderly couple I'd seen with Jen the first night on board. He has something to do with the stock market. He's the dullest individual on board, John said, with the possible exception of his wife. His hobby, if you can believe it, is miniature railroads. And so it went, with Mary identifying people and John making rude remarks about each and every one. When we retired to the lounge for coffee, I excused myself and went out on deck for a cigarette. John didn't join me. However, I had a nice chat with Mr. Johnson, who smoked cigars. He was even more boring than John had claimed. Luckily, Alice joined us before he could tell me more about H.O. or H.Q. or whatever. She'd heard about my accident and was full of questions. Dirty things, flowers, Johnson declared. Why not imitations? That's what I say. Wife likes the damn things, though. A voice from the saloon suggested that the evening lecture was about to begin, so we went inside. The assistant purser was on the podium, making the official announcement of what everyone already knew, and promising us varied forms of amusement to make up for the change in schedule. One of the passengers, a distinguished amateur ornithologist, had offered to talk to us about birds, and Dr. Foggington Smythe would give an additional lecture on Egyptian religion. In three days' time, there would be a grand Egyptian banquet and cabaret at which passengers and crew would entertain. Prizes would be given for the best costumes. If we hadn't already purchased Egyptian garb in Cairo, the staff would be glad to help us concoct an appropriate costume. Or we could visit the excellent shop of Mr. Azad, who rose and smiled ingratiatingly to select from his stock of clothing. Sounds like fun. I said to Alice, who had signaled one of the waiters. Chacun a son goût, said Alice enigmatically. You want coffee? I strongly recommend it. Perry's lectures are as effective as a couple of Valiums. I was glad I'd taken her advice. Perry went droning on about Isis and Osiris and Mut and a lot of other people with improbable names. When he started discussing the differences between pantheism, monotheism, and henotheism, my head began to droop. I was saved from shame by Alice, who kept pinching me. There weren't many questions. Nobody wanted to get him started again. The crew hauled away the screen and podium, and our dance band, a grand total of four, ambled in. Perry asked me to dance but I was able to use my bruises as an excuse for refusing. As I hobbled toward the door, I saw the Johnsons solemnly gyrating. He was holding her at arm's length and moving about as fast as a sluggish snail. The newlyweds were not dancing. I had breakfast in my room next morning. From what I'd heard, room service was not usual on tour boats, but Ollie was now my best friend in the whole world and would, he earnestly assured me, lay down his life for me any time I wanted. I told him I'd settle for a couple of boiled eggs and coffee. He was back in record time with an array of food that looked like samples of the entire breakfast menu. I had to push him out the door. Then I took food, coffee, and a pad and pencil out onto the balcony. The views were pastoral, Green fields, water buffalo knee-deep in the shallows, black-garbed women washing clothes and keeping a watchful eye on the children in their bright, brief garments. I waved back at a group of kids who were lined up along the bank, waving and calling. I didn't want to think about crime. Why the hell should I? I'd done what I was supposed to do, all I was supposed to do. Maybe the flower pot had been an unfortunate accident— Maybe John didn't have a Confederate on board. Even if both those comfortable assumptions were wrong, there was no reason to suppose I would recognize any of his henchmen. I'd met more crooks than I would have liked, but one is more than I would have liked. I made a list. Some of the names on that list were out of the picture, dead or in jail. 
The people in Rome who'd been happily selling fake jewelry until I so rudely interrupted them were neither of the above. They had pinned the blame on that caper on John, and were still leading La Dolce Vita, which just goes to prove that crime often does pay, and that justice frequently doesn't triumph. However, that had been a purely local operation run by amateurs. It was most unlikely that they had extended their activities abroad. The group I'd encountered in Sweden were another kettle of fish. They were all professionals and cold-blooded as sharks. Big, stupid Hans, who wasn't really bad, just awfully good at obeying orders. Rudy, who was built like a ferret and had the same mindset. Kill things, kill lots of things. Max, who cut silhouettes as a relaxing hobby after a day of bumping people off. And their boss, Leaf, the man who'd been slashing at me with a long, sharp knife before John removed him forcibly from my vicinity. No doubt about Leaf's death. I had identified the body. I had a couple of Max's silhouettes, souvenirs presented to me by the artist himself. Mine had been fashioned of the traditional black paper, and very fine likenesses they were. Occasionally, Max used red paper for a particular collection. He was a soft-spoken, harmless-looking little man, and he'd always been very pleasant to me, up to and including the moment when I waved bye-bye to him just before they carted him off to the Hoosgau. He'd even... Well, he hadn't actually thanked me for helping to get rid of his boss, not in so many words, but he had implied that Leif's death opened up new and interesting possibilities of advancement for him. If I can ever do you a favor, Dr. Bliss, he had said. I had never met anybody who scared me more than Max. I hoped and believed he was still in prison. But in any case, Max wouldn't have collaborated with John if John had been the only other crook on earth. The antipathy was personal as well as professional. Max had absolutely no sense of humor, and John drove him up the wall, even when John wasn't trying to. And he often was trying to. The Trojan Gold Affair. I could forget about that one. All the villains were dead. Very, very unmistakably dead. Including the head villain, who had fallen fifty feet onto a pile of rocks. John had been indirectly responsible for his demise which had occurred in the course of one of John's nerve-wracking, impromptu rescues. For the first time, I found myself wondering how John had felt about killing those two men. Neither had been deliberate, premeditated murders. He could reasonably claim self-defense or maybe justifiable homicide. But he had always insisted he disliked violence, even when it wasn't directed at him. Did he ever have bad dreams? I shifted uncomfortably and then tore the list into a heap of unreadable scraps. John's confederate couldn't be anyone I knew, so it must be someone I didn't know. Brilliant deduction, Vicky. I turned my attention to the passenger list. I could now attach faces and personalities to most of the names. There were only thirty names in all. Twenty-nine, now that Jen had left. I started to cross her name out and then stopped myself. She might not be on the boat, but she was not out of the picture. Difficult as it was to imagine her as a criminal mastermind, I couldn't dismiss the odd coincidence that had left her on the loose in Cairo. After considerable thought, I eliminated 16 people. I wasn't credulous or prejudiced enough to think that old age put a person above or below suspicion— but a minimal degree of physical agility is one necessary qualification for a master thief. At least, I'd have insisted on it if I'd been hiring one. And a round dozen of the passengers had to be in their seventies or older. I also eliminated Louisa. Her name was a permanent fixture on the bestseller lists, so she didn't have to turn to crime to make a living. And she was unquestionably the real Louisa Ferncliff. The picture that adorned all her book jackets had been retouched, but it was recognizable. Sweet and Bright were two of the good guys. 
So who was left? Blank Iron was too rich and too famous to be a suspect. But I hadn't eliminated his bodyguard or his secretary. I'd have to find out how long they'd been in his employ. That was the sort of setup John specialized in, forging impressive credentials to gain access to a person or a place. Susie? She was a little too good to be true. I was unacquainted with the social elite of Memphis, Tennessee. She could be a ringer. The unsociable German was another possibility. Somehow I'd have to get to know him better. Mary and John made 21. That left eight people I hadn't spoken with except to exchange names and casual good mornings. I was inclined to eliminate them, too. They were all members of an amateur archaeology organization from Dallas, and they were traveling together. They were also rich and not exactly spring chickens. How about the staff? Alice and Perry were who they claimed to be. They knew one another, and they were known to others, including Blankiron. Could either be corrupted? In theory, yes. In theory, Faisal was also corruptible. Or he could be in league with one of the fundamentalist groups who wanted to rid Egypt of foreign influence. Promoting a scheme that would arouse public indignation, riot, and insurrection was the sort of thing fanatics might do. I seemed to be long on hypothetical motives and very, very short on actual clues, and all too well supplied with possible suspects. John's ally, or allies, might be one of the housekeeping staff, or one of the crew. There was no way I could question them. The hell with it. I got dressed and went up to the lounge to hear the lecture on birds. It would be a pleasure to hear about pretty, harmless things like birds. Bugs. That was what birds ate. Nothing wrong with killing bugs. I'd forgotten about owls. They eat a lot of things, including cute little mice and an occasional unwary kitten. There was an unexpected bonus, though. The lecturer turned out to be the unsociable German gent, and he certainly knew a lot about birds. If he wasn't a genuine enthusiast, he gave a good imitation of one. He talked about the creatures the way another man might talk about his mistress. Long, slim legs were mentioned, and delicate flushes of pink. Some birds, he was sorry to report, were rather secretive in their habits. He'd even brought a collection of slides, all two hundred of which he showed us. Oh, well, maybe it wasn't two hundred. It seemed like more. A passion for birding would account for his presence on board. However, it did occur to me that it's easier to bone up on Egyptian ornithology than Egyptology, or, as I knew to my sorrow, Islamic art. A clever man could learn enough about it in a few weeks to convince non-experts that he was one. When questions were invited, I asked a lot. They were all stupid questions, the only kind I was capable of asking about that subject. He answered glibly and with assurance, if that proved anything. Unfortunately, he decided my interest was so intense and my ignorance so abysmal that I deserved special coaching, and I didn't manage to shake him off until after lunch, by which time I knew more about the nesting habits of widgeons than I wanted to know, and I still wasn't sure whether he was on the level or not. The sound of music struck my ears when I got off the elevator. Someone was playing the piano, and playing quite well. It was a stormy, violent piece of music, Chopin's revolutionary étude. He had his back to me, and the music covered the sound of my footsteps. I couldn't resist. I moved close and spoke. How nice. You're playing our song. His hands came down on the keyboard with a crash, and he bent his head. I couldn't see his face, but his ear was bright crimson. After a moment, he said under his breath, Don't do that. Where's your dear little wife? I inquired. He looked directly at me. His face was still flushed, and his expression was so savage, I stepped back. Drop it, Vicky. Leave me alone. There were a number of other people in the saloon, including an elderly couple from Hamburg, Susie Umfenor, and Sweet and Bright, their heads bent over a chessboard. Recovering, I said softly, You don't have to be so rude. Or do you? Several heads turned in our direction. 
John's hands went back to the keyboard, covering his next words with a series of emphatic but rather ragged arpeggios. Apparently I must. Subtle hints are wasted on you. Excuse me. He stopped playing and rose. I took the hint. As I walked away, I heard a spatter of applause, and the Frau from Hamburg called out in English, Beautiful! Will you be performing for us at the cabaret? John answered in German, Vielen Dank, gnädige Frau, aber nein. In the same language, pitched so I could hear, he added, I try never to perform in public. The phone woke me at the unholy hour of 6 a.m. next morning. It was my wake-up call. I grunted an acknowledgment into the phone and reached out a languid hand for the button that would summon my room steward. I was going to miss this kind of service when I got home and was wakened at about the same hour by Clara sitting on my face and Caesar licking any part of me he could reach. Neither of them would bring me coffee. The response was slower than usual, and when I answered the tactful tap at the door, it wasn't Ali. This man was darker-skinned and older, and not so pretty. Madame wishes breakfast, he inquired. Where's Ali? The fellow's eyes shifted. I am here instead, madame. Mahmoud is my name. What is it the lady wishes? I didn't pursue the matter. Maybe it was Ali's day off. I'd just finished showering when Mahmoud came back. Slinging on my robe, I told him to take the tray onto the balcony. The boat rocked gently at its moorings. We had reached El Til, as promised, and at 7.15 would disembark to visit the site of Amarna. My room faced west, so all I could see was the river and the opposite bank. It was a beautiful morning, as usual. I wouldn't need a jacket today. Already the breeze felt warm. When we assembled in the lobby, Faisal began shouting directions. He seemed a little on edge that morning and reminded us twice, rather sharply, that we were to stay with the group and not wander off alone. That doesn't apply to me, of course, said Perry, edging up to me. If there's anything particular you want to see, it sounds to me as if the regular tour covers as much as I want to see. And that was the truth. It was going to be a long, hot, tiring day. We were to spend the morning visiting part of the ruins of the city and a few of the nobles' tombs. We would then return to the boat for an early lunch, and the weaker vessels would stay on board while the enthusiasts returned for a visit to the royal tomb in its remote wadi, and if time permitted, a few more nobles' tombs. I had a feeling that by lunchtime I would be tempted to join the weaker vessels. I'd read about Amarna, and Perry's lecture the previous evening had brought my memories into sharper focus. The site is a great empty plain, shaped like a half moon, with the river forming the straight side and the cliffs of the high desert forming the curve. Amarna had been the capital city of the heretic king Akhenaten. He was one of the most interesting and enigmatic of ancient rulers. I had seen dignified scholars turn purple in the face and threaten to punch one another out when they got to arguing about whether Akhenaten was a monotheist or a pacifist or an idealist or a crazy religious fanatic or a disgusting prevert. The artistic conventions of the period intrigued me. But the best examples of the painting and sculpture were elsewhere in museums and private collections, since the site had been thoroughly vandalized in ancient and modern times. I wasn't looking forward to enjoying Perry's company all day, especially when we visited the city ruins. I knew what it would be like, since I've seen a number of archaeological sites, boring mud-brick walls, some as low as foundations, some as high as my head, in a confusing maze. The guide would say things like, and this was the great reception hall, and we'd all gape at a square of dirt bounded by more of the bare brick walls, and then he'd go on for hours pointing out things that had once been there but weren't there now. Faisal interrupted my thoughts with a sharp, Vicky, please don't dawdle, and I trotted obediently after him. Perry trotted after me. Has he got a hangover or what? I whispered. 
He doesn't drink, Perry said. Muslims don't. I was joking. What's bugging him? We are in Middle Egypt now, Perry said soberly. This is the area where terrorist attacks have been most frequent. But every precaution has been taken. They sure had. The first thing I saw when I stepped out onto the gangplank was a truck full of soldiers. An armed escort? I exclaimed. If anything happened to a member of this group, they'd be held to pay, Perry said. Ignore them and be thankful they're here. I tried to follow his advice. The view was rather wonderful, unless you were of this school that insists on things like trees and flowers and grass and babbling brooks. It was a beauty of line and subtle shadings of color, shadows that deepened from violet to blue-black, rugged rock walls turning from golden pink to paler silver as the sunlight strengthened. I wasn't awfully taken by our means of transport, a tractor pulling an open metal trailer with rows of benches, but I didn't suggest walking, not with those grim-faced guys in uniform watching me. The trailer proved to be just as uncomfortable as I'd expected. I held on to the edge of the bench as we bumped along over a track that was barely distinguishable from the surrounding desert. I'd managed to escape Perry, but when Sweet offered me a seat next to him, and I hardly need say, bright, there was no way I could refuse without rudeness. John obligingly shifted over to give me plenty of room. He also gave me a smile, that indicated he was well aware I would have preferred another place. I haven't seen much of you lately, I said, turning my back on him and favoring Sweet with my most seductive smile. We were shy, said Sweet, giggling. You are so popular, Vicky. With all the handsome young men following you, we thought you wouldn't want to associate with two old bores like us. Bright grinned and nodded. Could he talk? Maybe he had some painfully embarrassing speech defect, a bad stutter or a lisp. We exchanged a few coy jokes about their good looks and my irresistible appeal, and then I said, I haven't seen Larry this morning. Did he stay on board? My dear, he was first off the boat. He has a schoolboy crush on Nefertiti, said John. I would have ignored this, but Sweet leaned forward, including John, in the conversation. I thought Ted Sherry was his dream girl. And Nefertari and T and all the other beautiful romantic queens of Egypt. He has succumbed to the legends and the portraits, all of which, one may reasonably assume, bore only a distant resemblance to their subjects. Sweet nodded sympathetically. It isn't difficult to understand why a shy, sensitive man, a lover of beauty and of art, would prefer a dream to reality. Or why a man might prefer a woman who's been dead for 4,000 years to certain of the living specimens, said John. Why, John, how cynical, Sweet exclaimed. Mary had heard. Her lips tightened and color darkened her cheeks. The trailer stopped and we climbed out. A hot breeze whipped the ends of my scarf across my face. We were at the foot of the cliffs. High above, I could see the entrances to the tombs. Once visitors had had to scramble up the steep, dangerous slope at the base of the rocks, but the need for tourist dollars and pounds, marks, and yen had prompted the building of easier paths and several flights of steps. Straight ahead, the trek began with a flight of long, shallow stairs. Some of our party had already started up. Perched on one of the steps was a figure wearing a pair of enormous sunglasses and the biggest, snowiest pith helmet I had ever beheld. He was surrounded by a pride of mewing cats, and he was feeding them scraps which he took from the innumerable pockets of his khaki jacket. His comments, addressed to the cats, came to my ears like the tolling of a funeral bell. Do not push, it is rude. There is plenty for all. Oh, you are a bad moody. Let's the little ones eat first. Behind me, a voice said hollowly, I don't deserve this. Admittedly, I've not led a wholly exemplary life, but no one deserves this.
even Jack the Ripper or Attila the Hun. My sentiments exactly. I couldn't say so because my vocal cords were paralyzed. Please, God, I thought, let me be suffering from sunstroke or schizophrenia or something harmless like that. Schmidt looked up. His bushy white mustache flapped, and his cute little pink mouth opened in a broad grin. Excuse me, John said, shoving me aside. He set off with that deceptively leisurely stride that could cover ground faster than a run. Intent on me, Schmidt didn't notice him at first. When he did, a look of rapture spread over his face. John reached him before he could bellow out a greeting and bend over him. Isn't that adorable? The speaker was Mary. I had recovered enough to turn my head. Adorable, I repeated, in the same doom-ridden voice John had employed. That dear old gentleman feeding the cats. Mary slipped her arm in mine. I should have thought of bringing some scraps. All the animals here are so neglected, so hungry. She let out a fond little laugh. Her eyes were shining as she looked at John, who had seated himself on the step next to Schmidt. John was doing the talking. Schmidt listened, open-mouthed. John is so tender-hearted, Mary went on. He loves cats. That was news to me. John certainly didn't love Clara, who had disliked him on sight. She was an astute judge of character. The cute little pussycats had given him an excuse to have a private and vital conversation with Schmidt, though. By the time we reached my boss, John had gone on ahead, and Schmidt had finished serving breakfast to the pride. He heaved himself to his feet and let out the shriek the sight of John had aborted. Vicky, Chris Scott, good morning, hello. I am so glad to see you. What are you doing here, Schmidt? I inquired. My voice was very calm. It was fate, no less. I will tell you all about it later. Schmidt glanced at Mary and then back at me. His grin faded and he blinked rapidly. John must have told him. He'd have had to in order to forestall any embarrassing references to former acquaintanceships. I wish to God I knew what other confidences had passed between the two. I introduced Mary. Schmidt didn't say much. He was very gallant with her, though, studying her pretty face intently. They were almost the same height. She excused herself, saying that her husband was waiting for her. He hadn't waited. He was already some distance ahead. She hurried after him. My poor dear Vicky, Schmidt said gently. He took off his sunglasses and wiped his eyes. Do not allow evil to enter your heart, my child. What the hell are you talking about, Schmidt? You are not in despair? Schmidt peered up into my face from under the brim of his hat. Well, perhaps you are not. A woman with so many lovers as you... Shut up, Schmidt, I said. Schmidt paid no attention. He'd heard me say that so often. The words just washed past his ears. And it is not to be expected that all your lovers would remain faithful when you do nothing to encourage them and are, in fact, often very rude to them. Nein, nein, do not deny it. I have seen it myself. I only hope that Sir John did not marry this poor child on the rebounds, for that would not be fair to her. She seems a charming young lady. Schmidt. He waited expectantly, but I couldn't think what to say. It was probably safer to say nothing at all, until I'd had a chance to find out what pack of lies John had told Schmidt. So I finished lamely. I don't want to talk about it. This is not perhaps the best place for an intimate conversation, Schmidt agreed. Faisal was bearing down, or up, on us, shepherding the last and slowest of the group, a very elderly English lady whose physical strength didn't equal her zest for living. Gallant as always, Schmidt whipped off his pith helmet and bowed from the approximate region of the waist. 
That part of him doesn't bend easily. I introduced them, and Faisal nodded. Yes, Herr Dr. Schmidt. We were told you would be joining us here. Willkommen. But how well you speak German, Schmidt exclaimed. You are our guide, my friend. Excellent. I have many questions. You can tell me. It would be better, Dr. Schmidt, if you waited until we reached the tombs. The others are already far ahead. My fault, I'm afraid. Mrs. Blessington, she told me to call her Anna, but I couldn't manage it yet, said cheerfully. You young things are most kind to put up with my infirmities. Her smile included Schmidt, who puffed up to twice normal size and exclaimed, I will carry you. Yes, yes, it will be a pleasure. An excuse to hold a beautiful woman in my arms. He'd have tried it, too. I looked meaningfully at Faisal, who said quickly, No, no, Herr Schmidt, that is not fair. I saw her first. Anna, if you will allow me. Laughing, she allowed him. She couldn't have weighed much. She was all bones and skin and gumption. Even so, the ease with which Faisal mounted the stairs was an impressive demonstration of muscle. Schmidt trotted alongside, offering to take over whenever Faisal tired. They seemed to be having a very good time, so I said, I'll just run on ahead, and did so. It was a long climb, upstairs and along winding paths, and the interval gave me time to think. The only positive aspect of the disaster of Schmidt was that in this, at least, John and I were on the same side. He didn't want Schmidt involved any more than I did. On an earlier occasion, John had somehow managed to convince Schmidt that he was an undercover agent of some variety, even though Schmidt was well aware that John had been trying to pull off an illegal deal involving antique jewelry when I first encountered him. John and Schmidt were perfectly matched. One, the world's most accomplished teller of tall tales. The other, happy to believe any lie so long as it was romantic. John wouldn't dare tell Schmidt he was on another secret mission this time. But Schmidt wasn't stupid, even if he was romantic. How could I or John possibly explain how we happened to turn up on the same cruise? Coincidences happen. This was a pretty hard coincidence to swallow. But John might have been desperate enough to insist on it. He'd only had about ten seconds to come up with a story that would convince Schmidt we weren't engaged in some dangerous, exciting bit of undercover work in which Schmidt would, of course, want to participate. Then another explanation occurred to me, and a cold chill froze the sweat on my heated body. I had read a mystery novel once, one of Agatha Christie's, I think, in which the abandoned fiancé, intent on revenge, follows her faithless lover and his new bride on their honeymoon. A Nile cruise, by another of those strange coincidences. Schmidt had undoubtedly read that book or seen the film. He loved thrillers. The chilly sweat congealed as I remembered what Schmidt had said. Something about letting evil enter my heart. John must know that story, too. If he had dared imply to Schmidt that I had pursued him and Mary out of jealousy, I would not only kill him, I would dismember him and strew pieces of his admirable anatomy all over the boat. Mary could try putting him back together, like Isis with Osiris. Schmidt would fall for it, too. If he couldn't be James Bond, he would settle for Hercule Poirot. Maybe. The fact that for a few seconds I actually considered encouraging Schmidt to believe that fantasy as the lesser of two evils should be sufficient indication of how dangerous the little imp was. There you are. I glared wildly at the tall, blonde individual who had taken my arm. It was Perry. Peering into my face, he went on. You look a bit done up, Vicky. The climate can be difficult if you aren't used to it. I looked around. I had reached the top of the path where a ledge stretched along the cliff face. The tombs opened onto it. Several of our group were standing around, fanning themselves with their hats. 
From a nearby tomb, whose metal gate stood open, came the sound of a voice lecturing. One of the local guides, I assumed. You don't want to join the tourist types, Perry said condescendingly. Let me give you a private personal tour. The robed and turbaned custodian of the keys flapped toward us and unlocked another gate. I let Perry lead me inside. There is some excuse for me, I think, if I wondered whether he had an ulterior motive for wanting to get me alone. If he did, he had no opportunity to act upon it. Schmidt was hot on my trail. I started to introduce them, but Schmidt interrupted me. I know this gentleman. Have I not told you, Vicky, that I never forget a face? It was at a symposium on Egyptian art five years ago in Rome. He spoke on Amarna portraiture. Grüß Gott, Dr. Foggington Smythe. You may remember me. Schmidt is my name. I remember you very well, Herr Director, Perry said coldly. You took up the entire question period, disagreeing with every point I made. Schmidt chuckled. Yes, it was a very friendly professional discussion. I look forward to continuing it. He did continue it. Before long, Perry excused himself and fled. I may have been prejudiced, but I enjoyed Schmidt's commentary a lot more than I had Perry's. For one thing, Schmidt isn't afraid of expressing his emotional reactions. Some of the details, a group of blind musicians, a pair of vibrant, prancing horses, moved him so much he actually stopped talking which was more than Perry had done. After we'd seen the tombs, we all gathered around Faisal and one of his flunkies for a spot of refreshment. Drinking lots of liquids was a necessity in that climate. Dehydration had felled a number of ignorant tourists. As I had come to expect from galactic tours, we were offered a variety of beverages, as well as water, plus cookies and biscuits. Schmidt was so happy. Friends antiquities, and now food. He'd been crooning to himself, and after we'd collected our lemonade and cookies, he burst into song. It's easier to let Schmidt sing than try to talk him out of singing. So I gritted my teeth and let him go on. Frankie und Johnny fahren Liebende, he bellowed. Mein Gott, wie verstanden sie sich auf die Liebe. Several of the more nervous passengers jumped spasmodically, and John, standing nearby, actually reeled back a few steps. Schmidt took his pained stare for fascinated interest. It is old American folk music, he explained. The Gnädige Frau from Hamburg has told me what a fine musician you are, S Herr Tregard. No doubt you are familiar with that song. John shook his head. For once, he appeared to be incapable of speech. Oh, but it is very well known. In English, it goes, Frankie und Johnny for Luffers. Oh, Lordy. Ah, yes, John blinked. It is a most interesting variety of music, Schmidt explained. Songs of the country and of the Wild West, blues and bluegrass, these are not the same, you understand. They have different roots. Bluegrass, John repeated blankly. Many are deeply and touchingly full of religion. Have you heard the one about the crash on the highway, when whiskey and blood mix together? John edged closer. I'd seen the same look on the face of a cat when a small, energetic child cornered it. Horrified disbelief mingled with unwilling curiosity. Fascinating. Tell me more, Herr Schmidt. I went quickly away. Not quickly enough, alas, to miss the next verse. Eventually, we retraced our steps to the waiting trailer, which was to take us to the next stop, the ruins of the northern city. Schmidt caught up with me there, and Perry, who'd been edging toward me, veered away. Faisal, counting heads, called to the stragglers to hurry up and urged the rest of us to take our places. Schmidt gave me a hand up, which I accepted, 
and then turned to Mary. She was alone for once, and her anxious gaze was fixed on the upward path. So, he is slow, Schmidt said pleasantly. All the better for me. You will allow me to assist you into the seat. I didn't see him. She shielded her eyes with her hand, ignoring the one Schmidt had offered. Faisal turned. He decided to walk. It isn't far. He'll be there soon after us. Get in, please. We only have forty-five minutes at the site. Forty-five minutes was long enough for me, and even Schmidt wandered off after a while. I caught sight of him talking to a man who appeared to be an archaeologist. He was dressed sloppily enough, working in one of the areas blocked off to tourists. I didn't see John, not that I was looking for him, until we were almost ready to leave. Mary's face lit up at the sight of him, and she hurried to take his arm. Darling, I was worried about you. Where have you been? Having a look round, John said vaguely. He caught my eye and added, and avoiding certain people. The hints were becoming less subtle. I took this one, too. In the space of a few hours, Schmidt had managed to become best friends with most of the others. He was particularly taken with Susie, whom he described, as I might have expected, as a fine figure of a woman. Safely surrounded by listening ears, I managed to stick to generalities during the ride back to the boat. Why didn't you tell me you were joining the tour, Schmidt? I asked. I wanted to surprise you, Schmidt beamed at me. You succeeded. I wanted all along to come, I told you that. At some length. But duty came first. Schmidt was talking at the top of his lungs, inviting the interest and admiration of his newfound friends. So, to Amsterdam I went, but it was a fiasco, Vicky. The gentleman could not make up his mind. He kept putting me off, and anyhow, he did not have anything of great interest. So finally I said, vielen Dank, auf Wiedersehen. And I put a call to the travel bureau, and they said there had been a cancellation. I arrived last night in Minya by the train and hired a boat to carry me across the river first thing this morning because I wanted to be here waiting for you. They were to bring my luggage to the boat later. He turned to answer a question from Alice, whom, of course, he had met at some conference somewhere sometime and left me a prey to painful reflections. Apparently the travel bureau hadn't mentioned, why should they after all, that a space had been made available by the illness of one of the passengers. John had said Jen would be joining us at Luxor. Did this mean she wasn't going to? Or had there been an earlier defection, another cancellation? I wanted rather badly to find out. I didn't have the opportunity until after lunch. There was barely time for a much-needed shower and change of clothing, before the gong rang, and when I reached the dining room, Schmidt was already seated, waving and yelling at me to join him, and Louisa. I might have known he'd latch on to her. For once, she didn't monopolize the conversation. She didn't have to. Schmidt talked of nothing but her wonderful books and how thrilled he was to meet the author he had admired for so long. I think it was Mark Twain who outlined the three steps to a writer's heart. One... Tell him you have read one of his books. Two, tell him you have read all of his books. Three, ask him to let you read the manuscript of his forthcoming book. Schmidt did all three, and added the culminating compliment which Twain didn't mention. Four, know the names of all the characters in all the books and remember every detail of the plots. Having noticed Louise's shape, I wasn't surprised to see her stow away almost as much food as Schmidt did. Swollen with calories and pleased conceit, her face was not a pretty sight. Vicky is also a writer of romances, Schmidt said. Oh? Louisa's smile turned sour. If I hadn't taken such a dislike to her, I would have sympathized. She probably thought I was going to ask her to read my manuscript, give me the name of her agent, or recommend my book to her publisher. 
I was tempted to do all three, in order to annoy her. But dignity prevailed. I just do it for fun, I said modestly. My heroine's adventures are too improbable for publication. Rosanna's adventures weren't much more improbable than those of most romance heroines, including Louisa's, but they had got a little out of hand in recent years. It was Schmidt's fault. He egged me on. Nothing was too improbable for him, so long as there were lots of sword fights and ripped bodices and heaving breasts. Louisa dropped the subject of my manuscript with a thud and started to tell Schmidt the plot of her forthcoming book. She hadn't written it yet, so she didn't have a manuscript. See Twain above, number three. I excused myself, leaving Schmidt listening with prurient fascination to Louisa's description of her heroine's struggles with the lustful priest of Amun. I had some hope of waylaying John before the afternoon tour left. Instead, I was waylaid by Mr. Hamid the purser. I thought he was looking rather grave, and when he drew me aside, I expected... Well, I don't know what I expected, but it certainly wasn't what I heard. You remember young Ali, your room steward, Dr. Bliss? Of course I remember him. He wasn't on duty this morning. Oh, good heavens, don't tell me he's jumped ship, or whatever you call it. That was what we believed, when he did not report for duty this morning. It would not have surprised me if he was responsible for the accident of the flower pot, his guilty conscience and fear of punishment might have driven him into flight. That would have been bad enough, but I could tell by Hamid's frown that it was even worse. I didn't say anything. I suppose I had a premonition of what was coming. He fell or jumped overboard sometime during the night, Hamid said slowly. The body was found a few hours ago. Chapter 5 I must have looked as sick as I felt. Hamid took my arm and led me to a chair. You must not blame yourself, Dr. Bliss. I don't. One of my less convincing lies, that one. It didn't even convince me. It was an unfortunate accident, Hamid said gently. He must have tried to swim to shore and been seized by a cramp or something of the sort. The others were gathering for the afternoon tour. John was among them, with Mary, as usual, by his side. Tell them to wait for me, I said, rising. I won't be long. All I could see as I ran up the stairs was that kid's face, wet with tears as he protested his innocence, wreathed in smiles as he assured me of his appreciation for my kindness. Kindness! It couldn't have been an accident. Either he'd been bribed to drop the flower pot and later repented, or he had seen the person responsible. They had disposed of him as coolly and callously as if he'd been a mosquito. The note I scribbled wasn't very coherent, but I was pretty sure it would get the point across. I put it in the safe and ran back to the lobby. The others were heading down the gangplank when I got there, but Faisal had waited for me. Hamid said he had told you. His warm, dark eyes searched my face. Yes. He should not have. It has distressed you. Of course it has. What kind of monster do you think I am? I don't think you are a monster. That is why I did not want Hamid to tell you. He put a supportive arm around my shoulders. I leaned against him for a moment, and his grip tightened as a violent tremor ran through me. He didn't know I was shaking with rage, not distress. There is no need to mention this unhappy business to the other passengers, Faisal said. I nodded. I'm all right, Faisal. Let's go. Herr Schmidt is not yet here. He indicated his wish to accompany us. A wild hope dawned in my heart. We can't wait indefinitely. He's probably fallen asleep. No such luck. Beaming all over his round pink face, burbling apologies, he emerged from the elevator, complete with pith helmet, sunglasses, bag, and a variety of objects that dangled from straps crisscrossing his torso. 
I identified a camera, a pair of binoculars, and a canteen, among other more arcane impedimenta. Fewer than half the passengers had taken advantage of the opportunity to visit the royal tomb. I was relieved to see that dear old Anna had declined. In fact, only the diehards, all of them relatively young and vigorous, were there. After considering the other options, sweet and bright, John and Mary, Louisa, swathed in veils and trying to look mysterious, the German couple from Hamburg, Alice and Perry, Schmidt seated himself next to Larry Blankiron and greeted him like an old friend, which, as it turned out, he was. Or at least an old acquaintance, which is the same thing by Schmidt's standards. I wondered if there was anybody in the world of art and archaeology Schmidt didn't know. Ed Whitbread politely moved over so I could sit on Larry's other side. It was a touching demonstration of confidence, I thought, in my harmlessness, or in his ability to stop me if I attempted to assassinate his boss. I didn't doubt he could. We went rattling off across the empty plain, followed by the armed escort. The sun high overhead bleached all the color from the sand. The only contrast was the brilliant blue of the sky above. The breeze of our movement felt like the blast from an oven. Schmidt started reminiscing about the last time he and Larry had met at a conference on preservation and restoration. From the stained glass of medieval cathedrals to the stones of the Colosseum, scarcely a monument in the world had escaped damage from fire and flood, pollution and traffic, and the mere presence of human beings. Larry, of course, was primarily interested in Egyptian monuments, and he became more animated than I'd ever seen him, his voice deepening with distress as he described the devastation of the tombs. The plaster and the paintings on it are literally falling off the walls. There's been more damage done in the last twenty years than in the preceding four thousand. But it is a wonderful thing you have done, Schmidt exclaimed, to restore the tomb paintings of Tete Sherry. It's only one out of many. There is also Nefertari's tomb? The Getty people have done a splendid job with Nefertari, Larry agreed. But if the tomb is reopened, the same thing will happen again. Then you support the idea of constructing reproductions? Schmidt asked. For the tourists to visit, while the original tombs are open only to scholars? Yes. Larry caught my eye and smiled deprecatingly. It does smack of elitism, doesn't it? Don't admit anyone except me. He shifted uncomfortably. The seats were hard. It's too late for the Amarna tombs, he went on regretfully. There's very little left. I admit the Egyptian government needs tourist dollars, but I regret what they've done here to make it easier for visitors to reach the royal tomb. Until they made this road through the wadi, it was a long, hard three-mile walk. I hear that the Japanese are talking of building lifts to the nobles' tombs, Schmidt said. They sighed in unison. We'd crossed the plain and entered a canyon or wadi that cut through the enclosing cliffs. They gave little shade. The sun was still high and the center of the road baked in the bright light. Seeing me swallow, Schmidt unscrewed his canteen and offered it to me. Gratefully, I accepted it. I took a drink and gagged. Beer? Aber natürlich said Schmidt, retrieving the canteen. Hier blink iron. Larry refused the offer. So did Ed. There was an ice chest on the trailer. When it stopped, we had drinks all around before starting on the last part of the trip. It was an easy walk along a narrower side wadi up to the entrance to the tomb. A short flight of steep steps led down. I could see a glow of light from the passage beyond but it wasn't exactly dazzling. Faisal gathered us around him and began lecturing. Schmidt wasn't looking at Faisal. He was looking at me. He'd taken off his sunglasses, preparatory to descending into the dimly lighted passageway, and his beady little eyes were worried. Schmidt was one of the few people in the world who knew about the time I'd been buried alive under a castle in Bavaria. That may sound melodramatic, 
but it's the literal truth. The tunnel had been blocked by an earthfall, and I had to dig my way out. I had no tools, only my bare hands, no light except a few matches, and, toward the end, not much in the way of oxygen. I have avoided dark, confined underground places since. Even Schmidt didn't know that I still dream about it from time to time. John knew. He knew because I had had the dream once when he was with me. He'd held me while I choked and gurgled and made a damn fool of myself, clinging to him and pleading incoherently for light and for air. After I calmed down, he had insisted I tell him the whole story. It would help exorcise the demons, he had said. He was staring at me, too. Over Mary's head, his eyes, narrowed and unblinking, met mine. I looked away. The others started down the stairs, and Schmidt edged closer to me. Vicky, perhaps you should not do this. He was under the impression that he was whispering. Several heads turned, and Faisal came back to me. Is there a problem, Vicky? No problem, I said, curtly. Nor was there, not really. What bothered me was not claustrophobia in the classic sense— abnormal fear of narrow, confined spaces. As long as there was light and there were other people around, I was okay. At least, that's what I told myself. It wasn't as bad as I'd feared. There were lights at frequent intervals and modern stairs or ramps over the rougher parts of the ancient passageways. And people. Schmidt stuck close, bless his thoughtful little heart. Egyptian tomb architecture has never been one of my passions in life. Sweet set out to prove it was one of his. He latched on to Perry, despite the latter's attempts to get away, so he could come and tell me all about everything, and began babbling about changes in axis and angles of descent and comparisons with earlier and later types. He'd certainly done his homework. Alice and Schmidt were arguing about Minoan influences on Amarna art. Faisal's voice echoed weirdly as he mentioned points of interest. There weren't many. The walls of the sloping passage were rough and unadorned. It had an eerie impressiveness, though, and by the time we reached the burial chamber, everyone except Faisal had fallen silent. There wasn't much to see there, either. Only a few scratches on the rough walls. But when Faisal pointed them out and described the scenes of which they were the scanty remainder— he managed to suggest something of the beauty that had once been there. Depictions of the king and queen offering to the sole god they had worshipped, the sun disk with rays ending in small, caressing human hands, mourners, their garments rent and their hands raised in ceremonial grieving. Even with his eloquence, I couldn't make out the details of the figure on the funeral bier. Faisal claimed these details proved it was a female figure. But I thought this was the king's tomb, the Frau from Hamburg said. We don't know the identity of the woman on the bier, Faisal answered. It has been suggested she was Nefertiti. Louisa swooped down on him, waving her arms. Her veils billowed like bat wings. Yes, I feel it. I feel her presence. She flopped down onto the floor and sat cross-legged, crooning to herself. The others studied her in mingled disgust and embarrassment. Sweet muttered something derogatory about New Age mystics, and Blankiron's face was rigid with distaste. Odd how so many people go soggy over Nefertiti, murmured a satirical voice. Hands in his pockets, hair shining in the light of the bulb overhead, John glanced at me and smiled. Faisal was the only other member of the party who was more amused than embarrassed. He'd probably run into this sort of thing before. It is not Nefertiti. She appears elsewhere in the same scene. One authority has suggested that this was her tomb, not that of her husband. But that viewpoint is not generally accepted. The unfinished suite of rooms leading off the downward passage may have been intended for her burial. We will visit them later. 
but first you will want to see the best preserved portion of the tomb, which was designed for one of the royal princesses. Ignoring Louisa, he led us out the way we'd come. The others crowded after him. They weren't any more comfortable in that room than I'd been. And I'm not just talking about the temperature and the close air. It was good-sized, about thirty feet square, according to Faisal. And the ceiling didn't brush the top of my head. But somehow I felt as if it did. And the battered stone pillars looked as if they might collapse at any moment. Whistling softly and irreverently, John stood studying the wall, and Mary sidled up to me. Are you as anxious to leave this place as I am? she whispered. I don't know. How anxious are you? I wiped the perspiration off my forehead. I suppose it's partly psychological, Mary murmured. The reminders of death and decay and darkness. That was one of the words I didn't need to hear right then. Without replying, I headed for the door. I was determined to stick it out, though. The chambers we'd visited in the Mastaba tombs at Saqqara were above ground. The nobles' tombs at Amarna were cut into the cliff, but we hadn't gone down under, into the burial chambers, and I'd always been able to see daylight in the distance. This was the most difficult place I'd encountered yet, and I felt I was going about conquering my phobia in a very sensible way the hell with jumping back onto the horse. I'd rather start with a very small pony or a St. Bernard and work my way up. One of Agnaton's daughters had died young and had been buried in her father's tomb in a suite of rooms located off the main descending corridor. The scene I had found particularly moving, that of the little body lying stiff on the funeral bed with the grieving parents bending over it, could hardly be made out. Some vandal had tried to hack out a portion of the relief. The deep, jagged incision had destroyed the upper part of the princess's body and other details. That's an example of why I dread increased accessibility, said Larry, who was standing next to me. These reliefs were virtually intact until the thirties. But you cannot blame the poor devils of villagers, said Schmidt, the reconstructed socialist on my other side. It is the European and American collectors who pay large prices for illegal antiquities who are responsible. I do not mean you, of course, he added quickly. Larry laughed. That's why my collection isn't very impressive. The best objects were acquired by museums and less scrupulous collectors before I got interested. Anyhow, I'm more concerned about preservation than collecting. When we left the princess's rooms, I noticed that John again hung back while Mary followed me. Had there been a lover's tiff? I waited for her and gave her a friendly smile. I had, of course, no ulterior motive. Almost through, I said encouragingly. Oh, I don't mind. Her voice wavered a little, though. It's been very interesting. We started up the ramp. It seemed a lot steeper than it had when we descended. The last suite of rooms, the ones Faisal had said might have been meant for the Queen's burial, was located about halfway up the incline. Indicating the entrance where the others were waiting, I asked, Are you going to skip the final treat, or shall we participate? Mary glanced behind her. John was some distance away, taking his time. Couldn't the poor little wimp come to any decision without consulting him? What had he been doing down there alone? Perhaps there had been a quarrel, and he was sulking, trying to make Mary feel guilty about hurting his sensitive feelings. I meant to ask you before, I said casually, about Jen. How is she? Much better. In fact, she stopped with a gulp. All of a sudden, there he was, behind her, looming, you startled me, darling, she exclaimed. In fact, John said, she's recovered enough to return home. You mean she's left Egypt? I stared at him. This morning. She doesn't trust Egyptian doctors or hospitals. Then she won't be rejoining the tour. No, she won't. I looked from his self-satisfied smile to Mary's downcast face. 
Was that what the quarrel had been about? You sound pleased, I said. Oh, I am. She was a bloody nuisance, John said callously. Now hurry along, girls. One would suppose, from the way you're dawdling, that you're enjoying this. By the time we'd finished examining a few more rough, unfinished, rock-cut rooms and listened to Faisal describe their possible function, everyone, even Louisa, was ready to call it a day. I do not feel her presence, she intoned. The beautiful one was never interred here. She's probably right about that, muttered Larry, but for the wrong reasons. Since when did she become an expert on Nefertiti? I think she's making her the heroine of her new book, I said. Then why was she carrying on about missing Maidam? Larry demanded. That pyramid predates Nefertiti by over a thousand years. Historical novelists don't worry about little details like that, I explained, with certain guilty memories of my own heroine's activities. Having Rosanna hide in a broom closet to elude Genghis Khan hadn't been kosher, but it had entertained Schmidt, which was my primary purpose for continuing the saga. Hot, thirsty, and coated with dust, we made a beeline for the ice chest and stood swilling down cold drinks. The late afternoon heat was intense, but it felt refreshing after the confined airlessness of the tomb. Even in the shade, I seemed to feel my skin drying and shrinking over my bones. It was the climate of Egypt, not the well-meaning but often destructive process of burial that produced such excellent mummies. Blankiron wanted to see a few more tombs on the way back to the boat but he gave in with smiling good grace when the others emphatically outvoted him. Mary let out a muted wail when he suggested stopping at the southern tombs. Schmidt, ever gallant, hurried to her and offered her his arm. He'd held up well, but I was worried about him. The open-heart surgery he'd undergone a few years earlier had, he claimed, made a new man of him. The new man looked to me just as unhealthy as the old one. His face was flushed with heat and exercise, but his smile was as broad and his mustache as defiant as ever. He was obviously having a wonderful time. I let them and the others go on ahead. I hadn't had a chance to talk with John. Huddling with him in an otherwise unoccupied tomb chamber might have inspired rude speculation. Maybe he was just as anxious for a private conversation. Maybe that was why he appeared to be avoiding Mary. That theory was strengthened when he fell in step with me and said easily and audibly, Enjoying yourself, Dr. Bliss? Don't let's be so formal, I said, stretching my mouth into a tight smile. I'm trying, but my ingrained awe of academic titles makes it difficult. His voice kept dropping in pitch. I don't believe I can possibly address Professor Schmidt as Anton. Try Poopsy, I suggested, losing it for a second. The corners of his mouth compressed, holding back laughter. Or a rude comment. The reference to a particularly tense moment in one of our earlier encounters might have inspired either. I went on in a hoarse whisper. What did you tell him? Why don't you ask him? I intend to, but I want to hear your version. Quit stalling. The others are waiting for us. I stumbled artistically, stopped, and bent over to examine my foot. Coincidence, John said, taking me by the arm as if to steady me. The flow of blood in my hand stopped dead. He'll never buy that. He'll have to, won't he? Not Schmidt. I cannot be held accountable for Schmidt's unholy imagination. If you and I agree, what can he... He broke off as Faisal and Larry hurried towards us. Is it sprained? He inquired, adding doubtfully, perhaps Faisal could uh, carry you. The implication being that he couldn't, and that even Faisal might have some difficulty lifting my enormous body. I straightened. I just turned it. It's fine. 
My assignation with Schmidt was more easily arranged. We debated it at the top of our lungs as the trailer bounced noisily over the rough track. Schmidt wanted to meet in the lounge so we could share happy hour with all his newfound friends. That was reassuring. It suggested he had accepted the coincidence story and wasn't about to interrogate me about my real reasons for being on board. However, I figured I'd better deliver a brief lecture on tact and discretion before I turned him loose on the world. And as I pointed out, he hadn't had time to unpack yet. We agreed that I would come to his room after I had freshened up. After I'd locked and bolted my door, I went not to the bathroom, but to the safe. The note was still there. I stamped my foot and swore. That didn't accomplish anything, so I headed for the shower. Maybe my mysterious contact hadn't had a chance to retrieve the messages yet. Still, it wasn't an auspicious omen, and the cool water sloshing over my heated body didn't settle the doubts that sloshed around in my heated brain. I was getting dressed when I heard the knock on the door. Throwing on a robe, I hurried to answer it. Oh, I said. Hi. Alice was certainly a fast-change artist. She was wearing a flowered print dress and white, low-heeled sandals. I thought you might need something for that ankle, she explained. I found this liniment very effective. The bottle she offered me didn't look like liniment. Her hand covered the label. That's very kind of you, I said slowly. Come in. When I turned, after closing the door, she'd settled herself in a chair, ankles crossed. The bottle on the table beside her proclaimed that its contents were hydrogen peroxide. You? I squeaked unoriginally. I admit I don't look the part, Alice said coolly. How did you know I wanted to see you? You didn't get my note. Her brow furrowed. Which note? I produced it. You were upset, weren't you? She murmured, after reading the hurried message. Of course I was. That poor, innocent kid. Come now, you aren't thinking clearly. Why do you suppose that note wasn't collected earlier? My God. I dropped heavily onto the bed. You mean, Ali was an agent of the Egyptian Security Service? Alice's expression darkened, which I am not. I agreed to help out with this particular job because I care deeply about the protection of antiquities and because an increase in anti-foreign feeling here could affect my work and that of others. He was the man assigned to look after you. I was only supposed to pass on messages. The news relieved one nightmare. Ali was just as young and just as dead, but at least he'd been a professional, fully aware of the risks his job entailed. I didn't learn of his death until this afternoon, Alice went on. I realized then that I had to talk to you, even though I'd been told never under any circumstances to contact you directly. These people are stupidly obsessed with security, in my opinion. But to do them justice, they may have been concerned with my safety as well as yours. I... Holy shit, Alice! I stared at her in horror. I didn't think of that, and I should have. You better go and stay far far away from me in the future. Calm yourself, honey. I am not volunteering to take over Ali's job. I'm exactly what I seem to be, an aging, overweight archaeologist who's never fired a gun or taken a karate lesson. If you had to depend on me to protect you, you'd be a sitting duck. But we'd better discuss this situation and decide what to do about it. She reached into her shirt pocket. Do you mind if I smoke? No, go right ahead. I looked around for an ashtray. Alice laughed. That's a slip, Vicky. I don't know why you're pretending to be a smoker, but you'd better learn how to do it right. You haven't used the ashtray, and you don't even inhale. It was not one of my brighter ideas, I admitted. So what are we going to do? Wait, I suppose. Alice frowned thoughtfully at her lighter. 
They will have learned of Ali's death by now, and will, one assumes, arrange for a replacement. The change of schedule worries me, though. My job was to pass on the information Ali gave me when I went ashore. But we've already skipped two of the schedule stops, and we'll miss a third tomorrow. I won't be able to communicate again until we get to Abydos. You have no other means of reaching the people in charge? Damn, that's stupid. What if there were an emergency? There has been an emergency, Alice said wryly. Two, in fact. The lines of communication have been cut in both directions. However, I suspected all along that I was only a minor cog in the machinery. A backup, if you will, for the transmission of information. There must be at least one other agent on board. Another professional. Not a willing but incompetent amateur like me. Wishful thinking? I hope not. Burkhardt had used the plural when he promised me protection. Who? I asked. If I knew, I wouldn't be talking to you. Alice rubbed her forehead, as if it ached. It probably did. She went on. I gather from the spy thrillers I've read that this is standard procedure. Minimal contacts, maximum anonymity. I'd read a few of the damn things myself. Ali had known me and Alice. If they had questioned him before they killed him, there wouldn't necessarily be any marks on his body. Up-to-date torturers have all kinds of neat scientific devices at their disposal, including drugs. It couldn't be Anton, could it? Her words made it as far as my ears, but my brain refused to acknowledge them. What? I gasped. They'll have to replace Ali, Alice said. Anton turned up this morning, out of the blue. No, are you crazy or what? Schmidt isn't... I stopped to catch my breath. The timing is too tight, Alice. They couldn't have learned of Ali's death until early this morning. Schmidt was already in Minya. That's true. She stubbed out her cigarette and stood up. No sense speculating, I guess. The situation won't become critical until we get back to Cairo. And surely we'll be contacted long before then, probably in Luxor. My advice would be to sit tight, play it cool, and be careful. It was excellent advice, and I had every intention of following it, if I was allowed to. After she'd left, I stood stock still, staring at the closed door. My heart was pounding as if I'd run a mile. Her suggestion that Schmidt might be Ollie's replacement was so far out that only a lunatic could believe it. Alice wasn't a lunatic, though. Did she know something about Schmidt I didn't know? Did other people know that same something? Someone groaned. It had to be me. I was the only one there. Impossible, I informed myself. All other considerations aside, such as the possibility that I was prejudiced, condescending, and easily manipulated by a cute little shrewd little actor, Schmidt couldn't have gotten from Munich to Minya in three hours. I prayed with all my heart that the bad guys were as familiar with plane schedules as I was. I didn't want them to think, as Alice had done, that Schmidt might be Ali's replacement. The phone rang. Schmidt, of course. The sound of that fat, jolly Father Christmas voice snapped me back into the real world. Impossible, I said. Was ist's, said Schmidt. I'm on my way, Schmidt. To judge by the image I saw in a mirror later on, I must have selected clothes that were more or less coordinated, but I don't know how I did it. I was thinking of other things. The opposition seemed to be a lot more efficient than our group. They had fingered Ali, which was more than I had, and disposed of him without scruple or delay. Why now, I wondered. Just general tidiness, or had he been about to blow the whistle on one or all of them? He'd have to have solid evidence to do that and they must have known he had it, or they wouldn't have taken the risk of committing murder at this stage. Despite the record he'd managed to build up while hobnobbing with me, John wasn't a killer. Admittedly, that assessment depended to some extent on his own statements, which were far from reliable in other areas, but I was inclined to believe him. 
He could reasonably claim self-defense in both the examples to which I had been an eyewitness. Or defense of me. The phone distracted me from that uncomfortable train of thought. I didn't bother answering since I assumed it was Schmidt. I picked up my bag and headed out. All prejudice aside, I couldn't visualize John knocking Ali unconscious and holding his head underwater till he drowned. That wasn't John's style. Apparently, he had got himself mixed up with a very nasty crowd. He had a bad habit of doing that. Schmidt's room was on the top deck, the sun deck, on the same side of the boat as mine. There were only four suites on that level, the choicest of all, I assumed, since Blank Iron had two of them. Schmidt flung the door open before I could knock and enveloped me in a huge hug. At last, I was about to go in search of you. You are late. No, I'm not. We didn't settle on a time. His room was a tad bigger and fancier than mine. A fixed screen separated the sitting area from the bedroom, and there were two overstuffed chairs, plus a long, comfortable sofa. The sliding doors stood open, admitting a cool breeze and a breathtaking view of the sunset-reddened cliffs. We will sit on the balcony and admire the scenery, Schmidt said, bustling around with glasses and bottles. It is very pleasant, nicht? I have been on many cruise boats, but never one so luxurious as this. Like mine, his balcony was fringed with flowering plants. I edged cautiously onto it, telling myself nobody could drop anything on me here. There wasn't another deck above this one. To my right, I could see the prow, or maybe it was the stern, of one of the lifeboats. To the left, a solid partition separated Schmidt's balcony from the one next door. However, it wasn't solid enough to muffle a voice as loud as Schmidt's, and when he shouted cheerfully, Sit, sit, my dear Vicky, and we will have a pleasant chat, I said, Who's next door? Sir, Schmidt caught himself. Mr. Tregarth and his wife. Damn it, Schmidt, I said savagely but softly. That's the precise reason I insisted on a private conversation. You've got to avoid slips like that. Ah, oh, yes, yes, I know. But what is the harm this time? You know, and he knows. Maybe she doesn't. They have gone downstairs. Schmidt looked subdued. You are right to remind me, though, Vicky. They have only been married a few weeks, and she is very young, very innocent. Perhaps... He has not yet told her of his brave and perilous occupation. She is the sort of child one would wish to shield from the harsh realities of life, nicht? Down below, I heard a rattle and clank that must have been the gangplank being drawn in. The boat began to move, gliding gently away from the shore. The eastern sky was darkening, but the curving bay of cliffs glowed in reflected sunset light. A flock of egrets settled into the shallows, looking like flying white flowers. Schmidt was rambling on. It may be that he will decide to retire from the service. A man of honor and of conscience would not wish to endanger his young bride or cause her a broken heart if he should. It's a nice plot, Schmidt. Why don't you write a book? Now listen to me. You've never met him before. I've never met him before. Nobody has ever met anybody before. Can you remember that? Schmidt had taken advantage of the interruption to hoist his glass. Emerging from it, he fixed a stern eye on me. Aber natürlich. And you, Vicky, do you promise me, on your word of honor, that you did not know he would be on this cruise? I did not know, I said steadily. Not that you wouldn't lie to me if you wanted to, Schmidt ruminated. I drank my beer. It was some local variety, not bad, actually. Then Schmidt said, And your heart is not broken. You would not revenge yourself on your faithless lover by betraying him to his innocent, trusting... For God's sake, Schmidt! Good said Schmidt calmly. 
then we will have a pleasant holiday eh? and enjoy ourselves. I have not been in Egypt for many years. This should be a wonderful excursion. I have long looked forward to making the friendly acquaintance of Mr. Blank Iron. And extracting a contribution, I suggested. Schmidt grinned. It is my job, getting money from wealthy people, and I am very good at it. He was, too. Our museum is remarkably well endowed for such a small institution. He gives money to many worthy courses, Schmidt went on reflectively. Why not to us? Since your heart is not broken, you can help me do this. He is not such an ugly man, is he? Shame on you, Schmidt. Is that any way to talk to a dedicated feminist like me? Well, he is not ugly, Schmidt declared. I would not ask you to use your charms on a man who was disgusting to you. He is a woman-hater, they say. But he said many nice things about you, Vicky, and asked many questions. I long ago gave up hope of convincing Schmidt that it's not nice to seduce potential donors. He'd have done it himself if he'd had the necessary equipment. I suspect this is true of most museum directors. What did he say? I asked, pulling my chair closer. I had planned to sleep in next morning. It had been a long day, concluded by one of Perry's more boring lectures. But I was hauled out of bed at the crack of dawn by Schmidt, demanding that I join him on deck to watch the boat maneuver through the Asiut locks. Since I had already made the mistake of letting him in, the alternative being to let him go on yelling and pounding on my door, I scrambled into my clothes and let him lead me away. The buffet on the upper deck offered tea and coffee and an assortment of pastries. I downed a cup of coffee while Schmidt wreaked havoc among the pastries, for, I presumed, the second time. It would have been unwise to admit it to him, but as the caffeine took effect, I was glad he'd awakened me. The sun was barely above the horizon and the air was fresh and cool. Ahead lay the massive barrier of the barrage. The traffic crossing the bridge atop it included buses, bicycles, and donkeys. The ship had stopped, waiting its turn to pass through. There was one boat ahead of us on this side of the lock. Several other ships were already lined up behind us. Surrounding us and them, like minnows around a shark, were clusters of small boats filled with enterprising merchants who were hawking their wares at the top of their lungs. I joined Schmidt and several of the others at the rail. Schmidt was yelling, too, bargaining for a garment one of the merchants held up. It was a long robe, basically black, but covered from shoulders to midsection with sequins, beads, and embroidery in pseudo-Egyptian patterns. I was about to ask my tasteless boss how the exchange of merchandise and money could be made, since the little boats were a good thirty feet below us, when an object came hurtling through the air and landed with a splat on the deck. I jumped back with the alacrity of a frog in reverse, and someone bent to pick up the parcel. You seem a trifle tense this morning, Dr. Bliss, John remarked. Turning with a gallant bow, he presented the parcel to Susie Umphenor. I had believed I was getting used to Susie's outrageous outfits, but she constantly surprised me. This garment might have come straight out of a 30s film starring Jean Harlow. Bias-cut, satin-trimmed, with marabou feathers at the neck and the cuffs of the flowing sleeves. The things she had on her feet were, I think, referred to as mules. How she had managed to get upstairs in them without breaking her neck, I couldn't imagine. As she reached for the parcel, she slipped and tottered. Several pairs of masculine arms, including those of Sweet and Bright, made hopeful grabs at her, but she managed to avoid them and fell heavily against John. He had to detach both her hands before he could set her on her feet. Giggling merrily, Susie removed her purchase and held it up. A shift, very tight and very short, completely covered with gold sequins. There was, I regret to say, a matching cap. They were very smart, said John. It's for the Egyptian party tonight, Susie explained, 
with one of her wide, white grins. Ah, yes, I'd forgot. Perhaps I'd better get something for Mary. Advise me, will you, Susie? Your taste is so impeccable. He offered her his arm. Did I follow them to the rail? Certainly. I was going that way anyhow. I heard Susie ask why Mary wasn't with him, and John's reply? I persuaded her to sleep late. She had a rather restless night. Plastic bags were landing all over the place. Schmidt had already retrieved one, tossing the hideous garment over a chair. He put money into the bag, knotted it tightly, and tossed it down. He had a good arm for a fat old guy. The seller snagged the bag without difficulty. Susie's aim wasn't so good. Her bag missed the boat entirely, splashing into the water, but it was neatly retrieved by the merchant using a long hook. I didn't see what gorgeous garment John bought for his bride. I was too busy trying to keep Schmidt from buying not one, but several for me. I did succeed in talking him out of one of the gold sequin shifts. More of the passengers had come on deck to join in the fun. It would have been fun, I guess, if it hadn't been for my tense, suspicious mind. Yet, I assured myself, it was an awfully sloppy method of exchanging contraband or delivering explosives, especially when one of the boats down below was filled with men in black uniforms who kept a keen eye on every transaction. The party broke up when we started moving into the lock. It was a tricky maneuver, owing to the size of the Queen of the Nile. She filled the entire space, lengthways and sideways. The stone walls rose sheer on either side, broken only by a flight of stairs leading from the top to water level. Once we were in, even Susie could have tossed a package into the hands of someone who stood on the steps. The only person there, however, wore a black uniform and carried a rifle. There were more of them up above, lining the bridge that crossed the lock. Schmidt tugged me away. We will have breakfast, he announced. In a meaningful manner, I brushed the crumbs off his mustache. He chuckled. That was not breakfast, only a little snack. Since we weren't going ashore that day, the service of food was practically continuous. The passengers had to be kept amused, and for some of them, eating was a favorite sport. I kept Schmidt company while he stuffed himself, trying to decide how to occupy the long, leisurely day. I'm not ashamed to admit that Ali's death had put a damper on my enthusiasm, which had already been fairly waterlogged. If Alice was my only ally, we were both in deep trouble. If she wasn't, why the hell hadn't the other person identified him or herself? I had left another message in the safe. Its tone was peremptory, not to say hysterical, but if I didn't get a response, there wasn't a damn thing I could do about it. As for the other guys, I was prepared to leave them alone if they did the same for me. I didn't want to learn anything or even look as if I had. If there was ever a time for retreating into the fort and concentrating on defense, this was it. And I was going to take Schmidt into the fort with me. If Alice could get crazy ideas about him, so could the other guys. Schmidt had a lovely day. Usually he follows me around. This time I followed him, tight as a tick on a dog, and he was innocently delighted by my companionship. We tried on the ghastly garments he'd bought, and although he assured me most sincerely that I looked wonderful in all of them, fond as I am of Schmidt, I was unable to return the compliment. I persuaded him to pay a visit to the souk, as Mr. Azad's shop was called, to see if we could find something even gaudier. Schmidt loved the souk. He loves places where he can buy things, not only for himself, but, bless his generous heart, for his friends and relations. The shop was small and crowded. The people who hadn't purchased their costumes from the aquatic merchants were looking for appropriate attire for the banquet that evening. Mr. Azad didn't have any gold sequin shifts, but some of the robes were lavishly embroidered and trimmed with gold braid. With his smiling approval, he carried an armful back to my room and tried them on. Schmidt adores trying on clothes, and he likes even better watching me try them on. 
After much consultation and much pirouetting in front of the mirror, Schmidt settled on the gaudiest and most voluminous of the robes. It was an ensemble, in fact, a long-sleeved, floor-length, caftan-type garment with a matching sleeveless robe open down the front that was worn over it. After he had tried three times to wind a long scarf around his head, turban fashion, I persuaded him he looked much more macho in a Bedouin-type headdress. By then, it was time for Brotzeit, lunch. I don't even want to think about what Schmidt ate. I had hoped he would want to take a nap afterward, but he was full of beans, among other edibles, and raring to go. You will not want to miss the lecture, Vicky. Herr Foggington Smythe is speaking on the tomb of Tetty Sherry and showing slides. You haven't heard him lecture, Schmidt. He is the most boring, but the slides, Vicky. Many have never been seen before. It is a complete photographic reproduction. I said I'd meet him in the lounge in ten minutes, and he trotted off after warning me not to be late and assuring me I was beautiful enough already. I spent a few minutes putting on fresh makeup. Then I opened the safe. My notes were gone, and something had been added. A nice, shiny forty-five automatic. Chapter 6 I grew up on a farm in Minnesota. Dad taught all of us how to handle a shotgun and a rifle. He didn't hunt, but he saw nothing wrong with discouraging varmints, including the human variety, when they attacked the livestock, including the human variety. A bullet was also the quickest and most humane method of dispatching a fatally injured or rabid animal. He hated handguns, though. He claimed they were cowards' weapons and more likely to get a person into trouble than out of it. I suppose it's easy to take that attitude when you're six five and built like a tank. Inconsistent or not, I share his attitude. I picked the thing up with all due caution and examined it with even greater caution. I can tell an automatic from a revolver, but that's about the limit of my expertise. This wasn't one of the few models I had handled. The safety was on, and there was a full clip, but no extras. The presence of the gun proved Ali had had a backup on board, which was good news. I only hoped it wasn't meant to convey a subtle message. You're on your own, baby. Don't expect me to rush to the rescue. I can deliver subtle messages, too. I put the gun back in the safe and closed the door. Anyhow, I couldn't carry the damn thing on me. My clothes were all lightweight cotton and linen. There was no place I could stash it where it wouldn't show. If I put it in my bag, either it would fall out at an inappropriate moment, or it would sink to the bottom and I wouldn't be able to locate it in a hurry. Dad was right. The damn things were more trouble than they were worth, I hoped. Schmidt had saved me a seat in the lounge. By what was probably not a strange coincidence, the only other person at the table was Larry. He did seem pleased to see me. Schmidt's face had the bland, pink-cheeked innocence it wore when he was up to something. I knew what he was up to this time, and I wished him luck. I'm a loyal employee of the National Museum myself, up to a point. So they let you off for a few hours, I said, glancing at the table where Larry's two henchmen were sitting. It's the other way around, actually, Larry said with a smile. I had to order Schroeder to take a break. He's been on the phone to Luxor a dozen times, working on the arrangements for the reception. Mr. Schroeder is your secretary? I asked. Executive assistant, rather. Haven't you met him? I shook my head. I have, said Schmidt. A very pleasant person, but shy, nicht? Larry laughed. I wouldn't say that, but he's been pretty busy. These changes in schedule have been a damned nuisance. We've had to revise our own schedule for the reception at my place in Luxor, and for the formal opening of the tomb. It is true, then, that we will have the honor of being the first to see the tomb in all its new glory? Schmidt asked eagerly. The first, and possibly the last, Larry said. Aha! Schmidt nodded and winked. I thought that would be your aim. 
I am in full agreement, of course. But can you do that, my friend? The Bureau of Tourism will surely object to closing the tomb. I have an argument that may convince them. No, he added, pleasantly but firmly. Don't ask, Anton. I'm saving it for a surprise. It'll be announced at the reception day after tomorrow. I would not want you to tell me then, Schmidt announced, widening his eyes and pursing his lips. I like surprises. He was overdoing the cute stuff, and I tried to tip him off with a slight shake of my head. Schmidt only grinned. The room had filled. Everyone was there, even Susie, whom I had expected to prefer sunbathing over culture. Perhaps she had found she lacked an audience. It was a long lecture, but for once even Perry's hopelessly pedantic delivery couldn't spoil the fascination of the subject. The tomb had been discovered around the turn of the century by a famous husband and wife team of Egyptologists. It was an unusual combination in those days, when women weren't allowed to work in archaeology or any other serious discipline, and the excavators were also unusual in that they followed rigorous standards of recording and copying instead of the slash-and-burn, dig-em-up-and-dump-em techniques favored by many of their contemporaries. Since color photography hadn't yet been developed, the only way of accurately reproducing the wall paintings was to have them copied by an artist. Howard Carter known to the world for his discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, began his career as a copyist. He did some nice work, but I believe I can't be accused of prejudice when I claim that the greatest archaeological copyists of that period were women. The discoverers of Tedesheri's tomb had employed one of them, and she'd copied the paintings with exquisite skill. As Schmidt had mentioned a couple of dozen times, we were among the first people to see the photographs of the restorations. Larry had denied dozens of requests for permission to reproduce them. Even the National Geographic hadn't been able to talk him into letting them do a story. Perry had had the bright idea of comparing three versions, slide by slide. First the painting, then a color photograph taken before the restoration began three years earlier, then the photograph of the same section as it now appeared. It was a fascinating and convincing demonstration of the hazards of accessibility, and an equally impressive demonstration of what expert restorers and pots of money could do. The paintings had deteriorated shockingly in only ninety years, but Larry's crew had returned them to their original beauty. After the lights had come on and the shades had been drawn back, Perry started taking questions. I got up and headed for the deck. Larry followed me. In need of nicotine? he asked, smiling. I kept forgetting I was a smoker. I took out a cigarette and said with perfect honesty, I didn't want to spoil the impression. You've done a wonderful thing, Larry. I feel as if I ought to kiss your hand. Schmidt was close on Larry's heels. Sie hat recht, mein Freund, he said seriously. The art lovers of the world owe you a great debt. I will not kiss your hand but I would like to shake it. A dark flush spread over Larry's face. He looked down and shuffled his feet like a bashful schoolboy. Your praise means a great deal to me, he mumbled. I was afraid Schmidt might take advantage of Larry's emotional state to start hinting about certain other things he could do for the art lovers of the world, so I changed the subject. What happened to her mummy? One of the unlabeled mummies in the Deir el-Bahri cache is believed to be hers, Larry said. I questioned the identification. On what basis? Schmidt asked interestedly. It's a rather complicated question. Ah, yeah, I recall reading about it. Schmidt leaned against the rail, his eyes bright with interest. Schmidt is interested in practically everything, and as I've said, he remembers practically everything he's ever read. There is a papyrus, Amherst, I believe, dating from the 12th century B.C., which describes the confessions of tomb robbers at Thebes. So many of the royal tombs had been robbed that priests gathered up the royal mummies or their battered remains and hid them in a secret place. This cache was found in the 1880s 
after it, in turn, had been looted by local thieves. Some of the mummies were unidentified, and none were in their original coffins. You are very well informed, Larry said curtly. He turned, arms on the rail, looking out across the river. I would have taken the hint, but Schmidt went gaily on. A few years ago, the University of Michigan undertook a complete X-ray examination of the royal mummies. There were some peculiar discoveries. For instance, the small wrapped mummy found with the body of a high priestess was not, as had been believed, that of her stillborn child, but a baboon. One of the little old queens was bald and had, what do you call it, teeth that stuck out? Broadside Schmidt, I interrupted, specifically tea time. Why don't you get us a good table near the buffet before the others come out? The prospect of food can distract Schmidt from just about anything. He went bustling off. Are you having tea? I asked Larry. He shook his head. I'm saving myself for the banquet this evening. Come to think of it, I ought to get a costume of some sort together, if you'll excuse me. I joined Schmidt. They are still setting out the food, he complained. There was no hurry. Why? A gentle hint, Schmidt. If you want to win Larry's heart, don't talk to him about mummies, especially the mummies of beautiful Egyptian queens. Ah! Schmidt thought it over. Ah, vielen Dank, Vicky. I should have realized. A romantic he is, nicht? He dreams of the lovely images, the paintings, and the statues. That's my guess. Even at their best, mummies aren't romantic. Mm, yes. That is why he does not want to believe the little old lady, who is bald and sticking out of tooth like her descendant, is his dream queen. The head was broken from the badly damaged body. I let out a croak of protest. Schmidt, I'm no romantic, but I'm just about to eat. Knock it off, will you? I realized I was still holding the cigarette. I was about to return it to the packet when a lighter went off, so close to the end of my nose that I shied back. May we join you? Mary asked. Schmidt leaped to his feet and held a chair for her. I sucked on the damn cigarette, womanfully suppressing a cough. Thank you, I said. A pleasure, said John. I didn't doubt it. We were talking about Teddy Sherry, Schmidt explained. Vicky did not want to hear about her mummy. Mary dotes on dead bodies, said John. Oh, darling, don't tease. Mary's pretty mouth quirked with distaste. Over the past days, her skin had darkened from cream to pale gold without so much as a hint of homely sunburn. She wore a white silk shirt with a scarf of burgundy and gold knotted loosely around her throat. The Greek earrings would have suited the ensemble better than the diamonds she was wearing. A carat and a half each, if I was any judge. And I am. At that, they were smaller than the stone in the ring on her third finger. It overwhelmed the simple gold band next to it. Schmidt was beginning to catch on to the idea that very few people enjoy talking about mummies. You prefer the charming little statuette of the lady that is in the British Museum? He said with a twinkle and a chuckle. Mary glanced shyly at John. I'm afraid I don't... There is no need to apologize, Schmidt exclaimed. A lovely young woman should not trouble her head with antiquities. Thanks, Schmidt, I said. In your case, it is different, Schmidt said calmly. I decided not to pursue that point, but I admit it was partly pique that inspired my next comment. I've always loved that little statue. I was crushed when they decided it was... It was... A forgery. Schmidt. Oblivious to undercurrents, finished the sentence. I tore my eyes away from John's face. He had raised one eyebrow, a trick of his I particularly dislike, and a faint smile curved his lips. What does it matter if it's beautiful? he asked. 
a respected authority on Egyptian art, said it was the most appealing and charming of the sculptures of that period. Has it lost artistic merit? Ah, but you miss the point, my friend, Schmidt exclaimed. The authenticity of the work. I was only too familiar with the arguments pro and con, including John's arguments. I'd heard them before. When I was about to blow the whistle on him and his scheme for substituting forgeries for valuable antique jewelry. They had been superb copies, almost indistinguishable from the originals. But one example of the counter-argument had dangled from Mary's dainty earlobes the night before. I lusted after those Greek earrings, and I wouldn't have felt the same about copies, however accurate. Mary reached for John's hand. The movement stretched the silk of her blouse across her arm. The fabric was so thin I could see the golden tan of her skin through it. I could see the dark spots, too. There were several of them spaced regularly. Not the sort of bruise you'd get from bumping into a piece of furniture or a door. More like the marks of fingers. Schmidt had taken a fancy to Mary, and vice versa. Who could blame her? He's awfully sweet, especially when he puts himself out to be gallant. John didn't want to leave us either. I wasn't sure what he had in mind. General aggravation, maybe? It certainly aggravated me when he turned Schmidt's attention from antiquities to country music. One question was enough. Schmidt was delighted to expand on the subject. Yes, yes, it is a most interesting type. I am indebted to Vicky for introducing me to it. I am thinking of taking up the guitar. It would be better than listening to you sing, I said, rudely. Schmidt had become impervious to my insults. He thinks I'm just teasing. And maybe he's right. You sing, then. The one about the pillow that is dying. A moribund pillow? John's eyes were as blue and innocent as forget-me-nots. I must hear that one. We ended up in the lounge, gathered cozily around the piano. Schmidt plays a little, enough to pick out tunes. He gave us all three verses of the sinner's death, including the dying pillow. A slight error in the reference of the adjective, as John described it. There are a lot of bluegrass songs about prisoners and chain gangs and sinners. Schmidt set out to prove he knew them all. A sensitive man might have found that theme a trifle awkward, but not John. His sense of humor is offbeat at best, but that day... He was in a particularly strange mood. He kept egging Schmidt on. What Mary was thinking, I could only imagine. She certainly wasn't amused. The lounge had emptied rapidly as soon as Schmidt began singing. Since I didn't want to leave Schmidt alone, especially with John, I remained. In order to demonstrate my cool, I even joined in on a couple of choruses. I'm rather proud of my ability to slide from one note to the next. I was giving my all to Little Rosewood Casket when I realized that Schmidt had dropped out. He always breaks down during Little Rosewood Casket. And that John was singing harmony in a flat nasal tenor that bore a suspicious resemblance to the voice of the great Sarah Carter. That brought me back to earth with a painful thud. We had sung a weird medley of Bach, German pop tunes, and Christmas carols, to keep awake the night a blizzard trapped us in the abandoned church. It was the most memorable night we'd spent together, and I include other occasions which were memorable for quite different reasons. It was the night of all nights I didn't want to remember. The lyrics didn't help either. Take his letters and his locket Place them gently on my heart. I broke off in the middle of a glissando. We better go and dress for dinner, Schmidt. It's getting late. One more, John pleaded, looking soulfully at me from under his lashes. Yes, there is time. Let me think. Ah, here is one you may not have heard. It is the latest hit of the famous Road Sisters. The song was, You're a Detour on the Highway to Heaven.
A sample will suffice, I believe. But Mama lay a dying on the flatbed. She told me not to truck with scales like you. But you were just one more roadside attraction. And I went joy riding just for the few. I cut Schmidt off after three verses and three choruses. John's face was rapt. My God, he said reverently. That's magnificent. It's even better than the one about Jesus and the goal posts of life. How does it go again? Your curves made me lose my direction. Schmidt, I said, through clenched teeth. Yes, Vicky, we will go. Rising, he took John's arm. Mein hand from the steering wheel straight. They went off, arm in arm, voices clashing in duet. It was the most outrageous noise I have ever heard, and I've stepped on the tail of a cat or two in my time. I caught Mary's eye. He's like that sometimes, she said, with a stiff, apologetic little smile. So whimsical. Whimsical wasn't the word I would have chosen. Getting Schmidt ready for the grand dinner and costume party was almost as bad as decking a bride out for the wedding. Yes, I've been a bridesmaid. Twice. It didn't take me long to dress. Schmidt, that sly little rascal, had presented me with three ghastly garments he'd bought from the guys in the boats. One was too short, one was too tight, and the third was both and all three were covered with multicolored sequins. I'd already decided I wasn't going to appear in public in any of the three. I put on the simple blue and white striped robe I'd bought at the souk and studied the effect. It might not be glamorous, but it was very comfortable and very simple. Two rectangles stitched together at the shoulders and down the sides, with an open space left for the insertion of the arms. Blue braid outlined the neck opening, and a perpendicular slit down the front. I slung on all my fake gold jewelry, and after considering the question for longer than it merited, take his letters and his locket, I fastened around my neck the chain that held the golden rose. Too many people had access to my room, and that ornament was unusual enough and valuable enough to arouse speculation. I tucked the pendant firmly down into my bra so it could not be seen or dislodged, and proceeded to Schmidt's room. When he opened the door, his pink mouth sagged in disappointment. Why didn't you wear one of your beautiful new gowns? That is too plain, too large. It is ugly. I could have been equally insulting about his contributions to my wardrobe, but my mother always told me it isn't nice to criticize presents people give you. I'm saving the others so I can dazzle Gerda. Hurry up, Schmidt. Were you waiting for me to button you up? There are no buttons to button, said Schmidt, unamused. I have not decided what to wear. The gold trimmed or the silver? Or this, this red and green? I thought you'd decided on the gold. I had, but now I think the silver. Ah, I have it. You will wear the gold and I the silver. Nobody is going to believe we're twins, Schmidt. Schmidt condescended to giggle. He was determined, though, so I gave in. He retired modestly to the bathroom with his ensemble while I changed. It took me about forty seconds, after which I sat and cooled my heels for another ten minutes. Finally, I yelled, What the hell are you doing, Schmidt? The door opened. If I hadn't been sitting down, I would have fallen to the floor flowing robes and a headcloth that frames the face and hides a gent's bald spot make a very becoming, not to say sexy, outfit. Even short, chubby guys look dignified. The only trouble was Schmidt had dyed his mustache black. That simple statement cannot convey how ridiculous he looked. Schmidt has a fair complexion. 
It was now pink with sunburn. His eyebrows were still bushy and still white. The mustache was, well, let's say it was a serious mistake. Did I say so? I did not. I said, ach du lieber, as we say in Minnesota, Schmidt, you're a sight for sore eyes. Schmidt told me I looked gorgeous, too, but he wanted me to let my hair down. I declined. He was still arguing about it when I opened the door, just in time to see his neighbors emerging from their room. Mary looked about sixteen in another version of the basic caftan. Hers was pale yellow. It had little ribbons dangling from the bodice. The sleeves were elbow length, and the fabric was cotton, heavy and opaque. Nothing showed through it. I expected John would let himself go. He specialized in disguises, and he was something of a ham. But he wasn't even wearing a tux. Bareheaded, in his shirt sleeves and a pair of wrinkled khaki pants, he looked as scruffy as John was capable of looking. The boots gave me the clue. Ah, I said, you're disguised as an honest, hard-working field archaeologist. Very original. John was the only one who caught the veiled insult. He grinned, and Schmidt exclaimed, Sehr gut, but you need a pith helmet. S John, have you got one? Take mine. No, I insist it will complete the ensemble. Most of the other men had been unable to resist the chance to dress up. Only Ed Whitbread and the urologist Birder wore ordinary dinner jackets. Sweet and Bright sported enormous matching turbans. Herr Hamburger had a red fez set at a rakish angle, and Larry wore long robes of subdued brown. The women looked like a flock of bright birds. Susie had crammed herself into the gold sequins, Louisa into one of the gaudy embroidered gowns. That would have been bad enough, since the seams were visibly straining, but she had topped it with a construction she must have made herself. A copy of the tall crown Nefertiti wears in most of her portraits. It looks great on Nefertiti. She has a long, slim neck and no mustache. We all milled around, admiring one another's outfits and exchanging compliments, and had a few drinks, and then were summoned to the banquet. I was getting very sick and tired of the newlyweds, and I didn't feel up to watching Schmidt eat, so I approached Sweet and Bright and asked if I could join them. My other reason for wanting to join them was foiled by Susie, who decided to make the fourth at our table. Apparently, she'd set her cap for Bright. I decided he must be richer than he, or Sweet, rather, had implied. She didn't succeed in getting him to talk, but... He grinned and nodded a lot, and kept trying to tear his eyes from her décolletage. It was, I had to admit, a remarkable sight. I tried once to introduce an interesting subject, but when I mentioned Ali, Sweet frowned and shook his head. Yes, I had heard. It's very sad. Too sad to think about on such an evening. Have you tried the couscous, Vicky? Delicious. I tried the couscous. I don't remember what else I ate. It was all delicious. But I couldn't remember the names, even if I had been paying attention. As I wandered to and from the groaning board, I caught glimpses of Schmidt, enjoying himself as only Schmidt can. After dinner, we retired to the lounge for coffee and entertainment. Almost everyone was a little tight by that time, and they entered into the contest for best costume with childish delight. Susie tried to belly dance, and Louisa struck a pose, arms raised and bent, a la Steve Martin imitating King Tut. The prize for best men's costume went to, of all people, Larry's secretary, who had apparently been persuaded to take the evening off. He looked very authentic in Arab costume, with dark glasses and an Ibn Saud mustache under his checked headcloth. Our little musical ensemble had traded in their Western instruments for drums and pipes. They gave us a brief concert, and then Hamid, the master of ceremonies, made an announcement. We were in for a treat, it appeared. He would say no more, except that the dancer we were about to see ordinarily did not perform in public. This was a gracious gesture, a tribute to a particularly distinguished group of visitors. Faisal walked out onto the floor. 
I had never seen him in other than Western clothing. His robe was plain, light gray in color. He looked gorgeous just standing still. Then the band struck up, if that's an appropriate phrase, and he started to dance. I knew belly dancing was a bastard form, and that the classic form of the art is performed only by men. If you think a man dancing alone looks effeminate, you haven't seen Baryshnikov or any of the other great premier danseurs. In a completely different way, and in a completely different idiom, Faisal had the same power. I can't describe what he did. It involved movements of arms and body and head, sometimes graceful and gliding, sometimes forceful, almost abrupt. By the time he finished, every woman in the room was dry-mouthed, and I was thinking things I would call sexist if a man had been thinking them about me. Faisal stood still for a moment, acknowledging the applause with a slight inclination of his head. Then he held out his hands and gave us a brilliant smile. Come, who will join me? Susie was the first onto the floor. They glided around for a while, at least Faisal glided, holding her out at arm's length, only their hands touching. Graceful she wasn't, but she enjoyed herself hugely, flashing teeth almost as white as Faisal's, emitting peals of laughter when she tripped over her own feet. Sweet and bright were the next to try it. They circled solemnly, waving their arms. The effect was not at all the same. I decided I needed a cup of coffee. As I approached the dance floor, Faisal passed Susie neatly off to Bright and caught my hand. All the ladies in turn, he called, towing me onto the floor. There wasn't much I could do. He had a grip like a steel trap. I tried to be like a good sport but I could feel my face turning red. I've always been self-conscious about my height. Even when they're clumsy, little women manage to look cute. Tall women just look clumsy, period. You are very graceful, Faisal murmured, studying me as I stumbled. And you are very much a liar. I'll get you for this, Faisal. He laughed, throwing his head back. His throat was smooth and brown, corded with muscle. Have you been avoiding me? I have seen nothing of you. You've been busy. Oops, sorry. Relax. Don't fight me. You would do well if you were not so afraid. As double entendres go, it wasn't awfully subtle, especially when it was accompanied by a languishing look from those thick-lashed dark eyes. I laughed and stumbled again. Faisal smiled. Sorry, one gets into the habit. I have been busy, and social encounters on board ship present certain difficulties. We'll have some free time in Luxor. May I show you something of the city? This is a hell of a time to ask for a date, I said, trying not to trip over my own feet. Think about it. I will. Now can I sit down? Yes, certainly. It's time I gave Nefertiti a whirl. Doesn't she look frightful? I shouldn't have been out of breath, but I was. I decided what I needed was fresh air and time to regain my composure. As I headed for the open doors and the deck, I beheld an amusing little pantomime. Mary was on her feet, gesturing animatedly. I couldn't hear what she was saying. The music was too loud. But it was obvious she was trying to persuade John to dance with her. He kept shaking his head. She caught his hand and tugged at him, her face bright with laughter. He smiled and went on shaking his head. Schmidt had also been watching them. Ladies' man that he was, he sashayed up to Mary and offered his hand. They were heading for the dance floor when I went out. There were no dark corners on that deck, but I found a spot between two lamps that was relatively shadowy and leaned against the rail. It was a glorious night. The breeze cooled my flushed cheeks, and the moon, three-quarters full, cast a silvery path across the water. Lights from a village on the west bank sparkled through the trees, and more stars than I could ever recall seeing brightened the sky. Romantic as all hell, that's what it was. And there I stood, alone in the moonlight, 
wondering which of the handsome men on board was planning to cut my throat and when. Faisal might be genuinely interested in my wonderful self. Tall blondes are popular in Italy and points east. He might also be an agent of the Egyptian security police. I'd have been quite happy to believe either, and even happier to believe both. He'd kept his distance until this evening. Had that been deliberate, a precaution to prevent others from suspecting his real role? Proposing a rendezvous in Luxor might have been a way of reassuring me. It was all quite logical and completely unproven. He walked like a fog, on little cat feet. So lightly I didn't hear him, till he was right behind me. When I turned, it was too late to get away. My back was against the rail, and his arms, raised and ready, told me I wouldn't get far if I tried to run. The moon was behind him. It glimmered in his hair, but his face was in shadow. His hands gripped my upper arms and pulled me toward him. He was so quick and it was such an unexpected, damn fool gesture I didn't react in time. I tried to raise my knee, but his body pressed mine against the rail, and my fists never made it as far as his face. They were caught between my breast and his as his arm went around my shoulders and pulled me close. If you're thinking of screaming, I'd strongly advise against it, he murmured. Damn you, I whispered. What the hell do you think you're doing? Someone will see... He said something, in a voice so low and uneven, I couldn't make out the words, as his free hand slid into the open neck of my robe. Screaming was no longer an option. There wasn't enough air in my lungs. The last of my breath mingled with his as his lips forced mine apart. I couldn't free them. His fingers had moved from my breast to twist through my hair, and the pressure of his mouth held my head in the hard cradle of his hand. I knew, I had thought I knew, the strength of his hands and arms and lean body. But never before had he used it like this, uncontrolled and mindlessly demanding. Not against me. He let me go so abruptly that only the rail behind me kept me from falling and stepped back, shoving his hands in his pockets. I felt like a swimmer who'd been underwater too long, Ears ringing, lungs straining, muscles limp. Gasping and shaking, I hung on to the rail until I got my breath back. I can swear in several languages, but I couldn't think of any word in any of them that would be bad enough. How long have you been married? Two weeks? He turned slightly, lifting his shoulders in a shrug. But when he replied, his voice was harsh and unsteady. Monogamy is so dull. Why should I confine myself to one woman? She's young and pretty and madly in love. And wealthy, John said. You don't suppose I paid for those vulgar diamonds, do you? Every negative emotion I had ever felt for him, anger, contempt, hatred, loathing, boiled up in a sudden flood. My Scandinavian ancestors were prone to berserker rages, but this was the first time I'd ever experienced one. I hauled my arm back and let fly. It wasn't often I could catch John off guard, but I succeeded this time. The flat of my hand connected with a sound like a large, dry branch snapping. The impact sent pain darting clear up my arm to my shoulder. It felt wonderful. As the roaring in my ears subsided, I heard voices and laughter. The dancing must be over. People were coming out of the lounge. I didn't know whether any of them had seen us. I didn't care. My evening bag had fallen to the deck. I picked it up, took out my handkerchief, and scrubbed my mouth. John had retreated into the shadow, his hand on his cheek. I threw the handkerchief down and walked away. I didn't want to go through the lounge. I knew I looked like a gorgon, my hair straggling, my lip dripping blood, and my face set in a snarl. After blundering up a stairway marked crew only, I reached the upper deck and made it to my room, unobserved. I closed the curtains, then stripped and examined the damage. I ached in so many places it was hard to tell which hurt most. The reddened spots on my arms would be purple and black by morning. 
Nice, I thought. Mary and I could compare bruises. I made it to the bathroom just in time. Kneeling by the commode in the ultimate posture of humiliation, I faced the ugly truth. After the first split second, that kiss hadn't been one-sided. If he hadn't held my arms pinned, they would have been around him. And he'd found the rose pendant. It had been outside my dress when I reached my room. The movements of those long, deft fingers tracing the length of the chain to where the rose rested between my breasts had been prompted by curiosity and amused malice. What a boost to his ego that must have been, to find another infatuated woman wearing his trinket. One hard tug snapped the chain. I threw the ornament across the room, stepped into the shower, and turned it on full blast. I didn't hear the pounding at the door till I turned off the water. It had to be Schmidt. Nobody else would make such a racket. I might have expected he'd notice my absence and come looking for me. I swathed my dripping body and my bruises in a terry cloth robe and went to open the door. He'd continue beating on it until I did. He must have used shoe polish or some other water-soluble substance on his mustache. It had run, leaving long black streaks down his cheeks. He looked like Fu Manchu. Ah, he exclaimed, looking me over critically. You have been sick. How did you know? I know the look, said Schmidt. Let me in. I will take care of you. I sighed and stepped back. I don't need you to take care of me, Schmidt. I just need to go to bed. Yes, it is true. We must be up at dawn for the visit to Abydos. I will put you to bed. I laughed and started to protest. The laugh was a mistake. It stretched my lower lip and the cut opened up again. Schmidt's face softened, and he said, in a voice he seldom used even to me, his favorite flunky, You have done it for me, Vicky, when I was sick or hurting. Let me do something now for you. I bent my head to keep him from seeing the tears that stung my eyes. Okay, I muttered. Thanks, Schmidt. Just don't suggest a glass of beer to settle my stomach. It is very good for a weak stomach, Schmidt said seriously. However, I have something better. I will get it while you put on your nightgown, unless you would like me to help you. He gave me a giggle and a leer and trotted out without waiting for an answer. I had time to change and hide the reddening bruises before he got back. He was so sweet and solicitous, I swallowed the ghastly stuff he gave me without a whimper and accepted a sleeping pill as well. After he tucked me in, he stood by the bed looking down at me. Do you want to tell me what is wrong? I turned my head away. Nothing's wrong, Schmidt. I overindulge, that's all. Hmm, said Schmidt. Good night, Schmidt. And thanks. Schlaf wohl, Vicky. And do not worry. Farther along, we will know all about whatever it may be. He had deliberately garbled the quote to make me smile. So I smiled. He patted me clumsily on the shoulder and trotted out, leaving the bedside lamp burning. After he'd gone, I reached to turn it off. The rose pendant lay on the table, with the broken chain coiled around it like a tiny golden snake. I'd forgotten to leave a wake-up call, but Schmidt remembered. A good thing, too. I'm not used to sleeping pills and I'd have snored on until mid-morning if he hadn't telephoned to say he was on his way down. Give me half an hour, I mumbled pathetically. Fifteen minutes. Motivated by that promise, or threat, I managed to get in and out of the shower and into my clothes before he arrived. I don't have transparent garments in my wardrobe, not for day wear at any rate, so I had no trouble finding a shirt that covered the bruises, which were darkening as expected. Studying myself in the mirror, I was pleased to find that the excesses, physical and emotional, of the previous night hadn't left visible marks. And when Schmidt insisted we go down to breakfast, I agreed. 
I wanted John to see me smiling and calm, cool, collected, and contemptuous. He wasn't in the dining room. Neither was Mary. The place was only half full, so I concluded the others were breakfasting in their rooms. Alice was sitting with Faisal. They waved, and I waved, and joined Schmidt at a table as far from Alice as I could get. The less we were seen together, the safer for her. She'd be looking for her contact when we went ashore. I wondered what disguise he'd assume. Another tourist? A seller of souvenirs? A beggar? The setup was perfect for a seemingly casual encounter. The sites were swarming with people. He'd be there, I felt sure. The change in schedule must be known to the authorities, and after Ali's death, it was imperative that they reestablish contact. Schmidt stuffed himself with eggs and cornflakes and fruit and bread, and then proceeded to fill his pockets with tidbits. For the cats? Yes, said Schmidt when I asked. And the poor dogs. Ah, oh, Vicky, it is sad to see. Faisal interrupted the speech, stopping by our table on his way out to warn us we'd better hurry. Don't forget a hat, Vicky. We are farther south, and the sun is hot. I hoped that was a hint. But after I had dashed upstairs and opened the safe, nothing was there that hadn't been there the night before. Maybe it was a hint of another kind? And maybe it wasn't a hint of any kind. After deliberating for a few seconds, I put the gun into my bag. Most of the passengers had assembled. After all that time cruising, even the lazy bones were ready to go ashore. Schmidt had cornered Larry, ignoring his winks and nods. I joined Anna Blessington. She looked cute as a button, eyes bright in her wrinkled face, a broad-brimmed straw hat tied under her chin with a jaunty bow. The hands resting on her stick were mottled with age spots and twisted with arthritis. If she was a crook or a secret agent, I'd turn in my Sherlock Holmes badge. Did you enjoy the party last night? I asked. Yes, it was splendid, wasn't it? She grinned, producing an even more astonishing set of wrinkles. Especially Faisal's dancing. To think, I am the only female whom he has held in his arms. I'm thinking of spraining my ankle, I admitted. You don't have to resort to such painful expedients, my dear. She hoisted herself to her feet and reached unselfconsciously for my arm. Just so we get down the gangplank, if you don't mind. It's a bit steep. The ancient cemeteries and the temples that served them are in the desert. We had a long ride through the cultivated fields in the town of Hamadi. The children were on their way to school. I was pleased to see girls among them, modestly clad in long-sleeved, dark robes, their heads covered with white kerchiefs. Older women all wore black. Stalls along the street sold a variety of goods, from fruit and vegetables to cheap plastic dishes. After we left the town, we drove through fields of cabbages and sugar cane. The road, paved but narrow, bordered a canal. We roared past donkeys loaded with reeds, and rusty trucks loaded with pots, and turbaned men riding bicycles, and another tourist bus. The area outside the entrance to the archaeological enclosure was a modern disaster. Rows of stalls selling film and souvenirs, a couple of coffee shops with rows of rusting tables and chairs outside. Faisal raced around like a border collie, shepherding us into a compact group, and assuring Susie who kept trying to break away and head for the souvenirs, that she would have a chance to spend her money after we had seen the temple. He lost Schmidt when we started up the ramp to the entrance. Looking back, I saw my boss surrounded by lean dogs and peremptory cats. Handing Anna over to Faisal, I went back to him. For heaven's sake, Schmidt, come on. Faisal has the tickets. Schmidt had emptied his pockets of food. His stricken face was turned toward a child who sat on a low wall nearby. The kid's hand was out, and he was whining for bakshish. He had only one leg. Oh, Vicky. I know, Schmidt, I know. Come on. One moment only. He trotted toward the boy and filled the outstretched hand with crumpled bills. 
That wasn't as generous as it sounds, since Egyptian currency consists mainly of paper money, the smallest being worth approximately ten cents. But I don't think Schmidt looked at the numbers on the bills. He's a volatile old guy, though, and he cheered up after we got inside. There are those who consider the Abydos temples the most beautiful in Egypt, and I wouldn't argue with them. Some of the other tourist favorites, Dendera, El Kab, Philae, are better preserved, but they date from the Greek or Ptolemaic period, a thousand years later. Abydos is 19th dynasty, one of the high points of Egyptian art. Schmidt hauled out his camera and took pictures of everything. Then he forced it on me and made me take pictures of him in front of everything. Then he forced it on Bright, who happened to be nearby, and made Bright take pictures of both of us in front of, well, practically everything. By the time we reached the inner courtyard, he'd used up the first roll of film and retired behind a pillar to reload. I took advantage of his absence to escape, not only from Schmidt's obsession with snapshots, but from the others. Faisal was lecturing. I didn't want to hear a lecture. I just wanted to look. Some of the others had wandered off, too. I saw Alice going up the steps that led into the hypostyle hall, and John and Mary, hand in hand, following her. Bright and sweet were nowhere around. Perched on a low foundation wall of cut stone, I sat soaking it all in and trying not to think about what Alice might be doing. I sincerely hoped she was doing it, but I didn't want to think about it. After a while, Faisal led the group into the pillared hall. I went on sitting. It was hot, but not unbearably so. The square pillars of the vestibule opposite were decorated with the mighty form of Pharaoh being greeted by various gods. Exposed as these were, they had lost most of the paint that had once covered them. I tipped my hat so it shaded my eyes and relaxed. Gradually, the voices of guides lecturing in six different languages faded into an agreeable background hum, and somehow I wasn't at all surprised to see that the reliefs were now bright with fresh paint, the king's body and limbs red-brown, his crown a soft blue, his collar and bracelets picked out with turquoise and gold. One of the painted figures stepped out of the pillar. He wasn't wearing a crown, and his hair was pale gold, not black. Raising one eyebrow at me in distant acknowledgment, he turned and began removing objects from the wall. They solidified and took on dimension in his hands. Jeweled with beaded collars, heavy bracelets, golden cups, bowls and containers. There you are. I shook the sleep from my eyes and looked up. The figure standing over me wasn't wearing a white kilt and beaded collar, but dust-colored pants and shirt. Larry gave me a tentative smile. Sorry to disturb you. It's a good thing you did. I was about to fall over. Some of us are going to have a look at the old kingdom tombs, Larry explained. Anton thought you might want to come along. The first dynasty royal tombs? I thought nothing remained of them. Nothing worth visiting, no. But there are tombs of all periods here. And this was one of the holiest places in Egypt the legendary site of the Tomb of Osiris. Last year, an expedition from Boston located a new cemetery of Fourth Dynasty burials. Normally, tourists aren't allowed, but I happen to know the chap in charge, and... He broke off, eyeing me doubtfully. But perhaps only an enthusiast like myself would be interested. He looked like a little boy whose mom had rejected his offering of a toad or a garter snake. Close your eyes and think of the National Museum, I told myself. The tombs must be mastabas, like the ones at Saqqara. The superstructures were all above ground. If anybody invited me to visit the sunken burial chamber, I would politely decline. I'd love to, I said. We were a select group, as it turned out. Ed Whitbread was present, of course. He trailed Larry and me at a discreet distance. Sweet and bright had also joined us. Where's Schmidt? I asked, turning to look back as we started off across the sandy wasteland. Eating cats, I expect, Larry said. Shall we go back for him? He may have changed his mind. He's easily distracted, I admitted. 
Wait a minute, here comes... No, it's Faisal. The sun was in my eyes, or I wouldn't have made that mistake. Faisal soon caught up with us. He was frowning. Sir, the bus will be leaving in an hour. Where? Larry explained. I'd have asked you to join us, Faisal, but I thought you had to stay with the group. Faisal's scowl changed to a look of bright-eyed interest. It wasn't directed at me. I kept forgetting he was a trained Egyptologist. They are now buying souvenirs and cold drinks. I haven't had a chance to see the excavations, so I will join you if you don't mind. He fell tactfully behind, leaving me to Larry, who proceeded to tell me all about the old kingdom tombs. I must say it made a pleasant change to have a man flex his mind instead of his muscles to impress me. It was also a pleasant change to leave the crowds behind. An ambitious guide trotted along with us until Larry dismissed him with a curt Arabic phrase. We'd been walking for ten minutes when he gestured. There it is. I looked around for walls and cut stone. All I could see was a low mound up ahead. A sinking feeling came over me as I realized I had made a slight error. Anything that had been above ground in 2000-plus B.C. would be under it now, buried by encroaching sand. I followed Larry up the slope of the mound and cheered up when I saw below me not a dark, sinister hole in the ground, but a large pit open to the sky. It was paved with stone, and there were a few stretches of wall, none of them over a meter high. In front of one such stretch squatted a tan bundle, which unfolded into a man. Sorry, folks, nobody's allowed, he began. Then his narrow face relaxed. Mr. Blankiron, I heard you were in Egypt, but I didn't expect you'd honor us with a visit. Hope we're not interrupting anything. Larry offered me his hand, and we scrambled down into the excavation. Having lots of money makes one welcome in all social circles. The excavator would have kicked Cleopatra out of his bed to welcome the rich patron of archaeological excavations. He greeted Faisal by name, invited the rest of us to call him Ralph, and apologized feverishly for the fact that nothing particularly interesting was going on. The men are off today, he explained. It's Friday. Pat'll be sorry to have missed you. He's gone to Luxor to work at the library at Chicago House. He showed us some of the reliefs. They were fragmentary but very beautiful, delicate low reliefs like the ones at Saqqara. He and Larry went off into a spate of technical discussion, and before long, Sweet said he thought he and Bright would go back. Larry looked at his watch. Yes, go ahead. Tell them we'll be along shortly. I'd like to have a quick look at the burial chamber. He produced a huge flashlight from his pocket. No need for that, sir, Ralph said proudly. We've run a wire and stuck up a few light bulbs. I'll turn them on, shall I? From the northwest corner of the pit, a gently sloping ramp led down. It was low-ceilinged, but fairly well lit by a series of bare bulbs. I followed Larry and Ralph until we got to the dreaded, anticipated hole in the ground. The top of a rough wooden ladder showed at the edge of the shaft. Somebody called from up above, and Ralph said, Damn, I'd better go see. He scrambled back up the ramp. Larry, already on the ladder, looked up at me, and for once in my life, I decided to be sensible instead of foolhardy. Sorry, I can't... I tried to keep my voice steady, but I didn't succeed. Larry looked startled. Why, Vicky, I had no idea. Is that what was bothering you when we were in the royal tomb at Amarna? I thought you looked. We'll go back. I don't have to do this. No, you go ahead. I'll wait for you here. If you're sure. His head sank down out of sight. I thought the scream, high and piercing as a bird's call, had come from Larry until he echoed it. His startled cry was followed by a rattle and a crash. The lights went out. There was daylight behind me, only thirty feet away, a bright, heavenly square of brightness. I could crawl up the ramp and leave Larry down below in the dark. 
the ladder must have broken. He'd fallen from it. How far? I heard a faint groan. It died into silence. Did I mention that I shared that tunnel under the Schloss in Rotenburg with two other people, both of them injured? One of them was Tony, once my significant other, still my cherished friend. The groan from the darkness shot me back into the past, and for a few horrible moments I lost track of where I was and when I was. I thought it was Tony down there, unconscious, gasping for breath. I had to go to him, help him. I didn't. I couldn't. I rolled myself into a ball like a reluctant fetus, and when the daylight behind me was blotted out, I started to whimper. Chapter 7 Hands took hold of me and tried to unwind me. I fought them frantically until it dawned on me that there was something familiar about that grip. Tony, I croaked. Oh, Tony, damn it, I thought you were... He slapped me, hard. After my head had settled back onto my neck, I squinted up at him. It wasn't Tony, of course it wasn't. Tony was in Chicago, not in that filthy tunnel under the Schloss. Neither was I. I was in Egypt, in a filthy tunnel in a tomb, with... You bastard! I said feebly. How pitifully inadequate. John hauled me to my feet and propped me against the wall, out of his way. Leaning over the shaft, he called, Blenkiron, speak up. Don't be shy. The voice echoed hollowly. I'm okay. You'll have to get a rope. The ladder... Hang on. What are you doing here? I demanded. John turned to me. I couldn't make out his features. The only light came from the top of the ramp, and even that distant illumination dimmed as people crowded around the opening, spouting agitated questions and exclamations. I sensed rather than saw the movement when his raised arm fell to his side. I had hit him a lot harder than he had hit me. Apparently he'd decided not to even things up with a second slap. Too many people watching. You have a positive genius for irrelevance, he remarked. Come on, up you go. Can you walk or shall I drag you? I couldn't walk. The roof was too low. So I crawled as fast as I could, leaving John calmly discussing the situation with Larry. I emerged from the opening to find myself in the middle of a flight, if one can use that word to describe an altercation between a fat, elderly midget and a tall, muscular man. Ed had Schmidt in a close embrace, and Schmidt was pounding on his back and yelling in Mittelhochdeutsch, his favorite language for swearing. Cut it out, you little lunatic, Ed said. His breathing wasn't even fast. Here she comes, safe and sound. He released Schmidt. Schmidt darted at me. Vicky, are you all right? I was trying to get to you. Stop squeezing me, Schmidt. I'm fine. But I didn't try to free myself. It felt good to be held by someone who loved me. Over the top of Schmidt's head, I saw other members of our group in various poses of curiosity and concern. Faisal clutched Susie's voluptuous form. Her eyes were closed, but I doubted she was unconscious. One of her arms was draped around Faisal's neck. Pale and shaken, Mary leaned against a wall. She wasn't as pale as the young archaeologist, who had just seen his hopes of a generous contribution go up in smoke. It is difficult to win the heart of a potential donor after he's fallen down a shaft. I don't understand how it could have happened, he insisted. The ladder was perfectly sound. We've been up and down it a hundred times. Oh, oh, thank God, Mr. Blankiron. Are you all right? Just a few bruises. Followed closely by John, Larry emerged from the tunnel. He was dusty and sweaty and disheveled, but he didn't seem to be damaged. It wasn't your fault, 
he went on sheepishly. The ladder is intact. I guess my foot slipped when the lights went out. And someone screamed. Probably Susie. Faisal lowered her unceremoniously to the ground. She promptly opened her eyes and muttered, Where am I? Nobody told her. It's fortunate that no one was injured, said Faisal, in a voice that reminded me he was responsible for the safety and well-being of the group. Did they dock his pay for every tourist he lost? If so, he was already out a few bucks on account of Jen. Had she really left Cairo? I had only John's word for it, and I wouldn't have relied on that if he had assured me the world was round. Urged on by Faisal, we started back to the bus. Nobody asked why the power had failed. Apparently that sort of thing happened all the time. It was probably just an odd coincidence that it had happened after Vicky Bliss, the well-known phobic, had crawled down into a tomb. If I hadn't balked at the last minute, I might have been on the ladder when it happened. There were only two people who knew about my phobia. I thank God I hadn't made an abject fool of myself in front of Larry. He had realized I was uncomfortable, but he wasn't aware of the disgusting performance I had put on. My vocal reaction had been in the form of whimpers rather than screams. My eyes focused on John, who was ahead of us. Mary was clinging to his arm. They hadn't been part of the original expedition. They, and Susie and the others, must have accompanied Schmidt. John could have managed it, a yank at the electric wire that snaked around the wall. Another warning, designed to inflict emotional rather than physical damage. It was a low-down, filthy trick to pull on a person under any circumstances, the circumstances under which John had learned of this particular Achilles' heel, made the trick even filthier. Schmidt looked up at me. You are very red in the face, Vicky. Is it the sunburn? No, Schmidt. It's not sunburn. The boat got underway as soon as we boarded. We were due in Luxor next day. I could hardly wait. By hell or high water, hook or crook, I was going to get myself into the presence of an actual, living, unmistakable policeman or a member of state security investigation and demand to know what was going on. The situation was coming apart like a soggy paper towel, and I must be losing my touch. I hadn't suspected Ali or spotted Alice until she declared herself. I was beginning to wonder about Sweet and Bright. If they were supposed to be protecting me, they had screwed up at least twice. And I hadn't the faintest idea who John's confederates might be. Not that my past record was all that good. On several memorable occasions, I hadn't identified the criminal until he pointed a gun at me. Alice and I managed to exchange a few words. They were, I hear you had a little adventure, Vicky. Good thing no one was hurt. To which I replied, Yes, isn't it? And to which she responded with, Here's that book on the Memphis tombs I promised to lend you. There were no messages written in invisible ink or spelled out by means of dots or pinpricks under certain words. What there was was a note, hastily scribbled in pencil and stuck in between the pages. He was there. Promised we'll be contacted as soon as we get to Luxor. Said to lie low. Take no action. Stay in a crowd. Ali died of drowning. All bruises post-mortem, except for one on his face. Could have hit his head. Knocked himself out. Fallen overboard. Suggest you don't think about the alternative. It was a P.S., Burn this and flush the ashes down the nearest convenience. I would have done it anyhow. As I watched the ashes being sucked down with the swirling water, I thought about the alternative. After lunch, Schmidt and I settled ourselves on the sun deck. Schmidt started writing postcards. He'd already sent them to everybody he knew, and he couldn't understand why I wasn't doing the same. At least to your mama and papa, he insisted. Here, here is a pretty one of the pyramids, and one of Cairo for Tony. I took them, 
to shut him up. It was a little difficult composing appropriate messages. Having a wonderful time was not only trite but untrue. As for wish you were here, I could only thank God they weren't. Yet as I scribbled a witty greeting on Tony's card, Hi, guess where I am? Part of me, the selfish, cowardly part, wished he were. Here. This was the first time I'd been completely on my own, with no one to talk to, argue with, or fall back on. Schmidt hadn't been particularly useful during the Roman affair, but he had been aware of what I was doing, and toward the end of that business, John and I had become reluctant allies. We'd spent most of our time together trying to elude various people who wanted to kill either or both of us. But when you're running wildly away from killers, it's nice to have company. John was awfully good at running away. Stretched out in the chair next to mine, Schmidt had tipped his hat over his eyes and dozed off. His hands were clasped on his tummy, and the ends of his mustache fluttered every time he exhaled. The sight of him, vulnerable and lovable and harmless as a baby, was like a cold shower, clearing my head and bringing my thoughts into focus. I had to get Schmidt out of this. I had to get myself out, too. I'd been a fool to consent to such a dangerous scheme, even if I hadn't realized how dangerous it was going to be, and an even bigger fool to go on with it after I spotted John. I'd done the job I'd agreed to do, and my mysterious employers hadn't kept their part of the bargain. They'd let Schmidt get away. The hell with the Cairo Museum. I wouldn't have traded a square inch of Schmidt's bald scalp for the entire contents of the museum. The hell with security, too. I didn't have to flap around like a wounded duck until somebody condescended to contact me. Or until somebody else drowned me in my bathtub and threw me overboard. As soon as we reached Luxor, I'd call Carl Fader and hand in my resignation. I'd have done it that minute if it had been possible to make a direct call. I didn't trust anybody anymore, and that included the radio operator. It was amazing how much better I felt once I'd made that decision. I could even enjoy the scenery. The cliffs of the high desert bounded the river on either side. Even in bright sunlight, they were a pale, ethereal, pinky yellow. At some places, they rose sheer from the water's edge. Elsewhere, they fell back, leaving a narrow strip of cultivable land. Little clusters of brown mud-brick houses were framed by green crops and palm trees. Birds flapped and swooped, and beds of blue water hyacinths glided past, floating flowery islands in the stream. I waved back at a group of children gathered along the bank, but my mind kept wandering. The greatest difficulty would be to talk Schmidt into cutting the trip short. I toyed with wild ideas— a fake telegram announcing that the museum was on fire, or that a family member had fallen ill? Nah, that wouldn't work. He'd telephone and discover the truth. Anyhow, it would be cruel to scare him. We were to be in Luxor for four days. There wasn't a prayer of getting Schmidt away until after he'd seen the famous tomb. I was rather keen on seeing it myself. Maybe, I thought, hopefully, the cops were waiting on the key at Luxor to round up the bad guys. Maybe John would call the whole thing off. Maybe Schmidt would get sick. A lot of tourists get sick. Maybe I'd get sick. Maybe I could pretend to be sick and insist that Schmidt take me home to Munich. Maybe the mummy of Tutankhamun would rise up out of its coffin and blast the villains with a supernatural curse. Oh, hell, I muttered. Schmidt stirred. Was hast du gesagt? Nothing. How about faking a nervous breakdown? I shouldn't have any trouble doing that. Schmidt pushed his hat back and sat up. Brotzeit, he announced. Sure enough, it was. The stewards were setting out the tea things. Awake or sleeping, Schmidt always knows when it's time to eat. If he ever sinks into a deep coma, I figure I can bring him out of it by waving a donut under his nose. The passengers, who had been elsewhere, started to assemble. I was greedily collecting cookies when Perry joined me at the buffet. He was looking a little peaked, and when I recommended the chocolate wafers, he grimaced and said he thought he'd better stick to tea. I noticed you didn't go ashore this morning, I said. 
Are you okay? I hadn't noticed, actually. Perry wasn't one of those people who are conspicuous by their absence, but I thought it would be polite to say so. He hesitated. I decided he was torn between his desire for sympathy and his reluctance to admit he was no more immune to common weakness than any inferior tourist. Just a touch of stomach trouble, he said finally. There's a lot of it going around. It's never happened to me before, Perry said pettishly. And I've eaten in places tourists are warned away from. Someone in the kitchen must have been careless. There are some ailments that bring out the worst in people who don't suffer from them. I licked chocolate off my lower lip and took another big bite. They say it happens to everybody sooner or later, I said heartlessly. Several people have been sick. Anna and the hamburgers and... Who? Oh, Perry laughed politely. A joke. They are suffering from the usual tourist complaint. That's not my problem. I haven't actually uh, been sick, just a little queasy. My temperature is normal, but my pulse. What are you lecturing about this evening? I had intended to offer him a little sympathy with his tea, but I really didn't want to hear a list of unpleasant symptoms. The Valley of the Kings. That's where you'll be going tomorrow morning. But Alice has kindly offered to speak in my place. It's essential that I take care of myself. I must attend the reception tomorrow evening. Larry made a point of inviting me. Everybody had been invited. An uncharacteristic wave of kindness stopped me from saying so. Poor devil. He couldn't help being a bore. I wanted desperately to get away from him, but I couldn't think how to manage it without hurting his feelings. My eyes kept wandering. Schmidt had cut Larry out of the herd, and Alice had joined them at their table. They seemed to be having a good time, laughing and talking animatedly. John and Mary were standing at the rail, their shoulders touching. Near them, but obviously not with them, were bright and... just bright. I realized I'd never seen one without the other. Where was Sweet? Could Bright be forced into conversation, lacking his interpreter? Perry was rambling on about various boring things, all of which he claimed he could do better than anybody else. Not that I couldn't handle the job, you understand. Anyone can be an administrator, but field archaeology and lecturing require special... Right, I said wondering vaguely what I had agreed with. Shouldn't you rest now? You must take care of yourself. As soon as he'd gone, I made a beeline for Bright. No need for subtlety here. My first question was one anyone might have asked. Where's your buddy? Not sick, I hope. Bright considered the question. After a moment, he nodded gravely. Sick. I'm so sorry. Has the doctor seen him? Bright nodded and smiled. Is there anything I can do? Bright shook his head and shrugged. Are you all right? Bright nodded and smiled. I had a feeling that if I kept asking questions, the process would keep repeating itself. Nod and smile, shake head and shrug, nod and smile. The man wasn't mute. He had spoken. One word in a soft, hesitant voice the voice of someone who has a painful speech defect, a lisp or a stutter, who has to choose his words with care. Or someone who's trying to conceal the fact that he can't speak the language that is supposed to be his native tongue. He had to risk it once more. He couldn't just walk away without a word. His excuse me was accompanied by another smile and another nod. I watched him cross the deck, nodding and smiling at people until he'd vanished inside. I suppose he'd gotten tired of sitting with his sick friend and came out for a breath of air and a change of scene. Careless of him to risk it, though. The last two words had been articulated with a precision no native speaker of the language would employ. I had assumed he wasn't really a manufacturer from Milwaukee, but I would have expected a professional undercover agent to be smart enough to assume a credible persona. Yes, I definitely had to talk to somebody who knew what was going on. I sure as hell didn't. When I went back to Schmidt, I found him entertaining again. 
John was actually taking notes. Hillbilly, he repeated, writing it down. Das ist recht. It means... I'm vaguely familiar with the term. Then the Western element. Yes, the cowboys. A pessimistic group of individuals. Schmidt illustrated the theme. Do not bury me on the lonesome prairie. There the coyotes. A variety of jackals with loud voices. Howl. And the wind blows free. Yes, I've got that. It does have a lugubrious quality, doesn't it? But the most romantic of the prison and the railroad songs. I said before I could stop myself. Romantic? All those dying pillows, John murmured. Schmidt continued the lecture with vocal illustrations. How Mary stood it, I couldn't imagine. She had to be tone deaf as well as infatuated. Finally, I took pity on her and tried to change the subject. Where is everybody? It's a beautiful day. You'd think there would be more people on deck. On their dying pillows, no doubt, John said. The pharaoh's curse has struck. The rest of us will probably be in the same state before we reach Luxor. What do you mean? I demanded. Hadn't you heard? He turned slightly, facing me. The refrigeration apparatus is broken down. Perfect conditions for Tomain. I didn't bother to ask how he knew. Once such rumors start, they spread quickly, especially in a small, closed society like ours. By the time the group reassembled for drinks and the evening lecture, Hamid felt it necessary to make a public announcement. It was true, as we had heard, that the refrigeration had failed and that efforts to repair it had been unsuccessful. However, there was not the slightest danger of food poisoning. As those of us who had experienced prolonged power failures knew, the freezers would remain cold for hours and we'd be in Luxor by morning. Any food served that evening, and the chef, said Hamid, with one of his largest smiles, was preparing a veritable feast, would be perfectly safe. When he finished, there was some grumbling, most of it from our habitual complainers. Alice, who had replaced Hamid on the podium, added a few sentences of reassurance before beginning her lecture. She was a much better speaker than Perry, enlivening the facts with personal reminiscences and funny stories. Cued by Schmidt's rumbling chuckles, I laughed in all the right places, but I have to admit I didn't pay proper attention. Just when I thought I had come to a sensible, sane decision, something happened to make me question it. Could I have been mistaken about sweet and bright? The answer to that was depressingly obvious. The corollary was equally depressing. They were the only ones to whom I had spoken about John. Several little reels of tape were jostling around in my bag at this very moment. I hadn't left them in the safe. I kept telling myself there was nothing incriminatory on those tapes. Only a series of rude remarks from John and feeble rejoinders from me. But I knew I was kidding myself, and I knew why. I knew it was high time I stopped behaving like a fool. John claimed he was opposed to violence, but either he had changed his views or he was mixed up with people who didn't share them. Ali had been murdered. I was as certain of that as if I'd seen it done. I wasn't at all happy about the failure of the refrigeration, either. Machinery is always breaking down. At least my machines are always breaking down. And this damage seemed, on the surface, quite harmless. But our schedule had already been altered once, and this might necessitate an even more drastic change, if the coolers couldn't be repaired. The lights went on and I hastily rearranged my features into an expression of smiling interest. Alice started taking questions. As I might have expected, the first one was about the curse of Tutankhamun. Pure coincidence, said Alice. Lord Carnarvon had cut himself shaving and blood poisoning had set in, followed by pneumonia. The others who had worked on the tomb with him had lived to ripe old ages. She reeled off names and dates with the assurance of someone who's been asked the question dozens of times before. Morbidly, I wondered whether tourists fifty years from now would be discussing the hideous doom that had fallen upon the passengers of the Queen of the Nile 
and the sad fate of Victoria Bliss, cut off in her prime by an unfortunate coincidence. Everybody went to bed early that night. We were supposed to disembark at 6.45 for our visit to the Valley of the Kings. The group that gathered in the lobby next morning was greatly diminished. Only a dozen passengers, plus Alice and Faisal. Oh, and Perry. Sweet and Bright were not among them. John and Mary were among them. So was Susie, somewhat to my surprise. I'd have expected her to spend the whole day primping for the grand reception that evening. Subtle questioning on my part elicited the information that the missing persons were all alive and undamaged. Some were suffering from the conventional complaints. Others had decided not to take the long, tiring trek. I'd been tempted to skip the tour, too. A hasty glance at the itinerary had reminded me that several of the tombs we were to visit were described as deep. I had acquired a violent aversion to tombs in general, never mind deep tombs. But when I called Schmidt, hoping against hope he would be suffering from tummy trouble, he informed me he was on his way to breakfast and demanded I hurry up. So I hurried. Schmidt was determined to go ashore, and I couldn't let him go alone. Before I left my room, I collected the reels of tape and locked them in my safe. The itinerary had reminded me of something else I'd forgotten, the lay of the land. The modern city of Luxor is on the east bank of the Nile. The Valley of the Kings and the other ancient cemeteries are on the west bank. The boat had landed us on the west bank. It would then cross the river and moor, along with the other tourist steamers, and we would take the ferry across to rejoin the others in time for lunch. That meant I'd have to wait till afternoon before calling Carl or attempting to locate police headquarters. The rising sun, behind us as we left the boat, turned the western cliffs an exquisite shade of deep rose. The air was cool and would have been fresh had it not been for a couple of dozen tour buses belching out pollution. Faisal shepherded us toward one of them. As we stood in line waiting to climb on, I managed to draw Alice aside. I've decided to resign, I muttered. I'm about to. I asked how. Someone will contact me this afternoon, Luxor Temple. I'm going to stamp my little foot and demand. She broke off. The others had boarded the bus, and Faisal was gesturing at us. Schmidt had saved me a seat. He insisted I take the one next to the window so I could see the sights, which he described in a loud voice as we drove on. The man's memory was absolutely astonishing. By his own admission, he hadn't been in Egypt for ten years, but he hadn't forgotten a thing. The drive took about fifteen minutes through the cultivated fields and across the barren desert. We were headed straight for the cliffs. Then a cleft opened up. The road curved and passed through into the desolate valley where for centuries the kings of the empire had been buried. Schmidt rumbled on, spouting statistics and historical data. Louisa, brooding among her veils, was sitting across the aisle. She interrupted Schmidt's lecture to say, What of the tomb of the great queen of Nefertari? No, no, that is not on today's tour, Schmidt explained tolerantly. It is in the Valley of the Queens, so-called. Now this, he went on without drawing breath, this has changed since my last visit. The new parking place is some distance from the tombs, which is a very good thing since the buses cause much damage. This tram on which we will ride the rest of the way is electric. I wondered what the place looked like when tourism was at its height. It was bad enough now. A dozen buses, hundreds of people. As we got off the tram and trudged along a dusty path following Faisal, Schmidt said, in the loud mumble he thinks is a whisper, How is with you, Vicky? Will it be too difficult, descending into the depths of... That's why we're here, isn't it? I wouldn't have come if I couldn't handle it. My sharp tone didn't offend him. Nodding sympathetically, he took my arm. I will be next to you at all times. There will be bright lights, many people. The first tomb was the easiest. It was also the one I didn't want to miss. 
Tutankhamun's tomb had been closed to tourists in the past. Like most of the others in the valley, its wall paintings were deteriorating. In itself, the small tomb was relatively unimpressive. Unlike the long, complex structures designed for royal burials, this one had only a flight of stairs and a single corridor, with a few rooms at its end. The accepted theory was that Tutankhamun had died suddenly at the age of 18, before he had had time to prepare his tomb, so it had been necessary to take over a tomb previously constructed for a non-royal person. Murder, said Faisal, in a sepulchral voice as we gathered around him. Was that how the young king died? The fracture of his skull might have been the result of a fatal accident, but he had many enemies and no heirs. The great stone box of the sarcophagus stood in the middle of the room. Tut's mummy still lay there, decently hidden. It had been in ruinous condition. His golden coffins were now in the Cairo Museum. Involuntarily, I looked at John, who was contemplating the sarcophagus with a look of pensive interest. Surely not even he would try. One of the damned coffins was of solid 22-carat gold, weighing almost 300 pounds. You'd need a block and tackle just to lift the thing. But there were hundreds of other objects, all easily portable, that would be worth his time and trouble. The four small rooms of the tomb had been stuffed with objects of artistic and historic value. They were empty now, except for the sarcophagus and the poor, battered bones of the boy himself. Eighteen years old, childless, possibly murdered. Schmidt pulled out his handkerchief and blew his nose. He's disgustingly sentimental. We retraced our steps, twenty-five paces, I'd counted them, along the passage and up the stairs. Sixteen of them, I'd counted them, too. But it hadn't bothered me, not with lights all along the way and Schmidt snuffling sentimentally beside me. After we had emerged into daylight, the custodian swung the doors shut and locked them, to the audible annoyance of several loose tourists hanging around in the hope of getting in. The tomb must be officially closed. In this, as in other ways, our group had been favored. Schmidt started fussing at me again when we reached the next of the tombs on our list, that of Amenhotep II. It was one of the ones the guidebook had described as deep, and Schmidt kept insisting I ought not attempt it. He was talking loudly, as usual, and if there was anyone in the group who hadn't known about my phobia, they knew now. Don't be silly, Schmidt, I said. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Down, down, down we went, and if you think I wasn't counting, you are dead wrong. The stairs led down, all the corridors sloped down, and just when I thought we had reached the bottom, there was another flight of stairs, leading down, in case you are wondering, and another downward sloping passage. The square pillars in the last room were painted and inscribed. That's about all I remember. I was too busy keeping an expression of insouciant calm on my face. Other sources of discomfort aside, it was hot and close and very dusty down in the depths. By the time we started back up, Schmidt's face was bright red, and I didn't like the way he was panting. Slowing my steps to match his, stopping frequently to rest, I forgot my own qualms and concern for him. I knew he'd never admit weakness, and I could have kicked Faisal when he said solicitously, Perhaps, Herr Doctor, you had better go to the rest house and have a cool drink instead of attempting the next tomb. That of Horemheb is the deepest in the valley. The air is not good, and the heat. Schmidt almost choked in his attempt to stop wheezing. Before he could protest, I said, I don't care what you do, Schmidt, but I'm copping out. Where's the rest house? Everybody voted for the rest house, so we returned to the entrance and got on to one of the cars of the tram. The sun was now high enough to bleach all the color from the cliffs, turning them a pale tan. Not that there was much color to begin with, only the clear blue sky overhead and the garish garb of some of the tourists. Schmidt was on his second lemonade. He wanted beer, but I wouldn't let him have it. When Larry, with whom I had been discussing tomb reliefs, broke off in mid-sentence. With a murmured, excuse me, he rose and headed for the door. 
Schroeder, hat in hand, bald head shining with sweat, awaited him. I thought it was a little odd that the man hadn't joined us, and I wasn't the only one to wonder. Everyone stopped talking and stared. Everyone except John. After a quick glance at Schroeder, he leaned back and lowered his eyes. He hadn't spoken since we sat down. After a few minutes, Schroeder left, and Larry returned, shaking his head and smiling. He takes his duties too seriously, as I keep telling him. Some unimportant detail about tonight's reception. How long has he been with you? I asked guilelessly. Let's see. He turned to the omnipresent Ed. How long's it been? A couple of years? About that. Ed returned to his beer. He wasn't much of a conversationalist. If Ed could remember when Schroeder signed on, he'd been with Larry even longer than two years. I reminded myself that I was no longer interested in details like that. Schmidt polished off another lemonade and two candy bars and announced he was ready to resume the tour. I was trying to think of a way of talking him out of it when Larry said, It's too nice a day to spend underground. How about taking the path to Deir el Batri, Vicky? It's in the bay south of here, over that range of hills, and the view of the temple from above is wonderful. The bus could pick us up there, couldn't it, Faisal? Faisal nodded, and Schmidt exclaimed, Good, good, an excellent idea. I will come too. But, Herr Director, Faisal protested, it is a long, hard walk, forty-five minutes. He eyed Schmidt's rotund shape dubiously and added, Or longer. What was more, Schmidt hadn't been invited. I didn't waste my breath mentioning this. The walk might be the lesser of two evils. It couldn't be more taxing for Schmidt than the hot, dusty airlessness of the tombs. We'll take it easy, Larry said, with a reassuring nod at me. An enticing prospect, said John. I'll join you if I may. Yes, a walk would be lovely, Mary said eagerly. No, he turned to her. It would be too strenuous for you, in your condition. Mary's jaw dropped and a charming blush spread over her face. I don't know what my face looked like, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't charming. Anyone else? Larry asked, after a moment of embarrassed silence. All right, then. We'll see you all later. Ed hadn't said a word, but I wasn't surprised to find him making up one of our party. He tried to give Schmidt a hand during the first and most difficult part of the hike, the steep climb up from the valley, but was huffily rebuffed. Once we reached the top, Schmidt mopped his perspiring brow and gasped triumphantly. Ha! Such a fuss you make over a little walk! If you had climbed the Zugspitze and the Matterhorn! His breath gave out so he left it there, and we all looked impressed, except John, who was grinning like an idiot. We admired the view for longer than it deserved to give Schmidt time to recover, and Larry pointed out the locations of other tombs. Pale in the sunlight, the great pyramid-shaped peak called the Lady of the West rose over the valley it guarded. The next part of the walk led across the rocky summit of the plateau, the path was rough but level, and Schmidt charged valiantly ahead. John kept pace with him. I started to quicken my step. Larry took my arm. I want to talk to you, Vicky. That's why I suggested this. I glanced over my shoulder. Ed was some distance behind, hands in his pockets. What about? I asked. Larry lowered his voice. About a mutual friend. His name is Burkhardt. I stumbled over a stone no bigger than a ping-pong ball. Larry's hand steadied me. Sorry, you didn't know. I don't know a damn thing, I sputtered. That son of a polecat burk... Let's not mention the name again, okay? Don't get the wrong idea, Vicky. His face wrinkled in an attractive, deprecating smile. I haven't been leading a double life like some superhero in the comics... I was informed of the situation by the Egyptian government. They know how intensively I've worked for better relations between Egypt and the West, and how deeply I care about the wonderful antiquities of this country. 
The announcement I will make this evening. Well, you'll hear that in due course. The idea that someone could use this trip as a cover for activities designed to destroy everything I've worked for. I understand. I know you do. And I can't tell you how much I... All of us appreciate what you're doing. It was for your own protection that I was told not to contact you earlier. Now things have changed. That's why Mr. Schroeder came, I said, to tell you that the refrigerating unit didn't break down, Vicky. It was a deliberate act of sabotage. It can't be repaired. It'll have to be replaced. God knows how long that'll take. The tour will have to be canceled. Hamid will make the announcement when we return at noon. You see what that means, don't you? My eyes were fixed on Schmidt, who was gesturing animatedly. A sound like the howl of a coyote drifted to my ears. I caught a few of the words. They had to do with heaven, mama, and train whistles. I'm not sure I do, I said slowly. What alternatives will the passengers be offered, aside from a refund of the fare? That, of course. But I expect most of them will choose to remain in Luxor for a few days, since this is the high point of the tour. Fortunately, or unfortunately, from the viewpoint of the tourism industry, there are plenty of hotel rooms empty. After that, he looked expectantly at me. Some may decide to return to Cairo, I muttered. Sooner or later, everybody will end up in Cairo, where the museum is. Yes. Vicky, have you any idea of who these people are? Yeah, I gestured. Him. Schmidt and John had stopped, waiting for us to join them. Not Anton, Larry exclaimed. Don't be ridiculous. Him. I couldn't pronounce his name. Mr. Tregarth? Larry sounded almost as incredulous. He slowed his steps. But he's a well-known crook. I've encountered him before. I don't know who the others are. He's the only one I recognized. Surely he wouldn't bring his pregnant bride along. Larry looked shocked. Excellent cover, wouldn't you say? I heard John laugh. Schmidt had taught him a new one. A few words floated back to me. When I woke up, I had shackles on my feet. Come, Vicky, hurry, why are you so slow? Schmidt yelled. It is a glorious view. One more thing, Larry said quickly. I want you to stay with me while you're in Luxor. I have a house here, you know. Of course I know. You're holding the reception there, right? Right. You'll be safer there than in a hotel. Anton, too, of course. Schmidt has twenty-twenty hearing. What about me? he demanded. I'll tell you later, Schmidt, I said. It's a surprise. Schmidt loves surprises. Beaming, he demanded that I admire the view. The temple of the female pharaoh, Hatshepsut, lay below, its colonnades and courtyards sharp etched by shadow and sunlight. It's probably the most graceful, perfectly proportioned structure in Egypt. I'd looked forward to seeing it. But not under these circumstances. Beside me, hands in his pockets, hair shining like silver gilt, John was humming under his breath. It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. I'm worried now, but I won't be worried long. That's what he thought.
Chapter 8 Hamid waited until we had assembled for lunch before making the announcement. There was the usual chorus of complaints from certain parties, but the sputtering and shouts of outrageous faded as Hamid went on to outline the alternatives. They were a good deal more generous than most companies would have offered. That afternoon, we would be transferred to the Winter Palace Hotel. All expenses paid, of course. After the prearranged four days in the Theban area, passengers who wished to do so could board another cruise ship for Aswan, where they would spend several days before sailing back to Luxor. They might instead opt to return to Cairo by air for a two-week stay at Mena House, or one of the four-star Cairo hotels. What do you say, Vicky? Schmidt demanded. What shall we do? Me? I vote for Cairo. Aswan is there interessant, but except for the noble's tombs. We won't have to make up our minds this minute. I couldn't take my eyes off John. His face was as bland and uninformative as an oyster as he listened to Hamid. I had no doubt what his decision would be. He'd known this would happen. He must have had a hand in arranging it. Mary was watching him, too, her expression faintly troubled. She wouldn't be consulted, but if I had been in her shoes, which, God forbid, I'd have had my own reasons for preferring Cairo. Shotgun wedding, I thought, savoring the ugly phrase. Mary's daddy must be some guy but he could never have cornered such an expert at illusion if John hadn't had his own reasons for embracing matrimony. The ripe, juicy chunk of mango I was chewing tasted like sand as the inevitable calculations reeled off in my head. At least six weeks before she could be sure, maybe longer. A few more weeks making the arrangements for the wedding? Months. It must have been going on for months. The same months during which he had... Visited me. While I sat there like some slack-jawed idiot in a country music ballad being true to my man, I swallowed the loathsome morsel with a loud gulping sound. Schmidt looked at me in alarm. Assists? Are you going to be sick? You cannot be sick now. We have much. I'm not sick, damn it. Stop fussing, Schmidt. Let's go and pack. My elegantly appointed room and pretty little balcony had never looked more appealing. So much for that luxury tour I'd been promised. I'd never had the chance to enjoy it. Mother had always told me that if an offer seemed too good to be true, it probably was. The prospect of being Larry's house guest offered some consolation. It would certainly impress my mother. I'd seen photographs of his Luxor establishment in some magazine. It wasn't just a house, it was a whole estate, with beautiful gardens and a swimming pool, and all the other odds and ends rich people consider necessary to happiness. And I would be far, far away from John and his pregnant bride. I am not a neat packer, and my mood that day was not conducive to order and method. I tossed things at random into the bags and put them by the door. After a final check of closets and drawers to make sure I hadn't forgotten anything, I opened the safe. The reels of tape were gone. I was squatting in front of the safe, fumbling in its interior in the hope of finding something, a gun, a message, a box of chocolates, anything to indicate interest, when the telephone rang. I snatched it up and yelled, What do you want, Schmidt? I'm afraid it's only me, an apologetic voice murmured. Larry? Yes, you are going to accept my invitation, I hope. I intended to repeat it in person, but you left the dining room before I could speak to you. He had meant it then. A little quiver ran through me, a mixture of pleasure, relief, and renewed alarm. The situation must be serious if he was anxious to get me to a safe place without delay. It's very kind of you. Are you sure? I'm sure it's the best possible place for you. He didn't have to spell it out. All right, I said. Thank you. What about Schmidt? I've already spoken to him. He said he'd come if you did. So it's settled. We'll meet in the lobby in, say, half an hour? 
There was no point in hanging around my room, so I headed for the lounge. I expected to find Schmidt there, since Hamid had announced the bar would be open. A final farewell to the Queen of the Nile, for those who chose to take advantage of it. Schmidt hadn't chosen, but several of the others had, including Alice and Faisal, who were engaged in earnest conversation. I joined them. So what's going to happen to you guys? I asked. All friends must part at last, said Faisal with a theatrical sigh. We part sooner than I had hoped, but not for a few more days. I will remain with the tour here in Luxor. And after that? His smile was dazzling. Something good, for me at least. I am not at liberty to discuss it just yet. Are you coming with me to the Luxor Temple this afternoon? I shook my head. Faisal gave me one of those patronizing masculine looks. Primping for the reception instead. I will see you later at the hotel then. He glanced at his watch and stood up. I won't be at the hotel. Larry has asked me to stay with him. Alice gave me a startled look and then laughed. Congratulations. You're the first single woman to be so honored in years. You'll be adequately chaperoned, I said. Schmidt's coming, too. Faisal grinned. He was in a good mood, all right. He is not the marrying kind, as you say. And he is too old for you. You haven't forgotten you promised to let me show you the nightlife of Luxor. I'd like that. Thanks, Faisal. Till this evening, then. He went off, collecting Susie as he passed her table. I heard her shrill voice raised in pretended protest as he led her out. Are you really staying with Larry? Alice didn't wait for me to answer. Thoughtfully, she went on. You'll be all right, then. That compound of his could withstand a siege. How about you? I'm out of it. Alice made no effort to conceal her relief. They've asked me to accompany the group that will be going on to Aswan. Then you've talked to someone? The lounge was emptying, but I was wary of specific references. Not yet. I'm supposed to meet someone at the Luxor Temple this afternoon but I can't imagine that my services will be required any longer. The people who... the people concerned won't be going to ask Juan. She drained her glass and rose. I was going to resign anyhow. I'm too old for this sort of thing. See you later. I let her go on before I followed. She was undoubtedly correct. The passengers who opted for the Aswan cruise had to be innocents. The Cairo-bound crowd was the one to be watched. The last of the shore tour group was leaving the lobby when I got there, to find my escort waiting, Schmidt, Larry, and the inevitable Ed. The open doors led not to the gangplank, but to the lobby of another cruise ship. We had to pass through it to reach the dock. Sometimes there were as many as five moored abreast, Larry said. The car waiting for us looked as if it had been custom-built for a chic and I felt sure the tinted glass was bulletproof. Ed rode up in front with the chauffeur, which left the three of us in splendid isolation in back. There was room for the sheik's four legal wives and a couple of concubines. The Shari El Bar El Nil, familiarly known as the Corniche, runs along the riverbank. It is a handsome boulevard with a tree-lined promenade on one side, and on the other a fascinating melange of ancient temples and modern hotels and souvenir shops. We passed the Winter Palace, where our fellow passengers were to stay, and went on for another mile or so before turning into a narrow driveway. The walls ahead resembled those of a fort. They were topped with wicked-looking coils of barbed wire, and the closed gates appeared to be fashioned of steel. They swung slowly open as the car approached. I pinched Schmidt. You know, Schmidt, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. It was like the sudden switch from black and white to technicolor in the film. For the past mile, we'd driven past high-rise hotels and storefronts adorned with garish signs in Arabic and half a dozen other languages. 
Behind these grim walls were green lawns and flower beds bright with blossoms. Winding paths led between the trees to the buildings whose roof lines showed through the leaves. The main house was a low, unpretentious structure of pale brick, two stories in height. It was roofed with red tiles and had balconies sprouting out from the upper floor. Schmidt didn't answer. He was gaping in childish pleasure. When we got out of the car, a bunch of munchkins descended on us. Two of them carried my bags up the stairs to my room, where a smiling, gray-haired maid was waiting to unpack for me. She expostulated when I insisted on helping, but I didn't want her to see the condition of my underwear. I finally got rid of her by allowing her to carry off an armful of garments to be pressed. There was mineral water in a cut glass carafe and a bowl of fruit on the table, not to mention a vase of fresh flowers. I hadn't eaten much for lunch. Munching an apple. Did they grow apples in Egypt? Did Larry have them flown in? I wandered out onto the balcony. I couldn't see the ugly walls. They were screened by careful plantings of shrubs and trees. Sprays of water shone with rainbow glints, soaking the thirsty grass. I could get accustomed to living this way. It wouldn't be any trouble at all. Glancing down at my scuffed sandals and wrinkled shirt, I smiled wryly. I doubted Larry's intentions were honorable, or even dishonorable, in the conventional sense. This was business. I'd settle for that. He'd informed us that he'd be busy for the rest of the afternoon and told us to make ourselves at home, explore the house, the grounds, take a swim, check out the library, ask for anything we wanted. I lay down on the bed, just for five minutes. I was awakened by the sound of thunder. Blinking sleepily at the sunlight, striping the floor with gold, I cleverly deduced it wasn't thunder. Someone was knocking at the door. Who else but Schmidt? Well-trained servants, as we sophisticates know, do not pound on doors. Come in, I called, stretching like a cat. He came. Or was it another munchkin? His robe, striped in green and purple, left his plump calves bare. His little pink toes stuck out of his espadrilles. Why do you waste time in sleeping? he demanded. Already I have explored the house. You must see it, Vicky. He has some of the finest antiques I have seen. Not antiquities, you understand, but Islamic art and furniture. But there is no time now. We are having the cocktails at the pool. Hurry and put on your bikini. It struck me as a good idea. I fished my suit. It wasn't a bikini, I'm a modest woman, out of the drawer and retired to the bathroom. Schmidt reached for a tangerine. Ah, that is very nice, he said approvingly when I emerged. No, do not cover it up. You do not have a big stomach like mine. You do not have to. Shut up, Schmidt, I said amiably, slipping into my robe. He led the way unerringly down the stairs and along a shadowy corridor that ended in an inner court with its own high walls. Hibiscus and roses bloomed with tropical luxuriance. Jasmine twined over a pergola at one end of the huge, free-form pool whose blue waters sparkled in the sunlight. Larry rose from one of the chairs under the pergola and hurried toward me. He was wearing black trunks, and I think he was trying to suck in his stomach. In fact, he looked a lot fitter than most men of his age. But I'm afraid I wasn't paying much attention. Something else, someone else, had caught my eye. He was poised, arms raised and knees slightly bent, on the diving board at the other end of the pool. He didn't look in my direction, but I knew he'd seen me. The pose was designed to show off his tan and the lean lines of his body, and he held it a little too long before he sprang and dived, slipping through the air and into the water as smoothly as a water snake. I turned to Larry. What the hell? I was so outraged I'd forgotten Schmidt. Larry's raised hand reminded me. Schmidt was trotting toward the pergola, but if I'd gone on at the same volume, he would have heard me. It's as difficult to get out of this place as it is to get in, 
Larry said quietly. I'd rather have him here, where I can monitor his activities, than on the loose in Luxor. He's not stupid enough to make any false moves here, I insisted. He knows he's under suspicion. Stupid, no. Larry's eyes were focused on John, who had pulled himself out of the water and was sitting on the edge of the pool. Schmidt came trotting up to him, waving a glass and calling out enthusiastic greetings. Smiling in response, John leaned back, supporting himself on his elbows. The movement stretched the muscles of his chest over the underlying structures of ribs and clavicles. He'd lost weight. Not much. He had never had much to lose. But those elegant bones were more visible now. Stupid, no, Larry repeated. Arrogant, yes. If we give him enough rope. His complexion is perfect gallows. I had proposed that once as a fitting epitaph for John. Did they hang people in Egypt? I need a drink, I said. John slid back into the water. Schmidt peeled off his robe, flung it aside with the panache of Arnold Schwarzenegger, whom he did not in the least resemble, pinched his nose with two fat fingers and leaped into the pool. A fountain of water billowed skyward. Averting my eyes, I followed Larry toward the pergola. Mary was there, stretched out on a deck chair, half hidden by sprays of jasmine, and not much else. Her suit was very French, a few patches and a few strings. In her case, the effect was cute rather than sexy. She was shaped as delicately as a child, not a bulge anywhere. I forced myself to stop counting. Feeling like a big blonde ox, I lumbered pergola word and took a chair next to Mary while Larry busied himself with glasses and ice. Very cozy and informal it was. No servants, just a small group of friends. Isn't this lovely? Mary said. So kind of Larry. Uh-huh. From the far end of the pool, two voices blended, to use the term loosely, in song. Apparently, they were delving deep into the historical roots of country music. This was a real oldie. If I had the wings of an angel, over these prison walls I would fly. Not bloody likely, I thought. There was no way he'd get out of it this time, and nobody deserved it more. When I got back to my room, I found that my freshly pressed clothes had been returned to the closet. They smelled faintly of jasmine. It wasn't a closet, in fact, but an enormous gilded and painted cupboard serving the same function as an armoire. My pitiful wardrobe occupied less than half of the vast interior. The cupboard was lined with sandalwood, and like every other piece of furniture in the room, it was old, beautiful, and probably extremely valuable. I examined the paintings appreciatively, wishing I knew as much as I had claimed about medieval Islamic art. Like Orthodox Judaism, Islam avoids the use of the human form in art. These designs featured flowers, animals, and the ornamental Kufic script. An ornate grill, gilded and pierced so cleverly that the openings formed part of an overall pattern, covered the top half of the doors. A good idea, that, in a hot climate. It allowed air to circulate among the garments hanging inside. In contrast to the bedroom, the adjoining bath was completely modern. There was even a built-in hairdryer, and I blessed Larry as I worked on my dank locks. I'd been a fool to let my hair grow long. It was thick and heavy and took forever to dry. I promised myself I'd have it cut as soon as I got home. We were to dine en famille with our host at 7.15. The reception started at 9. I figured it would be pretty fancy, but the best I could do was my good old slinky black cocktail dress. I had just slipped into it when Schmidt banged on my door. He was ten minutes early. I padded on stockinged feet to the door and opened it. Schmidt's face fell. He's always trying to catch me with my clothes off. You are ready, he said sadly. Not by a damn sight. Sit down, Schmidt. I've got to do my hair. It is very pretty hanging over your shoulders like that. Leave it so. 
It gets in my mouth when I eat. In White Tie and Tails, Schmidt looked like a portly penguin. He wandered to the mirror and began preening, straightening his tie and adjusting the ribbon that stretched diagonally across his chest. The ribbon was purple. I'd been with him when he bought it. I had talked him out of buying a medal to hang on it. I decked myself out in jewels, including the gold locket, and not including the enameled rose. The locket had never looked tackier. Watching, Schmidt opened his mouth and then decided not to comment. He tried several times to buy jewelry for me, and in that area, as in anything to do with art, he has superb taste. He also has more money than he knows what to do with. So why hadn't I accepted his gifts? Not because I suspected his motives. Schmidt loves me like a daughter and a friend. I suppose it was because I didn't want our friendship to be contaminated by expensive and one-sided presents. I can be a damn fool at times. At the top of the stairs, Schmidt offered me his arm, and we strutted down them with slow dignity. I knew he was seeing us, not as a cute little fat man and a tall, gangly female, but as King Rudolf and Princess Flavia descending to the ballroom between rows of curtsying courtiers. In a sudden burst of affection, I squeezed his arm. He squeezed back, but he didn't look at me. He was smiling with regal condescension and matching his steps to the strains of the royal anthem of Ruritania. I can't say that intimate dinner party was particularly enjoyable. Whitbread and Schroeder weren't present. I assumed they were supervising the final arrangements for the reception. Schmidt devoted himself to Mary, whose slim arms and delicate collarbones were exposed by a low-cut blue chiffon frock that might as well have been printed with dollar signs. She was wearing a parure of sapphires and diamonds, earrings, necklace, and bracelet. The heavy bracelet weighted her narrow wrist. For once, John said very little. He seemed preoccupied. Once or twice, Mary had to repeat a comment or question before he responded. Finally, Larry looked at his watch. We'd better go in. The guest will be arriving soon. The Grand Salon occupied one entire side of the house. Words fail me when I attempt to describe it. They fail me because I still don't know much about Islamic architecture. The outside wall, the one facing the gardens, was a glorious hodgepodge of stained glass panels and intricately carved wooden screens. The arches and pillars framing the windows were covered with antique tiles in shades of blue-green and coral. The objects arranged in niches along two inner walls weren't Islamic, but ancient Egyptian. A life-sized sandstone head of a pharaoh wearing the double crown. A small painted statue of a slender girl carrying a basket on her head. A wooden panel for a cosmetic box with a charming painting of an ibis crouching or squatting or whatever ibises do. It was a modest collection for a man with Larry's money and taste. They were all good pieces, but none was what I'd have called outstanding. I didn't have time to examine them in detail. Larry drew me to the door, where I stood for the next half hour, helping him receive his guests. It was probably the high point of my social life. As I shook hands with the Minister of the Interior and allowed the head of the Egyptian Antiquities Organization to kiss my fingertips, I couldn't help thinking, wow, wait till Mom hears about this. Even the best of us, which doesn't include me, is susceptible to snobbery. Our buddies from the tour were among the last to arrive. Susie flashed her teeth at Larry and gave me a huge hug. Her diamonds left dents in my chest. Larry passed her on to a minister of something— I greeted Sweet and his silent companion, noted that Louisa's veils were already slipping, and pressed the flesh with the others. Among them was Faisal, resplendent in black tie and tails. He kissed my hand and winked at me. That's enough, Larry said, when the last of them had gone on. Come and have some champagne. You've earned it. Almost at once he was captured by some dignitary or other, and I retreated to a relatively quiet corner. Sipping my champagne, with caution since it has an unfortunate effect on me, I surveyed the room. 
Our crowd had gathered together, except for Susie, who had found herself a general. Or maybe a colonel. I didn't know the significance of the insignia. He had several square acres of ribbons on his chest, and he seemed to be as fascinated by Susie as she was by him. I spotted Ed, strategically situated by the windows opening onto the lawn, his eyes ceaselessly scanning the crowd. His tux had been cut by a good tailor, but it bulged in several places. At first, I couldn't locate Schmidt. Then I saw him coming toward me, accompanied by a youngish man with a broad, open face that inspired a sudden wave of violent homesickness. My hometown is full of people with faces like that. He had to be from Minnesota. He'd been born in Duluth, but that didn't emerge until later in the conversation. Schmidt introduced him as Dr. Paul Whitney, the director of Chicago House the Luxor-based branch of the Oriental Institute. Skip the titles, Paul said with a broad smile. Oh, those lovely big teeth, only in Minnesota. The place is swarming with doctors. Quite an occasion, isn't it? I don't know what the occasion is, I admitted. Larry said something about a surprise, but it's not that much of a surprise. We're a hopeless bunch of gossips here in Luxor. Larry is handing this place over to the Antiquities Organization and endowing it as a research institute specializing in conservation. He took a glass from the tray a waiter had offered. So did I. What the heck, two glasses wouldn't hurt me. A most kind and generous action, said Schmidt. I hope, my young friend Paul, that you are not out of joint in the nose concerning this. It took Paul a few seconds to figure that one out. Then he laughed. It's certainly a more impressive setup than ours. The epigraphic survey began in the 20s, and although we've tried to keep up to date, it isn't easy to get funding. There have been many new technological developments in archaeology, and the equipment costs a bundle. Everything here is state-of-the-art, from the computer setup to the laboratories. But no, our noses aren't out of joint. Quite the contrary. We're in the conservation business, too recording the monuments before they're destroyed. Schmidt asked a couple of questions about the Temple of Medinet Habu, which had been one of the survey's major projects, and in which I had only a vague interest. Actually, to be honest, I had no interest whatever. Seeing my wandering eye, Paul amiably changed the subject. If you have the time, Vicky, we'd be delighted to have you visit our humble establishment. Our library is one of the best in the country, should you care to use it. I expressed my appreciation, adding that between Faisal, Alice, and Perry, I'd already been stuffed full of information I'd probably forget within two weeks. They're all first-rate, Paul agreed. Only the best for a fancy tour like yours. Oh, that reminds me. There's someone among your crowd I'm anxious to meet. You both know Mr. Tregarth, I'm sure. Can you point him out to me? We will do better, Schmidt exclaimed. We will present you. He is an old... Uh, <clears throat> we have become good friends during the voyage. Now, where... Ah, there he is, talking with the Minister of the Interior. If I'd needed anything else to complete my state of demoralization, that last sentence would have done it. The Interior Ministry controls, among other offices, that of state security. As we approached, the stout, coffee-colored gentleman with whom John had been conversing gave him a friendly slap on the back and turned away. John saw us coming. Eyebrow raised in polite inquiry, he awaited us. Paul introduced himself. He was too eager to wait for Schmidt. This is indeed a pleasure, Mr. Tregarth. The director wrote to you, but I'm delighted to be able to express our appreciation in person. Appreciation? said somebody. Me, in fact. John lowered his eyes modestly, but not before I'd seen the wicked glint in them. Mr. Tregarth was instrumental in restoring to the Oriental Institute an artifact that had been stolen, Paul explained. One of his employees bought it, accepting the fraudulent documentation the seller presented, but when Mr. Tregarth saw it, he recognized the piece and contacted us. How much did he take you for? I inquired. Two glasses of champagne had been too many. 
John's face lengthened into a look of noble suffering, but the glint was still there, and it was still directed at me. Paul said, shocked, only what he'd paid for the piece, which was minimal. He wouldn't even accept a finder's fee. It was nothing, John murmured. Anyone would have done the same. I was spared further dramatics by Larry, who called for silence so that he could make his announcement. It was brief and quiet and modest, but bureaucrats can't do anything simply. Everybody who was anybody had to make a speech. A couple of them embraced Larry, to his evident embarrassment. He concluded by presenting the new director of the new institute, a stocky, bearded young Swiss named Jean-Louis Mazarin. I had noticed him earlier, chug-a-lugging champagne. He had cause for celebration, all right. Jobs in archaeology are scarce, and this one was a scholar's dream. It was a fitting gesture of appreciation, said Larry, for Dr. Mazarin's supervision of the restoration of Tetisheri's tomb paintings. Fitting, maybe, but not particularly tactful. I was surprised that the first director wasn't an Egyptian. But not as surprised as I had been at Paul's gushing thanks. What was John up to now? He must have some ulterior motive. He always did. The most obvious explanation was that the Oriental Institute now owned a very well-made fake. Making them pay for it was a particularly nice touch. The party was still in full swing when Larry edged up to me and invited me to come see his etchings. They were sketches, actually. The original hand-colored drawings of Egyptian sites made back in the 1830s by an artist named David Roberts. I'd seen countless reproductions of them on postcards and notepaper. Even the prints sold for hundreds of dollars at auction. The main object of interest, however, was a man, short and slim and straight. He rose from his chair when we entered Larry's study, and although he was in civilian clothes, you could see the invisible uniform. He cut Larry's introduction short. First names will suffice, he said, with a smile that came nowhere near his intent dark eyes. Call me Ahmed. I'd like to call you a few other names, said my champagne-loosened tongue. What the hell's the idea of leaving me out in the cold without even a woolly scarf? Sit down, please, said Ahmed. I sat. I imagine most people sat when Ahmed told them to. I am sorry you feel that way, he went on. We could not anticipate that our arrangements would be disarranged. Ali was disarranged some too, wasn't he? His lips tightened. He was murdered, yes. But you have nothing more to worry about, Dr. Bliss. Your part of the job is finished. Trigarth was the only one you recognized? You have not identified any of his allies? Yes and no. In that order, I said shortly. Then there is no more for you to do. He sat back and spread his hands wide. You will be under observation from now on. Enjoy the remainder of your visit to our country and forget what has happened. Just a damn minute, I said as he got to his feet. I've got a few questions of my own. The less you know, the better for you. Oh, that haunting old refrain. So, I'm curious. What if he doesn't go through with it? He knows me. He knows that he is under suspicion. Ahmed stroked his neat black mustache. I imagine he does. Your presence on the cruise would be enough to alert him to that. I told Burkhart so at the beginning. Ahmed shrugged. It does not matter. If he proceeds, and we believe he will, there is no way he can avoid being caught. What's he after? I demanded. I hope it's occurred to you, as it has to me, that the museum could be a decoy. While you increase security there, he may walk off with something else. Certainly it occurred to us. Ahmed was halfway to the door. Obviously I bored him. He turned for a final word. I told you to forget it, Dr. Bliss. Stay away from Tergarth, from the museum, and most especially from the offices of state security. That's all very well and good. What if he, they, won't stay away from me? 
Ahmet looked exasperated. At least I think that was the import of his frown. His face didn't appear to be capable of any more affable expression than annoyance. Why should they bother with you? You have passed on the only information you possessed. Stop prying into matters that no longer concern you, and you will be perfectly safe. I returned his scowl with interest. You guys were the ones who asked me to pry. That is true. We are very grateful for your assistance. It was the most insincere thank you I've ever heard, and I include a few I'd wrung out of John. My memories of the remainder of the evening are somewhat blurred. People kept pressing champagne on me, and by that time I couldn't think of any reason to refuse. I had a little chat with Alice, who was looking quite elegant in sequins and chiffon. She'd been told the same thing Ahmed had told me. You're off the case. Forget the whole thing. I vaguely remember congratulating Jean-Louis, the new director, but I don't recall what we talked about or how I got to bed. I woke with a hangover, of course. Serve me right. The reopening of Tetasheri's tomb turned out to be another big occasion. I had expected a minister or two, but I hadn't realized there would be so many reporters or that security would be so tight. Our little caravan was accompanied by a military escort, and when we reached the site, I realized there were no tourists around except us. Everywhere I looked, I saw uniformed men carrying rifles. Teddy Sherry's tomb is not in the Valley of the Kings or the Valley of the Queens. The royals and nobles of her dynasty had been buried on the slopes of a hill called the Dira Abu al Naga. She was one of the last of her line to be buried in that cemetery. Her predecessors had taken the choicer and more accessible sites in the flanks of the hill. The fact that hers was higher, at the back of a narrow cleft, had probably contributed to its survival. We climbed the modern stairs that had made access to the tomb easier for the men who had worked on it for over three years. Naturally, there were more speeches. Larry handed over a huge key to the minister, who unlocked the iron gates that had been built over the entrance. Everybody clapped, and Larry led the first party inside. All were government dignitaries. The rest of us commoners had to cool our heels. While we were waiting our turn, I chatted with Paul Whitney. Only a few archaeologists had been invited, and according to Paul, plenty of noses were out of joint. We all complain about the damage done to the tombs by visitors, he said with a wry smile. But we accept ourselves. So are you going to decline the invitation? I asked. You've got to be kidding. I am. I wasn't even worried about my claustrophobia. Compared to the more elaborate later tombs, this one was small and simple. A single flight of stairs, a short corridor, and two rooms. Only ten people were allowed in at a time but the room seemed very crowded because we huddled together, elbows tight against our sides. We'd been warned not to touch the paintings. Carefully, I edged up to one of the walls and squinted at close range. The ancient artists had covered the rock walls with a layer of plaster before applying the paint, and by the time Larry's people got to work, moisture and the formation of salt crystals had separated large sections of plaster from the rock behind it. The loose sections had been carefully removed and placed onto padded supports. Then the rock wall had been cleaned before the plaster was replaced, using modern adhesives that wouldn't flake or dry or shrink as older types had often done. Not until that process was complete could the actual restoration begin cleaning off the accumulated grime of decades, replacing tiny flakes of paint that had fallen to the floor or between the rock and the facing. The patience and skill required had been extraordinary. After we emerged, I found a convenient boulder and sat down, tipping my hat over my eyes. I must be getting used to the climate. The hot, dry air felt good. Yes, by God, I would do as jolly old Ahmed had suggested forget distractions, and enjoy myself. I could probably talk Schmidt into going to Aswan. It would be pleasant to cruise without distractions. We could come back to Luxor later, after... 
They'd be watching every move he made from now on, poised like cats by a mouse hole, waiting for him to commit the act that would condemn him to prison or to a narrower and more permanent resting place. People have been shot while resisting arrest. A pair of booted feet came into view, and I looked up to see Jean-Louis. I wasn't sorry to have my train of thought interrupted. Do you have a cigarette? Jean-Louis asked brusquely. I'm sorry, I don't... Then I remembered that I did. Reaching into my bag, I dredged out my cigarettes. The pack was almost full, but it was rather squashed. Keep it, I added generously. That is most kind. It wasn't, but I didn't say so. He must be a chain smoker. The ground where he'd been standing was littered with butts. So did you enjoy the paintings? he asked. I'm still dazzled. You've done a magnificent job. Mes homage. Between the mop of bushy hair and the beard, I couldn't see much of his face, but he didn't respond to my smile. It is only one small part of what needs to be done. That is what the work of the Institute will be. Preservation. A worthy cause, do you not think? Unquestionably. As I said, a cause worthy of sacrifice. He appeared to be talking to himself rather than to me. I wondered if the guy was drunk. Surely not at this hour. His hands were shaking as he lit another cigarette from the butt of the first. I could feel relays clicking into place. I don't know how society conditions women into feeling that they're obliged to console, reassure, and flatter melancholy males. I'd fought the impulse ever since I was old enough to recognize it, but I hadn't been entirely successful. I decided that Jean-Louis must be one of those unfortunate people who can't see the doughnut for the hole. Apparently, he was brooding on the magnitude of the task ahead and questioning his ability to carry it out. The job would never be finished, not in his lifetime, at least. There was too much to be done. That's true of a lot of things, though, including the achievement of social justice, universal peace, and a world in which there are no hungry children. It's no excuse to stop working toward those ends. I said as much, larding the pompous speech with compliments, and gradually his face, or at least his mouth, relaxed. It is true, he said thoughtfully, and I am one of the few who can work effectively in this area. Uh, right, I said. He went on to tell me how good he was at the restoration business, and I went on to regret my womanly instincts. My wandering eye caught that of Larry, who'd been watching us, and he responded to my unspoken plea for rescue. Come now, Jean-Louis, you're supposed to be mingling, he said. Me too, I said, rising. I haven't had a chance to talk to our former shipmates. Larry accompanied me. Moody fellow, isn't he? I inquired when we were out of earshot. Larry frowned. He hasn't any reason to be moody right now. What did he say? I'm afraid I didn't pay much attention. He was talking a lot. Unusual for him, he's not very sociable. He was fishing for compliments, I said. Getting them, too. Our shipmates greeted us with open arms. Sweet, who had apparently recovered from his bout of sickness, said slyly, We were afraid you'd deserted us, Vicky. I'd desert you, too, if I had the chance. Susie said with a big grin. How about wangling an invitation for me, Vicky? I was only asked because... Because of Schmidt, I said, fumbling for a reasonable explanation. He and Larry are old pals. What about the Tregoths? Susie demanded. They aren't old pals of Larry's, are they? I've no idea what prompted that invitation, I said. Tregoth is good at pushing in where he's not wanted said Perry, joining us. I can't get anyone an invitation, I said pointedly. I wouldn't be rude enough to try. So what are your plans? Sweet asked. Will you be going on to Aswan with us day after tomorrow? I said I hadn't made up my mind. Some of the others were still wavering, but the majority had opted for the Aswan cruise, including Sweet and Bright. Obviously, I'd been wrong about them. 
but I still couldn't understand why Bright had lied about his origins. At any rate, we'll enjoy one another's company for a day or two longer, Sweet said cheerfully. Are you coming to Karnak with us this afternoon, Vicky? The party was breaking up. Faisal began herding the group toward their bus, and I returned to my stretch limo, but not before I'd agreed to join the others that afternoon. It was pure reverse snobbism. I didn't want him to think I was too stuck up to mingle with non-billionaires. There were five of us in the limo, not counting the chauffeur, but it wouldn't have seemed crowded if John hadn't been one of the five. At least I didn't have to sit next to him. I climbed in after Schmidt, and Larry took the seat beside me. Leaning back with a sigh, he loosened his tie. You must be glad it's over, I said. Larry glanced at me and smiled sheepishly. I hate ceremony and long speeches. I'm glad to be done with that part of it. But it'll be hard to leave Egypt. I figured I'd done my duty as a sympathetic female, but I couldn't feel too sorry for a man who owned, if I remember the newspaper stories correctly, six other residences, including a chateau in the Loire Valley. You can always build another house, I said. I have too many damn houses already, Larry said, with an uncanny impression of having read my thoughts. No, I won't live in Egypt again. I'm sure they'll always have a spare room for a guest, said John. He was referring to Jane Austen, but none of the others caught the allusion, or its implications. Nasty old Aunt Norris in Mansfield Park always had a spare room because she never invited anyone to stay with her. Schmidt chuckled fatly. For you, Larry, there will always be a spare room anywhere in Egypt. You have done the country a great service. When will you be departing, mein Freund? You must tell us when we are in the way. The ETAP Hotel, I understand, is very fine. We can take ourselves there at any time. Larry assured us we were welcome to stay as long as we liked. The packers are coming tomorrow. It'll take a while since some of the ceramics and furniture are old and fragile, so there's no hurry. Have you decided on your future plans? He looked at John. John was looking at me. One eyebrow went up. I remembered what Ahmed had said. This seemed like an appropriate moment to indicate my complete disinterest in John Tregarth, alias Smythe, and all his works. I'm going to ask Juan, I said. But Vicky, Schmidt began. You don't have to come along, Schmidt. I will go where you go, Schmidt said, as I had hoped he would. Otherwise, I'd have had to kidnap him and drag him away by force. So that afternoon, we went to the Temple of Karnak. John and Mary decided to join us. I hadn't invited them. Schmidt had. Larry declined. He said he had work to do, and he'd seen the temple several dozen times. We had to wait a few minutes for the rest of the group to arrive. Studying the crowds that filled the passage between the rows of ram-headed sphinxes, I said, I can't imagine what this place is like when tourism is at its peak. Look at all those people. This is not an area where there have been attacks on tourists, Schmidt said, nodding encouragingly at Mary. Mary's devoted husband wasn't so considerate of her feelings. Frowning slightly, he said, Not precisely true, Schmidt. There was a bombing here a couple of years ago, and another attempt earlier this season. Ah, but those attacks were in objection to what the fundamentalists consider the worship of the old heathen gods, Schmidt explained. Some of these peoples, his pointing finger indicated a group of unkempt visitors in ponytails and cut-off jeans. The New Ages, you call them, hold ceremonies in the temple. We, we don't worship anything. We sure don't, I agreed. John grinned at me. Avoiding his eyes, I went on. You're right about that bunch, Schmidt. They're all wearing amulets and crystals and earrings and junk. Why do they have to look so scruffy? Their spiritual consciousness has elevated them above earthly desire, said John, in a voice I knew well. I should think you'd approve, Vicky. You dislike crass materialism and vulgar acquisitiveness, don't you? I was saved from replying by the arrival of our shipmates. Falling in step with Faisal, I remarked, 
You're looking very pleased with yourself, Faisal. Are you going to tell me about that good news you mentioned, or is it still a secret? Not any longer. Faisal stopped and turned to face me. He thumped himself on the chest. Greet, with proper respect, the assistant director of the Institute. I caught his hand and shook it vigorously. Congratulations! I'm absolutely delighted! Faisal kept hold of my hand as we walked on. You'll help me celebrate, perhaps. I promise to show you some of the nightlife of Luxor. That would be great. But why are you guiding this tour? I'm no quitter, as you Americans say. As soon as I get the last of this lot onto the plane in Cairo, I'll come back and take up my new position. In the meantime, I will carry out my duties like a good little soldier. All right, friends, gather around. The Temple of Karnak is not one temple, but a complex of temples, built over many centuries. The Avenue of the Sphinxes... People wandered off as we proceeded, some to stop and rest, others to inspect a particular area in more detail. Schmidt and I had paused to look at an obelisk, and he was lecturing me about the career of Hatshepsut, one of the first feminists, Vicky. She should be of interest to you. When I saw a familiar face that didn't belong to our group. A familiar beard, rather. I've been looking all over for you, Jean-Louis said grumpily. What for? I asked. He certainly didn't look like a man who had finally found the girl of his dreams. To show you the temple, of course. Didn't you ask that I do so? We are delighted to have you, of course, Schmidt exclaimed, before I could answer. Just as well, I would have said no. I hadn't. However, I was familiar with the habit some people have of believing in their own fantasies. I must have made a hit with Jean-Louis. That would teach me not to go around oozing sympathy. He'd worked on the Otten Temple project for three years before leaving it to take up Larry's offer, and he knew Karnak as I know my own apartment. We finally managed to pry him away from that part of the temple and talked him into showing us boring tourist stuff like the hyperstyle hall. Impressive is an overused word, but it's the only word for that cluster of mammoth columns. The only thing wrong with it was the tourists. One group had squatted in a circle, and I recognized the seekers after truth we had seen entering the temple earlier. They were muttering to themselves and waving their hands. I heard somebody say something about auras. Crétin, Jean-Louis muttered. They do no harm, Schmidt said tolerantly. Finally, I decided I'd absorbed enough for one day, and I cut Jean-Louis short in the middle of a translation of the annals of Thutmose III. He was reading the hieroglyphs off the wall. It was a wasted exhibition so far as I was concerned. How did I know he was reading them right? Jean-Louis consulted his watch. Yes, we must go. Mr. Blenkiron has sent the car for us. It will be waiting. I spotted Susie as we passed through the hypostyle hall. She waved and I waved back, though Jean-Louis didn't stop. I deduced that we were late. When we emerged from the last, or first, depending on which way you were going, pylon into the Avenue of Sphinxes, John and Mary were waiting. She looked done in. I didn't blame her. We'd covered a lot of territory and still seen only part of the enormous complex. That was when it happened. The force of the explosion threw me to the ground. Or maybe it was Schmidt who threw me to the ground. He was on top of me when I got my breath and my wits back. I decided I probably wasn't dead. I wished I could be sure about Schmidt. The plump, pink hand lying on the ground near my face was flaccid and unmoving. I tried to squirm out from under him. People were screaming and there were sounds like firecrackers. The weight on my back lifted. I got to my hands and knees, then to my knees. John was bending over Schmidt, shaking him. Schmidt's head rolled back and forth, then his eyes opened, and he let out an anguished bellow. Vicky, Vicky, wo bist du? Bist du verletzt? Ach, Gott! You'll do, John said, stepping back. 
Stop shrieking, Schmidt. She's not hurt. Speak for yourself. My shins and forearms had taken the brunt of the fall. Blood oozed from a few square feet of scraped skin. What happened? Schmidt crawled over to me and enveloped me in a hug. It was a bomb, Vicky. Terrorists setting off bombs and shooting. God, I dunk you are not injured. I could see over his shoulder. The cloud of dust from the explosion was still settling. Other people had been bowled over, but they didn't appear to be badly hurt. But they were moving and cursing. All except one. The bloody cavern where his face had been was framed all around by sticky wisps of hair.